Hello, my name is Sally Caselli. The following is a comprehensive tutorial on technology skills for the workplace. This is probably one of the longest tutorials on YouTube. I have designed it for those of you who want to become proficient in technology to succeed in today's workplace. The tutorial focuses primarily on Office 365 applications such as Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Access, Outlook, and the commonly used operating systems such as Windows 10 and Windows 11. All the segments are concepts-based and easy to understand. Even if the software version differs, you should be able to follow along. In order to make this as effective as possible, I'm also including the working files in the video description area so that you can follow along. Thank you for watching, and if you are finding this content helpful, please remember to subscribe to this channel for future videos. Hello, my name is Sally Caselli. The following is a comprehensive tutorial on Word 2019, which is part of the Microsoft 365 apps. This is a concepts-based tutorial, which means that the concepts you'll learn here, you'll be able to apply them in other versions of Word. I will start with the very basics and then move to the more advanced features. The tutorial is designed for those who want to be proficient in the workplace, interviewing for a position, or students who are wanting to learn Word. So let's get started. In this segment, I'm going to go over the process for opening the application and identifying some of the key components of the application interface. So to open Word, once we have it installed on the computer, we click here on Start and then locate it under the list of our programs here, or we simply type Word and then hit Enter. Once we open Word, we are presented with these options here on the left. We have three tabs. We have the Home tab, New, and Open. On the Home tab, we have the option to create a blank document or some guides and uh, templates directly from Microsoft. Then further below here, we have an option to open recent documents that we have been working on or pinned documents or documents that are shared with me. Further down here on the left on the next tab on New, we have here the option to create a blank document or to create a document from a template. This is so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Let's say you want to create a resume or you want to create a brochure and what. So and I'll go over this in a moment using templates. The next option here is to open a document where we can open from the recent documents or OneDrive or files shared with me or files stored on this PC. Further down, we have also the account option. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that I'm using Office 2019 and Word 2019 as part of Office 365. So the way you know that it's Office 365 is by clicking here on the account. And then if you're logged in under account information here, that means that you have Office 365 in your computer. The advantage of Office 365 is that you'll be receiving the latest enhancements and updates from Microsoft uh, from month to month or every so often. So at this point, let's say that we wanted to create a new document. We can do that either by clicking here under the Home tab. We click on the blank document option, or we could go here under the New tab and we click on blank document or use one of the templates. In this case, first I'm going to click on blank document. So once we click on blank document, then we are presented with the option to simply start typing away and start working on this particular document. 
Now, this main area here is where we type the document. Now, a couple other interface uh, components here. On the very top left, you'll see here this quick access toolbar. This is basically an area for you to uh, place in here commonly used commands in Microsoft Word. So you can click on the drop down, and let's say you're emailing a document or you're opening documents all the time, you can enable those buttons by just simply clicking one of those and it'll add the open button here. Another way to add those buttons is that if you are in a specific tab, and I'll go over the tabs in a moment, and you want to insert, let's say, pictures all the time, you can right click on this and choose to add it to the quick access toolbar. So in this case, it will always show up here. You don't have to go under the insert tab and then pictures, but you can simply use it from here. Now, if you want to remove it from, from here, you can right click on it and choose to remove it from the quick access toolbar and it will remove it from there. So that's uh, the quick access toolbar on the very top. On the left hand side here, the first option is file. File is basically bringing you back to work with anything related to the file in the computer, whether you want to create a new file, open an existing file, or information about the specific file that you're working with, or saving that file, or printing it, sharing it, and things of that nature. So that's your file tab. The next thing here is the home tab. So these are the different tabs actually. So if I click on insert, you'll have a different set of tools within that tab. If I click on design, again, a different set of tools. So under the home tab, you have various commands or various options for you to work in this application. So these are the most commonly used tools for you to edit a document in Word. And these are referred to as the groupings. So you have the font grouping or the group for font related commands or paragraph formatting the paragraph grouping. So these are the all the, the, the functions related to formatting paragraphs or styles, applying a style to a document and so on. All the style stuff is over here, editing, over here and other options. So again, uh, just a key concept here, this stage is to, to understand that there are different tabs. Each tab has groupings. Within each grouping, there is a set of functions or commands They're grouped together related to that function, to let's say paragraphs, modifying the text and stuff. Then you have the inserts, and these are designed intentionally this way. So you initially type your document with a bunch of text in here. Then uh, once you have typed that document, then you can apply formatting to it. You can change the paragraphs, you can apply styles, and we'll learn about all of these different functions in this tutorial. Once you have done these basic things with your document or your report, then you can go here under insert and that's where you can insert cover pages, blank pages, page breaks, tables, pictures, icons, 3D models, and uh, smart art, and uh, all of these different functions, comments, headers, and footers, and things of that nature. So you are inserting, enhancing your original document. Under the design tab, now you go into a different layer of enhancing this document. So you're kind of applying a theme and we'll learn about the themes uh, in depth uh, later, but you're applying, you're making all the components in this document uniform. The next component here is the layout. You're changing the layout of the document, whether it's the margins for the document or the orientation from landscape to portrait or the size of the document or adding columns and things of that nature. Now, then you move to the references. This is like where you are taking it even farther. For example, you have a long report. Now you're creating a table of contents. You're adding footnotes and you're researching and finding and applying citations and uh, the captions for various images and things of that nature. So you're kind of refining it at this stage. Then you have the mailings tab. That's kind of by itself. That's just a separate function 
for you to do mail merges, whether it's creating envelopes, labels, or letters, or emails, or a directory, and so on. Then under the Review tab, this is kind of one of the last steps. Let's say you have finalized your report. Now you need to review it. So you go under the thesaurus, you check the word count, you check it for accessibility, you add comments to it and collaborate with others and track changes when you're collaborating with others. You can even compare documents and restrict uh, functions within this specific document. And then finally, within this application, then you can also do a final review of your document where you're going here under the View tab, and then you can do a reading mode where you're viewing the document, it, just reading through to make sure it's uh, what you intended it to be. And uh, this is kind of how you uh, can customize the application for various views within your computer. And we'll get into this uh, in more in depth later. And uh, you also have the help option where this is where you can learn uh, uh, about training or what new features are there and things like that. But also along with the help here, notice that on any of these tabs, you have this option here under uh, on the top here. And you can type, let's say, margins. You are not sure how to set the margins. You can simply search in this area for that function, and it will take you to that specific command. So you don't have to know where that command is under which tab or which grouping. You can simply search it here. So footnotes, you want to know how to add a footer and such. You simply start typing, and it will take you directly there. So those are the components here on the, on the ribbon. This is the Office ribbon with the various components. Now, you also have the option here, since this is part of Office 365, you can share this, this document with other, one, uh, other individuals. Of course, you have to be connected with OneDrive for this. And you can comment uh, with other individuals as well um, on this specific document. Now, on the bottom right area here, this is where you can change the zoom for the document, like the, the not necessarily the font size, but the display, uh, just the zooming in and out of the document, basically. You can change the views here to have this in reading mode or to have it in print layout mode. Typically, you want to have it in print layout mode. You also have the focus mode here as well. Basically, it's hiding everything else but it's displaying you only your document. Then uh, you can adjust display settings to optimize it for various options here. Then on the left-hand side, you have the number of words that, and uh, various statistics about this, this uh, document, and then the number of pages and navigation uh, here as well. So these are some of the general components of Word. And in the next session, we are going to learn how to create a document, some of the very basics, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but just before we move to the more advanced features of Word. So stay tuned for the next session. In this segment, we are going to go over some of the very basic functions, which most likely you know how to do already in Microsoft Word. We are going to simply create a basic document, do some very basic formatting, and then save it. And then also we're going to learn how to use a template instead of reinventing the wheel. So we go here under Start, and then we can open Word from recently used applications, or simply type Word here, open it up. At this point, I'm going to first create a new blank document. So you simply start typing. Remember the functions on the menus here and the, uh, on the Office ribbon. So we simply start, start typing. And then Typically, as you are typing and the, the cursor or the words reach the end of the line here, uh, of course, the content will move on to the next line automatically. This is very basic, but I needed to kind of mention it just for the uh, ver those that are very 
new to Microsoft Word. Now, additionally here, you can add various items such as uh, bulleted lists, numbered lists, and format things a certain way. So now that we created some text in this document, we can format this and work on this. So let's pretend this is our document. At this point here, we can make this, uh, let's say, bold, make this bold and change the font type. Let's say we want to change the font size. Now notice as you're changing the font size, you have these two icons in here as well to increase the indentation and decrease it as well. You can also have other options such as uppercase and lowercase. So we are basically selecting the text first and then you're making these modifications to that uh, selected text. Now, besides using these functions here under the font, you can, obviously you can go and change the color once you select it as well if you wanted to. Additionally, let's say that down here in these list of items, we want them to use bulleted lists. So you can simply click on this section here under bullets and you have the bulleted list. If you click on the drop down, you can select different types of bullets if you prefer. Or you can choose numbers. Or if you wanted various lists, such as um, you have multiple layers for specific lists, you can utilize one of those options from the lists option. Now, as far as formatting the text here, once you select it, you can have this centered by using those buttons right here, or indented to the right, or typically as it is the standard to the left. Now, for any of this text, once you select it, you can also change the spacing. So let's say I wanted this double spaced. One of the options here is to use line spacing and change it to double spaced from here. So for those that are college students and you need to do double spaced papers, you change it directly using this function right here. If you needed to undo a function, a specific function, you can either use the undo option from up here on the quick access toolbar, or you could press Control Z on the keyboard and that will undo the last function that you performed. Now at this point, let's assume this is our whole document. Of course, stay tuned for the additional modules for this tutorial on the enhanced editing and formatting and creating a report and things of that nature that we'll cover shortly in the tutorial. But for now, let's assume that we are done with this document and we want to save it. You can press save up here on the quick access toolbar or you can click on file and choose save. Now at this stage, we are prompted to save this and by default, it will ask us to save it or it will try to, uh, to get us to save it on OneDrive. So if we go back and press save here, notice it's trying to save it to OneDrive. But um, you can either click File, Save, and choose this PC, and then save it wherever you want to save it in this PC, for example, in My Documents, where I can go here under Browse, and then go and browse for my documents under documents here and say using Office 365 and then give it a name. Now saving it on OneDrive it's advantageous because in case something happens to your computer you can recover this file by simply accessing the file on OneDrive. So that's how you save the document on your computer, how you create a document and how you save it on your computer. I recommend that you save your document unless you have the auto saved enabled autom uh, automatically that you save your document every two to three minutes by pressing simply pressing control s on your keyboard now before i finalize this uh, segment 
one other thing, if you go here, instead of you creating a document from scratch all the time, you can also go here under File and New, and that will bring you to a similar screen like what we had seen earlier, and use one of the templates. So let's say I wanted to create a brochure. Uh, by the way, notice there are all kinds of templates here automatically. But let's say I wanted a brochure. You simply search for it and uh, simply go and download the one that you prefer from online. Double click on it, press create, and then Word will download this. And now here you can simply modify key components of this brochure add and change various headings and so on, but you basically have the complete layout of the document and you don't have to spend a lot of time on the design. You can simply use a template that already exists in the computer. You can do this for resumes, reports, or brochures, or all kinds of other stuff. So uh, this is a quick tip on before you proceeding with the other functions of Word in this tutorial and I hope that you'll find it helpful. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use the Dictate option in Microsoft Word. So, as you're creating a document, instead of typing it, if you're a slow typer and uh, that type of thing, you basically can go anywhere in the document, and as long as you have a microphone in your computer, you can come here under the Dictate area, and you can click on the drop-down and choose the language that you prefer to do the dictation with. Once you're ready, you are going to need to click here on Dictate, and then everything that you say, the system is going to transcribe it for you. So in my case here, I'm going to simply, let's say I want to type right here, and I'm going to actually start reading this paragraph in a moment. So let's say I want to type in here, and I click here on Dictate, and at this point, everything that you say, it's going to be transcribed, period. New paragraph. Notice that you can also give commands to the system period, new paragraph. As computers become better understood and more economical, comma, every day brings new applications, period. Many of these new applications involve both storing information and simultaneous use by several individuals, period. When you're ready to stop this, you press uh, stop the button, and then the document has been transcribed, or the content that we want it has been transcribed. In this segment of the Word tutorial, we're going to learn how to format a document, how to use some of the basic features of Word and apply the formatting, the tools in Word for formatting a document. So instead of us creating a brand new document here for the sake of time, I have an existing document. We can click here on File and then navigate to the uh, document and simply click on it, or you can click on Open and then go and browse for the document, locate it wherever it is uh, on your uh, computer. Now, or if you can go to the actual folder, wherever your files are, and simply double click on that document and open it up. And then click on the document and then open it up. Now, in this document, it's just a generic one. I am giving credit to the website that I copied it from. I modified a couple of things in it, but basically, this is not really my typing here. So, we have this long document. Now, a couple of things. We're going to learn how to change the formatting on it. Let's assume that we typed what we needed to type. Now, we want to learn about 
uh, some of the formatting capabilities. So in this case, first to select a section here, we can double click on that, on that heading and it will select the whole section. Or we could simply drag it from beginning to end or from end to beginning, hold the, down the mouse and you'll be able to select that particular section. You can do the double clicking also for paragraphs. It will select the whole paragraphs. If you go outside of the document and you triple click, that will select the whole document. Now for this document, let's suppose I wanted to change the font on this document. I uh, select the whole thing. I can either uh, hold down the mouse in the beginning here and drag it down like this or triple click outside of it and select the whole thing. Now at this point, I want to change the font to Colibri. And simply, I clicked here on the drop down, chose Colibri, and it applied the font. Now under the size here, I could change the size as well directly from here. If I wanted to increase the font size, I can use this icon over here. Change the font uh, type, italics, or apply additional properties. You simply select any of these options in here. If you want to get very granular about the font functionality and that type of thing, you can click on this down arrow here next to the to each group of icons, and it will give you additional functions for those settings for the font. So if I click here on this expansion arrow, this is where I can uh, make additional mo modifications. The other thing to learn here is the concept is that if you always want any new documents to start with a particular font or a particular font size, you can come to this screen, adjust the properties, and then set this as the default. That's how you set the default font for all documents in Microsoft Word. Then you click on OK, and it'll apply those changes. Obviously, in this case, I didn't make any changes here. So let's say I wanted to make a change to this and it's basically done. Now one of the observations for you uh, here is that once you select a bunch of text, whatever that may be, notice that this quick toolbar will show up right above the text that you selected. This is just a bunch of the tools, commonly used tools, so that instead of you having to reach out all the way here to the ribbon, and the various functions, this is quicker for you to access and apply a specific property from here. Now, let's say that I selected this text and I applied various properties to this text, to this heading, and now I need to apply it to another section here. Let's say I need to apply it right here. Instead of me having to go and change the properties and apply red and so on, uh, and apply it whatever five different properties that I'm changing, I could actually copy the properties of the formatting from here, apply it to a, a different section of the document. And that is referred to as the format painter. So this is, we're copying the formatting of a specific section and applying it to a different part of the document. And the way that works is that we make the modifications in one spot. We go here under the Format Painter. And notice it, it doesn't seem like much happened except for the icon that changed like this paint brush. Now we go to the other section of the document, select it, and let the mouse go. And it'll, it will apply the same properties of that item that we selected earlier. So that's how you apply the Format Painter tool in Microsoft Word. Now, as far as copying and pasting, of course, you can copy here a segment of it, and you can click on Copy over here on the top left or press Control-C, go to another section of your document, and then press Control-V or press Paste. Notice here under the Paste option, you can do to keep the source formatting, you can uh, merge the formatting. That means it's going to apply it with what your document has, or it's going to paste it as a picture, or it's going to paste it as a text, only removing any formatting. 
Typically, you want to merge the formatting, or typically, you simply want to press here paste. You use those other functions and particular advanced features that I might cover later in this tutorial. So now that we pasted it, it's right here. So that's the format painter, copying and pasting, changing the font, and so on in the document. Now, one other thing for uh, before we proceed here, sometimes when you're doing uh, fancy formatting of your document, you might need to see where the extra spaces are or what's behind the scenes that are hidden or areas that are hidden or extra spaces in the document and so on. One way to identify those hidden characters or hidden areas is to click on this little paragraph mark here. So it says show paragraph marks and other hidden formatting symbols. You click on it and it'll display all the hidden, uh, like the spaces are represented with a dot here. And if there is more than one space, notice there are two dots here. So you could remove that other one. And then notice here, right before the paragraph mark, there is another dot or an extra space in there. And this means that there is a, a return key or a paragraph mark in there. So that's using the hidden uh, codes or symbols in a document. When you're done with it and you don't want to see this anymore, you can simply press it again to remove those hidden characters or to not reveal those hidden characters. Now, other things that you can do here before we move into more advanced uh, features, you can also apply one of those styles. So styles are pre-formatted text, basically. So you have, and we'll get into this in the next session in more detail. But uh, basically for now, you can just go in here. You want to apply heading one. It has this pre-formatted uh, style. It's in blue, it's all caps and so on and it's centered as well. If you choose to have a different one, you simply click on it and it will apply it as needed. Now notice as I'm uh, simply navigating or browsing through those various styles here, notice that uh, this is referred to as the live preview in Microsoft Word. So it's basically giving us a preview of what it will look like before it will apply that specific style to this text. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use the Format Painter Basically, you can format a bunch of text a certain way to look a certain way, and then you can copy the formatting and paste it to another section of text. It's very similar to copy and paste, but the difference is that it's going to copy and paste the formatting properties. So let's assume that we have a bunch of text here, and we have this uh, blue color, and uh, it's underlined and all that type of stuff, and I'm going to change the font as well to a different font here. Now let's say that I wanted to apply that somewhere else in the document. You go to the area which has that specific formatting. You select it and then you click on Format Painter. It's going to seem like nothing happened. Now notice it has this broom type of thing. You select where you want to apply it and notice I'm leaving out a couple of words in the end here and then you let the mouse go. As soon as that happens, notice it copied all the properties from the first area here to the other section where we applied the format painting. So it's just as easy as that. In this brief video, I'm going to explain how to change the default font for any documents in Microsoft Word. This is so that whenever you open a new document or create a new document, the font will be a different font that you specify and also a different size as well. So here's how it's done. 
basically you go into Microsoft Word here into a document or open word and then basically go under this area right here where it says font and then click on this little icon now change the font to whatever you want so for example we want it here Arial and let's say size 12 and then all you have to do is you click on set as default click OK and then you want to change it to all documents based on the normal template click OK and now anytime I open a new document and create a new document it's going to be using that specific font so notice now it's Arial 12 if I open Microsoft Word again from scratch and changed it and such it's going to always be Arial 12 now if I want to change it to something else of course or to change it back you need to go back here to under the font area and then choose the font that you want change the size as well other properties if you wanted to and then choose set as default and then click on the same settings again click OK and that's how it's done so now if I go to create a new document here notice the font it's going to be Calibri size 11 segment of the Word tutorial, we're going to learn how to use search and replace in a document in Word. So let's say we have this document and let's say we want to replace the, all the protection words with the word security. Of course, one of the ways is to simply locate them and uh, type them, but that could take quite a bit of time. Plus, we could uh, miss some of the instances of this. So one of the options is here to click on find and we can uh, let's say uh, search here notice it says protection we just search the word protection and it gives us all the instances where this word is used so it's used 57 times we can click and it will take us to that specific area in the document so this is just finding the words but let's say now we want to replace those words. So we go to the top of the document and then we click here on replace. Now we're going to search. So instead of finding, we are just simply going to go to uh, replace. We're going to find the word protection and we're going to replace it with the word security. Then we click here. We can leave all these other options blank and at this point we can either choose find next and it will show us the next word or the next place that this word appears at and then we can either choose replace or replace all if you want to replace all instances of it in one shot now one thing to keep in mind here as well is that you can uh, replace words with other words or if you click here on more you can also match the case and replace them on specific uh, case how it's spelled or you could use wild cards or you could um, even replace the formatting so you can uh, select something that is formatted a certain way it'll find it based on that formatting and replace it as well based on that specific formatting. You can also search for specific characters or digits or any type of characters or paragraph marks. So let's say I want to search for anywhere where there are two paragraph marks and replace it with only one paragraph mark. Then we press next and it's going to locate. So notice it found one right here. I can choose to replace it and so on so I had in this case I had only a couple spots here where I can choose to replace all of them so that's how you replace or clean up a document using search and replace and then you press close
In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use formatting styles in a document in Microsoft Word, and then from these styles, how to create a table of contents. So formatting styles typically save you time. They're designed as a tool to save you time, particularly in formatting long documents. So it saves you time and also it provides consistency throughout the document for you. So the styles, you can access them from here. Notice you have the title style and you have the heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four styles and other ones as well. Plus you can create new styles if you want it as well or clear the formatting for specific styles in a document. So in this case, let's say this is the title of my document. At this point, I can go here under the title and that has been applied by simply tapping on title here. Now, if I prefer to modify the title, typically it's best to modify either the style itself by clicking Edit Modify here and then change this to be, let's say, bold and make it 14 and uh, things of that nature, like whatever you prefer for this style, basically. And then click OK, or you could change the style by formatting things the way you want over here. So I'm cleaning this up a little bit. Let's say I want it this way. Once you have the style applied or changed how you want it, you can go back here under that style and choose to update it to match the selection. So you're updating the title style here so that in the future when you apply it, it'll always be that type of formatting. So if I typically don't want to apply the title uh, style elsewhere in the document, but let's say I wanted to click on it and now it has been modified to those types of properties. So let's say that I want to format now this heading. So this would be heading number one. This is level one of my document content. While you can create your own personal styles, I suggest that you modify the style how you prefer. Let's say heading one here, I click on it. And let's say I didn't like it the way it looks right now. Change this to whatever you want it to look like. Let's say I want it bold and I want it um, to be indented all the way to the left here. And I want this style to be Calibri. And let's say for the sake of emphasis, I want it red. So I'm modifying, I initially applied the heading one style. Now I'm modifying it. Now I'm updating this style to how I changed it, how I like it. And then I go elsewhere in the document. Notice this is size 16, and this one I want to apply it right here. This is size 11. It's similar, but it's not the same. I click here on heading one, and notice it's applying it just right away. The next one, let's say this should be a heading one as well. Click on it. It's applied. Let's say this needs to be heading one and so on throughout the document. Now you can do the same thing for the other headings as well. So you go here, let's say this, you want it to be heading two. So in the table of contents, you'll have the title, then you'll have the first level heading, which would be considerations, the study of security. Then you have general observations right below that as another heading. You can choose here heading number two. You can choose here heading number two. And again, you can modify this style to what you want. Let's say I want this to be size 14, bold. And once I have applied it once, 
I want to update heading number two style so I can reapply it to other areas of the document. You can right click, choose update it to the selection, and then I go elsewhere in the document here. and choose heading number two. Notice it saves you time and it provides consistency throughout the document for you when you apply it. Obviously, this has to do also with the um, layout of the document, so you don't want to just select those levels randomly, but you want to apply it depending on how the document has been organized. So now, if I go to the top, and let's say I want to apply heading number three to another area of my document, Let's say I have here this, heading number three. Now, if for some reason you don't see heading number three or heading number four in the document, that means that you have to apply it first, let's, the previous heading. So let's say you can't apply heading number four unless you have something with a heading number three. So now I have here heading number three. I want to change the formatting as well to this. Make it, let's say, 12, size 12 update it, and then apply this same heading to other areas in my document. Now that I have applied the headings, notice it saved me time, it provided consistency. These, uh, the application of these headings can help us in creating a table of contents. So the table of contents, typically, it's at the beginning of the document. So for the sake of time and a lot, typically you'd have a blank page in the beginning and so on. But for now, I'm just going to insert the table of contents right here. Now the table of contents, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but yet since we are learning about the application of styles in the document, it's helpful to kind of tie those two together with the table of contents, and it's best to learn that now. So here we want to insert the table of contents. Table of contents, it's a reference tool that we want to insert. So you click here on references, you click on table of contents, or you could have typed up here under search, and it'll t go to table of contents. That's the other way to do this as well. Under Table of Contents, you have various options here that you can utilize, or different templates, basically. So here, you can pick whichever you want. I'm going to take this first one, Automatic. And now the Table of Contents will be created automatically. Notice I have level A, considerations about security, then the general observations. Notice it's uh, level two right below it. It has put the page numbers automatically and so on. Now, if for some reason you go and change one of those levels here or apply a different, um, let's say in here, I change this to apply level heading number two or let's make it one for easier identification. Once you ch make changes, whether to the page numbers or to the application of those headings, you, you can update the table of contents by going here to the table of contents, click once on it, and then choose Update Table. And then you choose to update the entire table. And then you'll notice that we'll have a new let, uh, heading one here in a moment. Notice this just changed and it was just updated. 
So that's how you apply styles to a document and how you create the table of contents for a document in Microsoft Word. As you're learning about the table of contents and these tools and the styles, one thing to understand at this stage is also that you can define styles a certain way to your liking with various properties and you can create your personal style of formatting as well. So you click here on the drop down and choose new style. Give it a name, click OK, and now I have the Solly style here. If I go somewhere else in the document, I can go and apply this particular style. The thing of uh, the word of caution here is that you can't apply these personal styles that you created, you can't apply them very easily to the table of contents. So therefore, I strongly recommend that you utilize one of the heading styles, then you modify that one particularly if you are planning to create a table of contents. If you are not planning to create a table of contents, then you can create any of those personal styles. In this segment of the Word tutorial, we are going to learn about using the editor tool in Microsoft Word from Office 365. This is a new tool in recent editions of Word. So let's say we have this document or report. We have made changes to it. We have applied some formatting to it and things of that nature. And now we want to check it for certain functionality and grammar and other options. Now remember, some of this grammar and is also covered on the review area. And I'll try to cover those later. But since we are early on, in the Home tab here, we are presented also with this tool for the editor. If you click on Editor, it's going to check for spelling in the document and it's going to identify the grammar areas and also various refinements such as for clarity, for conciseness, formality, punctuation, and things of that nature. Now you'll notice here that certain things are uh, with a check mark. That's because this was a document that I retrieved, so it was a published document, basically. A research document, it was published, so therefore those issues are fixed. Now here under spelling, if you click on the spelling area, it's basically saying there's no reference for this first one. Let's go to the next one. Again, there's no reference here as well, and no reference. So there are no spelling errors, it's just bringing things that are not normal. Notice that you may want to fix here called space virtual or so you may make changes in there. The other thing is so you can ignore those or ignore them all the time and then move to the next thing. Then you return back to the editor here and then we are going to check it for grammar. You click on grammar. Notice thus the programs of this sub it's recommending or it's suggesting to use thus comma so put a comma in there and basically you're making those changes and applying them directly by simply pushing those suggestions or acknowledging those suggestions here then you come back to the editor and then you go under the punctuation conventions or clarity and you make those changes as well And once uh, you deal with these suggestions, then you can close the editor and basically you have applied some of the tools, the editing tools. So it's kind of Word here is acting as your personal editor or professional editor to your document. In this segment of the Word tutorial, we are going to learn how to insert images and how to manipulate those images in a document 
in Word. So we basically go wherever we need to insert an image in the document. We assume now that we have this report and we want to enhance it. So we have gone through, through these common tools here in the Home tab and now we want to make enhancements to it by inserting various components to this document. So let's say we want to insert, in this case, images to this document. So we go here under Pictures. After we click on Insert, we choose Pictures. And then you can choose a picture from this device, which means your computer. You have to locate the picture. Or Stock Images Online or from the office or online pictures where basically you have to be connected to the internet to download those pictures. So first we're going to apply an image from this PC. So we go here, we go under either pictures or we go under documents, wherever you have your picture. And let's say I want to use Office 365. Notice you can resize this image by using one of those handles on the corners. Notice there is also a place here for alternate text. So you can type. This is for screen readers and for accessibility purposes. Now that you click on it, notice you have these tools that show up after we inserted the picture we have these tools. Those are called contextual tools. It's tools that show up in the context of what you're doing with a particular item from your document. So if you're working on a table, it'll give you the table tools or the contextual tools for tables. If you're using images, these are the contextual uh, tools for pictures. If you're using smart art, you'll get the smart art contextual tools and so on. Now here, you can apply some of those themes. These are very similar to the styles for formatting documents that we learned earlier. You're applying particular themes or styles for formatting a picture. Notice here it's adding the gray edges on the bottom and the right-hand side, or this is formatting. It's slightly different and so on. Notice there's a drop-down here. You can modify this however you please. And you can apply borders, you can also apply shadows and reflections and uh, 3D and all that type of stuff if necessary, if you prefer, with a simple click. I'm going to undo that. Now, the other thing for you to understand here is, is that uh, you can select here also the position for this a tool. So you have the alternate text that we just entered earlier. You can choose to change that from here, but also you can go under position and pick a different position where this should show up in your page. So you could have it in the middle of the page, the right hand side, bottom, and so on. So let's say I want it on the right hand side automatically. Notice it's changing it with a text. Also the positioning that's the positioning there, but then also the text wrapping. This is where you can specify whether you, how you want the text to wrap tightly through it, over it, and so on. So I'd suggest that you play with this, but it's one of the functions that's commonly used with uh, an object that you insert in your document. The other con uh, concept that I wanted you to understand at this stage is also how to crop this picture. So once I have it, of course, we learned earlier how to resize it from these handles. Of course, you can also choose to uh, spin it from this handle here on the top and change the, um, the layout of it or spin it around. Now notice that under the uh, wrapping of the text, we can actually change it so the text can come, come against it. So if we choose tight, Notice we can make the text tightly fit around this image. Now, from here, if we wanted to crop this, just simply double click on it. You go under the crop tool here, and then you move these handles. You can crop it from one of the handles in the bottom. Let's say I want to bring this up like that. 
and then this down. Or you could use the corner ones like that as well. And then once you're done with your cropping, you press crop again, and that will apply those cropping properties. Now, once you crop it, notice this doesn't look too great. You could go and apply a different theme to it or a different style and then adjust it slightly. And maybe even change the, the positioning of it and so on. So basically, that's how it works for any objects that you insert whether from the web or from your computer or any of those objects that you'll insert from here and how you modify those objects. Remember also one other thing under the image here, you can change and remove the background if you want it, you can change the color, you can add artistic effects and things of that nature by applying these tools here in the color area. Now, inserting images from other locations, so if we click here on Insert, we go under Pictures and then Stock Images, this is going to connect online and it's going to give us stock images, I guess, from Microsoft in this case. At this point, you'll select the image that you would prefer to utilize in your document or in your report, press Insert, and then further modify it using the tools that I explained just a moment ago. And then under insert here, pictures from online, of course you have to be connected to the internet here, and then you choose, this is searching online, like uh, using Bing. Simply type what you want to search for, Click on the image that you prefer, insert it, and then modify it. Notice here it's also giving us um, where it was taken, this image from, where it was downloaded from, and things of that nature uh, to give credit to it. In this segment of the Word tutorial, we're going to learn how to insert icons in a document in Word. So we have a document similar to this, and now we, can, we want to enhance this further. We have inserted pictures in the document, we have inserted a table of contents and things of that nature, and now we want to go in and insert or utilize, learn how to use some of those additional tools such as inserting icons in this document. So you can go, let's say, to a specific area of your document and then click here on Insert tab and then choose Icons. This is a new function in the later versions of Word uh, for Office 365. We click here on Icons and basically you can pick the category of icons. So these are kind of black and white, but they are designed so that you can have consistency throughout your document. So let's say I want this. You can search for uh, keywords as well. Or you notice you have illustrations here. You have stickers that you can utilize. You can have specific icons and things of that nature. So under technology, let's say I want to use this icon in my document. You click on it, click on insert, and it has been inserted at this point. But let's say I want to put it right in front of complete mediation. Bring that down, resize it. So that's one way I can have this to kind of make it slightly fancier. The other thing that I can do is go here under icons again and then for the next heading I could have some other icon related to technology. And you basically are resizing it Of course, the icon has to match the 
concept that you're trying to demonstrate, but it makes it a little bit more visually appealing when you utilize one of those icons to represent or to present the content to your viewer or your audience. In this segment of the Word tutorial, I'm going to demonstrate how to insert 3D models in a document in Word. So we have here a Word document, and for the sake of demonstration and of the functionality of Word, we're going to learn how to add 3D models. So we are in Word, we have the document, we go here under the Insert tab, and then we go under 3D models. Here you can search for a keyword or you can use one of those categories or uh, simply click on any of those items in here. So let's say I want this all animated. And then at this point just simply pick any of the animations or any of the objects here. Click on insert. And very similar to a document, you can kind of spin this, adjust how it will display to the, the viewer by using those controls. This is a new functionality. Obviously, you want to use this intentionally to make a point, and you don't want to overuse this to annoy you, the users. Uh, remember, the same functionality applies to this. So if you go here under and double click, you have the various views that you can apply to it. You also have the text wrapping functionality, the concept that we learned earlier. So you can have this so it wraps tightly against the text and you could pan and zoom and align it and all kinds of other tools. So keep in mind here to utilize these contextual tools that show up for this object within Word. In this segment of the Word tutorial, we're going to learn how to insert and use shapes in a document in Word. Now this function is not used as much, but at least for the sake of functionality of the product here, it will be worth covering. So we go here at any place on the document, then we click on the Insert tab, and then we go under Shapes. Now you can select any of those shapes. Of course, this is just to make a case. They have to be used purposefully for your document. And in this case, let's say I wanted to use one of those shapes. Now, one thing un unlike inserting a picture where the picture would be inserted automatically or icons and other components in the document, here we have to draw how big or where we want this object to be inserted and how large. So we select it. And now at this stage, notice that contextual tools show up so it's tools related to the shape component. Now here we can apply various styles for this. We can apply various um, animations. And we can apply here the text wrapping to make it tight and other components and edit this. If you don't like this, you can change the shape from here using this tool and it'll change it to something else. And so on. Now, one thing to keep in mind as you're working with the shapes, if, and this is just for the sake of learning about another thing here, is that if you go under insert, you can actually on top of this, you could insert a text box. So you could actually type stuff on top of this object. And you do that by clicking on Insert, choosing Text Box. 
and we are going to draw a text box directly as part of this. You can format this how you prefer. And then you can even change the background under the shape fill here to make it to no fill. And then you can make the, uh, the text color, make it white and in that way, it fits the text a little bit better. So in this case, we are learning about two concepts. One, inserting the shape and adjusting it in the document. The other one was inserting a text box that we embedded on top of the shape. Now, sometimes in order to move these, these are two separate objects, and this is another concept. You can actually click on the text box, hold down the control key, click again on the larger one, the outside one, and if you right click, you can actually group those together. It moves as one object rather than two. And that's how you work with shapes and how you modify them. In this segment, we're going to learn how to insert a table in a document and how to modify that table in a document in Microsoft Word. So we go here to any place in the document and we go under the Insert tab and then choose Table. If you click on the drop down here, you notice that you can draw a table, pick how many columns and rows you want, or you can draw it from here or use an Excel spreadsheet or use quick tables very similar to this for calendars or things of that nature. In our case, we are simply going to select how many columns and rows we want. So let's say I want three columns and two rows. Notice as soon as I select it, it's entered in the document. Now I can resize those columns as needed. And also notice on the top, we have the table design tools if uh, that gives us the various styles related to tables and tools related to tables. Notice also that next to table design tools is also the layout tab that gives us another set of tools related to working with tables. Now, if those tools for some reason do not show up for you, you may need to click out, click somewhere else in the document and then click back on the tools or double click on your table and then you should be able to see those table tools on the top. So next you typically enter the information in each cell. Now in the cases where you need to add additional columns or, or rows to your table, you can simply right click and choose insert and then choose insert rows below. And this is how you add additional rows. Now, for these table tools, as you can see here, notice that you have options also such as the total row. So you can click on total row here. And if I add another cell or another row below, now at this stage, if I go here under the layout tab, and go under formula, I could add a formula to give me the sum of all the cells above this. And I click OK. All I have to do is click OK and it'll give me the total for those numbers. Now at this stage, let's suppose that we want to make this table look better or more professional. We go under the table design tools 
and then pick one of the designs from here. If you click on the down arrow under the table styles, we can select from one of the styles here. To add and make additional modifications, I would suggest that you check out these other options and notice that uh, also you have these tools for adding rows and columns below. Also another key concept to remember here is the, and sometimes it gets tricky, is how the text is going to be indented in that specific cell. So right now notice for a firewall device it's at the top of the cell. Let's say we wanted that centered. You go here under the layout tool and you choose from one of those the alignment area. This is where you can define for that to be centered or if you want it to right side or left side but yet centered that's where you change this. Obviously you can change also the text direction and additional components here as you can see as well. In this segment I'm going to demonstrate how to insert hyperlinks in a document in Microsoft Word. So let's suppose that there's a need from time to time where you need to link to different supporting documents or external websites or a video somewhere from your Word document. So to hyperlink you simply select the words that you want within your document and then you go under the insert tab and then you go under the link option. From here you could link to a document in your computer or you could link to an address or uh, something on the web. So here for example I'll link to my YouTube channel and then you press OK. Now at this point this has been hyperlinked and the user if they hold the control key and, and click on it it will take you to that specific hyperlink on the web. Now you can also link to a document in your computer and if you select the words that you want in your document then you click on the insert tab and then you choose link and then you go and select that specific document. Then click on OK. Now at this point it will be clickable so you hold down the control key and this is linking to a document on the computer. This is a PDF and it will launch the PDF file. Now obviously the document that you're referencing has to be in the same computer when you're presenting this. So be careful when you're sharing the document with somebody else that, that they will have access to it. It's best to share it, upload the document somewhere on the web and then link it that way directly from the website. In this segment of the Word tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to insert a signature in a document in Word. So we go here under the Home tab and then we click on Insert and then go under Signature Line. Click on it. Now the first time you run it, you may be prompted to enable the Microsoft Signature tools and just proceed with anything positive for it. That's because at one point in the past I had clicked to enable it. Now here you simply put in the information that you want, the email address if necessary and so on and then you can allow also the signer to add comments in the dialog box as well. So typically you might want to fill out these and then you click OK. Then it will add a signature line very similar to this. At this point, the person signing the signature or signing this document will be needing to double-click on it and then type their name. 
And then they can also in, include comments in here. So they can, uh, they created this document, approved this document, whatever the type is of commitment. Then you can have additional comments added in here and then click on sign. It will prompt you whether to use the certificate. And there you go. So it puts some additional properties behind the scenes and it kind of connects with Microsoft Digital ID services to make this supposedly legit. It also collects additional information as to the time and date and, and so on from the user. So it's kind of half official, I would say, when it comes to this. But it's a tool that for internal use could be uh, uh, utilized by organizations or users out there uh, to collect somebody's signature or approval on a specific document or a process. In this next session, I'm going to talk about inserting or using the screenshot feature in Microsoft Word. So let's assume we have this document here and now we want to insert a snapshot, whether we are doing documentation on how to do something or whatever the case may be. So what you do is you go under the insert tab, you click on screenshot here and notice you can either clip the screen or you can pick from one of the available windows. So in my case, I'm going to do a screen clipping first. So I click on screen clipping. And now at this point, I could pick part of my screen. And now that has been inserted in my document. Now this you could use it for creating a manual or creating directions or whatever it may be within your document. This is basically just like another image that I insert in the, in the document. I can go here and customize this and make it look differently and, and so on. And apply the various different styles related to the images in the document. The other thing you can do is if you go here under the insert, under screenshot, so you have to have something opened in your computer, and then you can take a screenshot of an application that you may have opened in your computer. And then, of course, resize this however you need to. Another cool feature in Word 2016 is uh, the ability to insert media such as a video from online. So to insert video from online, you click on insert here, you go uh, to online video, and then you can search for videos, whether it's from Bing or from YouTube and so on. So if you go here, you're searching for a specific uh, video, you click on it, and then click on insert and there is the video from YouTube. Now at this point of course you could customize this if you needed to and format it differently just like an image in your document including the positioning of it in the document. In this next session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use a text box in a document. And let's say we want to insert a text box. So you go under the Insert tab, and then you go under Text Box. Now here you have different types of designs that you could pick from. So let's say I like this kind of design here. Now this has a cool design there. You, all you have to do is just put uh, some text here. And there you have your text box. If you wanted to change it or make adjustments to it, again, remember the concept is, is that you can double click on it and click on the various tools related to this particular object. And of course, using options within this. Remember, you can always resize it and move it wherever you need to move it. In this very brief session, I'm going to demonstrate how to insert a caption 
for a specific object in a document in Microsoft Word 2016. So suppose you have all these images or charts or objects within your document and you want to reference them through your document. So what you do is you click on the object here, you go under References and then click on Insert Caption. And then you just choose Figure 1 or whatever the label that you want and let's say you want it below the item. Just click OK and now notice it says Figure 1. Now you come to the next thing here, and you do the same. That says figure two. You can also type it right here and simply click OK. And you can further customize it if you need it. So that's basically how you insert captions for various objects within your document in Microsoft Word. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to create columns and basically format your document to use columns. The way it works is, is that you can go to here, the Layout tab, and then you go under Columns. And if you want just columns throughout your document, let's say two columns or whatever you need, you simply click on two and then it's going to apply it throughout that section in your document. If you don't want that, then I'm going to undo this part here you can simply go to a specific section, select it, and then click on Columns, and then click on More Columns, or you can just choose two for that here, if you wanted just two. Notice, once we selected it, it applied it to just that specific section. The other thing you can do is you can go under Columns, More Columns, and this is where you can customize it even further. Let's say you want a line in between, and you can uh, how many columns you want and that type of thing and then also where it applies whether it applies to the whole document or to the selected section or to the whole document in this session i'm going to demonstrate how to use citations and bibliography and managing sources for references in a document this is a very powerful tool and I strongly suggest that if you're a student anywhere, uh, you take advantage of this. This tool allows you to insert uh, sources of information for a book or article or other material where it came from. And then as you're utilizing it for multiple papers, it also builds a repository of the source resource manager stuff within your master list here. Let's say this is something that we are citing. So let's assume we copied this and now we want to cite it. You first have to determine what your style of writing is, whether it's APA or MLA. So I'm going to pick at this point APA. Basically, you just have to do this once for all your papers or for that course or whatever you're uh, for that document. And then you click here on insert citation. You could insert an existing one or you add a new source. So in this case, let's say it's a book and the author here, you could click on edit or you can simply type it here. You enter the title of the author and then you put the year when it was published, the city. And then the publisher as well. You could also insert here additional fields if you needed to as to what volume it is, the number of volumes, the title, pages, and so on. Then you click OK. Notice for the APA style, this is how you would cite this source. Last name, comma, 2016. Now we go to another part of the document and let's assume that uh, this was another section that we want to cite. We put in parentheses and now we go here under citation and then add a new source. Notice that under the new source you can pick other things as well. 
So for example, you could pick a journal article, you could pick a, a periodical, a conference, or a report, a website, a recording, and so on. All of these are the small technicalities that are complicated to, to remember, but this is a tool that makes it easy for you how to cite it. So for example, an article from a website, you could simply click to a document from a website, and you put in the author. Notice you also have examples here. So in this case, we are going from uh, to the web. So we go here to the website, and let's say this is the article, Can Laws Keep Up With the Tech World? And it was written and published on such and such a date. So now the author in this case, it would be Bruce Schneier. And then we go to our document, and then we'll just put the author in there. The name of the web page is the title of the article. The name of the website, so this would be for example CNN.com. The year 2015. So we actually we want to put the year in there, or the date that it was published. So notice it was updated on November 21st, 2015. So we put here year 2015, the month December, and then the day 21. And then you also need to put in there the URL for this article. So we copy it, and then we'll paste it in there. And then we simply click OK. And it's good to go at this stage. Now, let's say that somewhere else, now notice I'm going up in my document here. Let's say that this is my other section that I want to cite. And now, let's assume that I'm simply citing this for now. I can go ahead and click here on Insert Citation, and I could even pick an existing citation. Now, notice here under Manage Sources, I used two of them in this document, those that have the check marks. Those were new ones that I just entered. But basically, this is a list of other sources that I have done other research, for example, this first one. Now, what I could do is I could utilize this in my document here, in my paper. So all I have to do is I go here under Insert Citation and pick that source to be included. Now, let's suppose that I'm done with all my citations for this paper, and now I want to insert the bibliography or the works cited. Go here to my document and insert a new page. I go and insert, let's say, a page break or whatever. Uh, basically, I'll just do a page break for now. And now, on the next page, I want to insert the bibliography. I go under References, and then I click on Bibliography. And notice it gives you more options here. You have Bibliography, References, and Works Cited. That will depend on the type of of uh, research that you are doing and what your paper or professor requires. So for example, if I wanted bibliography here, here's my bibliography. And it has the word bibliography. By the way, it's putting everything also alphabetically, automatically, and it's formatting and uh, italicizing and doing all that uh, redundant work automatically for you. In this segment of the Word tutorial, we are going to learn how to insert a cover page in a document. So here we have a document that we have um, manipulated and added a bunch of uh, stuff to it. We have um, inserted various components on it. And now we want to change under the insert area, we want to insert what's called a cover page. You can click here on the insert tab click on cover page and then choose from one of those templates that that will display automatically here note that there are additional templates that you can download from office.com and embed them in the document as well so I'll click here and I'll, let's say I'll pick this one 
and then you give it a document title. Fix the font how you want it. Add additional properties if necessary. Or delete areas or components that you may not want. Notice that it's smart enough to insert the cover page at the top of the document for you automatically. Now from here you could add a different image if you'd prefer and change this and modify this as needed. In this segment of the Word tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to insert a page break in a document. So let's say we have this document and we want this to always start on a new page. So this heading to be always on a new page. So we go here under the Insert tab and we choose to add a page break. So we basically click right in front of that heading and then go under insert, we choose page break, and from now on, no matter what you type or how you type this, so let's say I copy it a bunch of text here and I keep on adding to it, and notice pretty soon it's gonna jump into a new page. Notice that even though it's only one line or two lines here on the next page, notice this, got pushed down to a brand new page. So that's the purpose of a page break in a document is that you specify a particular heading or a particular area of your document to always be on a new page. Now, for most users, the difficulty is how do I remove that page break? To remove it, you need to go under the Home tab here, and then click on this icon for the paragraph to show and uh, reveal the hidden symbols. Then you scroll down and notice that at the end of the page where it ended uh, from the previous section, notice there is this page break area. So you want to select it and then press delete on your keyboard and then it will bring everything up. Then you can unhide those hidden characters and you're all set. In this segment of the Word tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to use Smart Art in a document in Word. Smart Art is used to quickly and easily make a visual representation of your information. So basically we go here to our document and let's say we want to outline the research paper writing process. So typically you can represent this in a document very similar to this, like selecting a topic, then identifying the research problem, then collecting the relevant data, then analyzing the data, then writing the research paper and proofreading it as well. So this is one way that historically most have done it. So you simply list these topics or these areas and that is basically how you're outlining it. However, you can take the same information and convert it into smart art. So unlike PowerPoint, where you can select the information and convert this into a smart art, unfortunately in Word, you have to retype this stuff all over again. So we go here under Insert, we go under Smart Art, and then pick one of the processes from here. So let's say I'll pick this first one. Click OK. Now I have these options. Now it's asking me to type those the processes. So in this case, I'll simply copy them and paste them in here. So I don't have to retype it from scratch. And I'm clicking down here where the smart art area is. 
Obviously, you want to do this from the start rather than the way that I did, and I did that for demonstration purposes. Now that you can kind of see that uh, the smart art, it's uh, more visually appealing here. Now to take this one step further, you can double click on the smart art that you just created. And notice that the smart art design tools show up. Now you can change the design if you prefer to something different. And notice you get the live preview. And once you select one of the designs that you prefer, now you can select also various color schemes as well. And furthermore, you can adjust the design of the smart art as needed. So basically, instead of you representing that topic by just a bunch of uh, bullet points, you're now using a smart art object to represent the same idea, but it's more visually pleasing. Now here, obviously, you can modify this further and adjust certain areas of your smart art image. Under the formatting, you can then adjust other stuff here related to it, including the text wrapping if necessary. In this segment of the Word 365 tutorial, in this segment of the Word 365 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to use the design feature in Word. So we have this document, and the document, we have a cover page, we have a table of contents, we have images, tables, objects, and charts, and things of that nature, and smart art. Now, here, you can go and apply a design theme to the whole document so that objects and components within that document, they flow from a design point of view. So you go here under the Design tab, and then you can select from one of those document formatting styles, if you prefer, or you can go under the Theme area and select from one of those themes and notice it will give you a preview, a live preview of what the document is going to look like once that theme has been applied. Notice it changes the font style, it will change the color combination, and things of that nature. So pick one of the styles that you prefer, and then Notice that the various objects that we have inserted throughout the document have been uh, modified to apply the same color scheme across the whole document. Now those colors, you can further modify them if you prefer. So if I go here and change it to Office 2007 or a different color theme that can apply again. So if you like the font, you like the additional properties, but don't like specific color schemes, you can modify it from here under the uh, colors option and also you can modify the fonts as necessary. So that's how you apply a theme throughout the whole document uh, for your specific report. In this segment of the Word tutorial, I'm going to demonstrate how to insert headers and footers in a document. So let's suppose we have this document. It's a pretty long document, 16 pages, and now we want to insert a footer. We go here under Insert, and then go under the section for header and footer. So 
under the drop down for footer we can select the type of footer that we want to insert and notice there are different designs that you can apply to this document so simply select one of those designs click OK and notice it lists it gives you the type of footer that you selected automatically now in this case it's selected to page 2 out of 15 now here you could format this text to be a different color if you prefer and to make it larger or smaller and things of that nature now notice also as you're dealing with headers and footers now in our case we have a cover page but if we didn't have a cover page typically your first page it will have the page number in that case you want to select that option for different on first page that's what makes the page number not show up on that very first page if you had a cover page or if it showed up from here you could add other field types under the footer such as for example if we go down here let's say to the left of this footer i want to insert the file name you can do that by going here under inserting document information and you can choose the author or the file name or the path or you can even insert a field name um, and get more granules such as the date created and table uh, all kinds of areas or data from this specific document so I'll choose here file name and that's my uh, current file name of course I want to make it smaller I probably want to change the type of font and notice that has been applied to the rest of the document if I want to get out of the footer mode just double click anywhere in the text and that will bring you back and take you off the footer mode if you want to go back into it double click on the footer and it will bring you the tools related to header or the footer now the same the process works uh, the same way for the header so if I go under the document here and choose insert then header and then pick one of those header types or header templates and then I chose the, to have the document title here you can adjust the formatting of this as needed and apply the same kind of tools and layout you have diff three different tabs of contextual tools in this case and the reason for that is because we are working with a table within our header area of the document. In this segment of the Word tutorial, we're going to learn how to insert a footnote in a document in Word. So let's say we have here this specific document and in a particular area of the document we want to insert a footnote all you have to do is you go under the references tab and then you click on insert footnote so it will insert the footnote at that specific location within the, the where you had clicked or placed the mouse once you press insert footnote then you can type those explanatory notes for that document now, typically, if you uh, move this paragraph to a new page, then it will move that footnote with it automatically as well. Now, that was a footnote. Now, in, the, in some other cases, you might need to insert what's called an endnote. The endnotes will be displayed at the very end of the document, just like its name states. So we click here on the specific area in the document, then we click on insert and note and then type in there the notes that you would prefer to insert in there and that's all that there is to it
In this segment of the Word tutorial, we are going to learn how to change the margins and the layout of a document in Word. So we have this document that we have been working for a while here in the Word 2019 or Office 365 tutorial. And now we want to change the margins. By default, the margins are at one inch on all sides. So you access those properties by going here to the Layout tab. And then the first option is margins. And notice it's one inch on the top, left, bottom, and right. If you prefer a specific, uh, let's say, narrow margins, 0.5 inches on all corners, all you have to do is press the narrow, and it will apply it to the whole document with that single click. If you prefer custom margins, you scroll down to the bottom, you choose uh, custom margins, and then that's where here is where you can change, let's say on the top, I want 0.7 inches and I want to apply it to the whole document. Then you press OK. Now, if you want all your documents to start a certain way, you can choose to set this as a default with those margins and any new documents that you create in the future, if you choose this set as default and you press OK to this, any new documents will start with those dimensions. Then you press OK and those margins have been applied or those settings have been applied. Now, under the custom margins area, notice also one other thing. You can apply specific margins also to a part of the document or to the whole document. So right now, since we did not select anything, we have the option for this document or this point forward. So let's say I want one inch on all sides here, or let's say on the top, I want one inch for this document from this point forward. I can select that option and click OK. And now from here and on, it would be one inch, but from the point prior to this, it would be whatever we had specified from earlier. If you select a page in a document and you go under custom margins, notice that you can apply specific properties to something. Now we have the option to the selected sections of the document. And then you press OK and it will apply to that particular section of the document that you selected. Now, as far as the orientation, you can apply the orientation to the whole document or to a particular page of that document. And to change it, so here under orientation, we applied it to the whole document. So let's undo that, and I'm going to do Control Z. So now to apply a specific page to change it to landscape for a particular area, let's say we had something that we wanted to present in a different way, you can go to that particular page and go under margins, then custom margins, and then choose landscape from this point forward. Then click on OK. And now the previous page, notice it's in portrait, but this page and the, con and the content following, it is in landscape. Now, let's say we don't want the subsequent pages to be in landscape. You can go back to margins, custom margins, portrait from this point forward and click OK. And that uh, the rest of the document will be and portrait. Now you could change it, but you'd have to apply sections to the document if you wanted to apply it to only a specific section. So you don't have to do this point forward from here. And then you'd have to go back to change it again from this point forward to portrait from the next page.
this segment of the Word tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to use a couple of the research tools built into Word. These come in handy particularly for students as they do research papers. So this is under the References tab. So let's say we have this document and we are in the References tab here. <clears throat> And then we click on the search option. So basically, this tool is enabling us to use Bing, the Microsoft search engine, to research specific topics or items or tools uh, over the web while writing our paper. So here, we can specify that we want to select, we are interested in searching the web, not pictures and things of that nature. And let's say we want to research computer security. simply type the words and you're basically doing the search directly from here without being bugged with other stuff there. And then this link, it will open the web browser at this point and you can perform or read the content and so on from your website. So that's one of the tools that you can utilize here. The other one is this tool called Researcher. So if you click here, it says you find sources, you research, you add sources to your document, and the sources are automatically cited and repeat. So you type your topic. And let's say you utilize the resource from this site. You can choose to open this in the browser so that you can read it. And this is the article. Now let's suppose that you're using this in your paper. You go to your paper here and you can choose to add this as a citation. So let's suppose that I cited certain things from this document here. Let's say this is part of what I cited from that particular document. Now you go in here, you choose add this source as a citation. Now notice up here I have chosen the APA style for my citations. If you're undergrad, typically you'd have the MLA citation standard. In this case, I'm choosing APA. You click on add this source as citation and that's there uh, that's all that there is to it we can click on to create a bibliography and it will add it at the bottom of the document with all the references and all that stuff without us having to know how to do this appropriately for this resource and as you add additional resources in your document. So let's say we are over here and now I go and use another article. Let's say I like this one. You choose here, add this as a citation. Update the bibliography. And now the bibliography has been updated accordingly with the proper standards and that. So those are uh, the researcher tool, the finder tool is something that you can utilize. The other thing that you can do while you're writing your paper or research paper and, uh, or a document of some sort or a report, instead of using, a, let's say you want to find synonyms for that word, you can go to a word in order to find the proper meaning of it and so on. You can go to the word, right click on it, and choose synonyms, and notice you're presented with a bunch of other options for your paper. As soon as you select it, it's going to replace it. So basically, this would be a great tool while you're writing your paper or a report to make sure that you're using the right word for the right context.
this segment of the Word tutorial for Office 365, I will demonstrate how to insert comments in a document. So let's suppose that you're collaborating with others in your office or with uh, your team and uh, somebody sent you this document and now you want to make uh, comments in this document. So one of the options is as you're reading the document you can select specific words or paragraphs for that matter. So then you can go under the review area here, the review tab, and you click on new comment. And then on the right hand side this is where you can type your comment. So this is simply adding comments to a document. Now the other thing that you can do is you can actually enable track changes in this document. So you click on track changes and at this point if you prefer to delete certain areas and then you simply type whatever needs to be changed. The system at this point will track all the things that you are changing. So you can choose to show the track changes. Notice by default it will be in red here on the left. And it will highlight by you clicking on to show the track changes. And you can add new sections as well. Now, the reviewer on the other end, when they receive or they review the, these notes from you, they have an opportunity to go through each one of them and they can accept those changes or reject those changes. So, re accept and move to the next. Accept and move to the next. Or they can accept all of them as well if they just previewed them first. Or they could reject and move to the next. And that's how you can collaborate among other users. Now typically those changes on the right here, it would have the name of the individual and the time when they edited that uh, item. You can also reply to their comments or resolve those comments. This is kind of very similar to the Google Docs functionality. Now notice as you're working on this, notice that there is uh, there are a couple other options here. The to view the document with all the markups, meaning these all these uh, notes and content and uh, suggestions and modifications and that type of stuff. Or you can uh, view the original without any of these changes or just a simple markup here and there without too many notes. Now before you send the document to somebody else, you need to make sure that you clean all of those markups and approve them so that the comments do not be, get sent to the final reviewer or whoever is going to access uh, this stuff. And in order to clean up the document of any personal information or any of these comments, you can do that by clicking here on File, and you go under Info for the file, and then you choose to inspect the document. Choose inspect here. We need to save the changes first. And then here we can inspect it. Let's say you don't care for these other document properties, your name and that type of stuff, how long it took. But yet we want to remove all the comments, revisions and, and so on. We click on inspect and then remove all the comments and notes about the comments. Reinspect it again. And now it is safe for you to send this document to your audience 
and they will not be able to view any of those comments that you had made while working with your team. In this segment of the Word tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to save an existing document as a PDF file. The advantage of a PDF file is that uh, the user or the viewer uh, that you're sending this document is going to access it exactly how you have saved it, and they also cannot modify it, and they can open it in multiple devices as needed without needing Microsoft Word. So to convert this document into a PDF, there are a couple ways to do it, but one of the simplest ones is to click here on File, and then choose Export. And then under this option, Create PDF or XPS Document, you simply click on Create PDF XPS, and then give it a name. Take note where you're saving it, and then give it a name. Press Publish, and that's all that there is to it. And now the document has been saved into PDF. In this segment of the Word tutorial, I will demonstrate how to protect a document with a password and how to encrypt it with a password. So we have here this existing document, and then we go here under File, and then we go under Info. From here, we have this option, Protect Document. Click on it, and then choose to restrict it with a password or to encrypt it with a password. Click on Encrypt with a Password, and then enter a password that you'll remember. Notice that the passwords are going to be case sensitive. We need to confirm the password again, and now a password will be required in order for us to open this document. Now if I go ahead and close this document, and I had saved this as uh, a working document for videos number three. This was the document I was working on earlier. Double click on it. We'll be prompted to use a password. And then we'll be able to open it. Now to remove the password in case you needed to do that, you click here on file again, and then you go under info, and then under protect document, we need to click on Encrypt of the Password, just click on it again, and then we erase whatever the password is that we had from earlier. Then go back, save the document, reopen it, and it should not ask us to open it with a password again. So that's how you set a password on a document and how you remove it. In this segment of the Microsoft Word tutorial, I'm going to demonstrate how to remove personal information from a document. So we have this document, and if we click here on File, and then we go under Info, it shows us how long we worked on this document, who worked on it, who created it, who modified it last, and also the date and time it was printed and modified and things of that nature. And then you can also click here on Show All Properties and see additional properties for this document as well. So there are a couple ways to clear this personal information. This would be helpful if you're sending this document outside of your organization and you don't want how long it showed your total editing time or other properties as well. You don't want uh, that part of information sent to whoever is receiving it. So to do that, uh, one of the options is to do it directly here from Microsoft Word by using the Inspect option. And the other option is to go under File Explorer and change uh, the remove the personal information from there as well. 
And I'm going to show both of those in a moment here. So to remove the personal properties from here, we click on Check for Issues, then we click on Inspect Document, and then you can uh, leave the comments, revisions, and that type of stuff checked. But uh, the one that you want to make sure to remove is this uh, Document Properties and Personal Information. But for now, we're just going to remove the personal information, personal document properties and personal information. We click on Inspect and then choose to remove them all. Then reinspect it again, inspect it until you get a green check mark from here. If we go back, notice it will not have the author, it will not have the total editing time and all that type of stuff. But basically, it has removed any of those uh, this personal information. So that's one way to remove it. The other way to remove the personal information is to go to your files here, right-click on it, and then choose Properties. And we are using uh, Windows Explorer. So to get to it, we just uh, go to Explorer, to File Explorer here. Go to the file that you want, right-click, choose Properties and then click here on the Details tab. And right now it doesn't have the author and all that stuff because I just removed it from a moment ago. If I go to this other one, click under Details, notice that it has all these different uh, pieces of information. We click here on Remove Properties and Personal Information, and you can select to remove any of these items. So we choose Select All, click OK, and it's going to clear all of these properties from that document. So that's how you remove personal information uh, both ways or either way here in Microsoft Word. In this segment of the Microsoft Word tutorial, I'm going to demonstrate how to protect the document to allow only specific permissions for editing the document. So we have here this document, and we click on File, and then we go here under Info, and then notice under Protect Document, we have this option. So we can change it so that it's always read-only, so whenever this document is opened, it will be opened only as read-only or you can restrict editing for this particular document. And you can also grant only access to a document uh, to a specific user. For now, we are going to work only on restricting editing. So we click on Restrict Editing, and then we choose here what to allow or disallow. So you can actually go here in Formatting Styles and uh, restrict it so that users cannot change the theme or they can block the quick style editing or allow only specific styles to be used in this particular document. Next, we can allow only, for example, only tracking the changes in the document or only commenting in the document or only filling forms in this particular document. And then you can set these permissions for everyone or for specific users. So for specific users, you have to be connected to a domain within the company and then basically specify the name of the, uh, the domain in your company or the email address of that user and you separate those users with semicolons. And then you simply click on Start Enforcing Protection and that's all that you need to do. Now, to modify those permissions, in case somebody needs additional access, they'll need to enter a password. If the user enters a password, then they can make adjustments to the permissions of this document. I open up the document again, and at this point, when I come back here to make any modifications, notice that I have been restricted to making any modifications to this particular document. So I can either go here under Review tab, basically I'm allowed at this point to make uh, only comments in this document. Now, if I wanted to, to stop the protection of this document, notice I'm prompted to enter a password. 
So as the owner, I can go in and enter the password and then remove those restrictions in this particular document. In this segment, I'll demonstrate how to share a document with other users. One way to share it is in a network drive on your network, so it could be a K drive, J drive, or whatever it is on the network. The other option is to share it by clicking here on File, and then choose Share. Now you can share it using the OneDrive option, and you're signed into OneDrive, or you can share it as an attachment by copying this and it will prompt you to send a copy of this document provided you have Microsoft Outlook configured. If you have Microsoft Outlook configured, it will open Microsoft Outlook and I don't have that configured right now in this, uh, for uh, this tutorial and it will put it as an attachment. If you choose the PDF option, it's going to have it as an attachment. It's going to open your email and have it as an attachment as part of that email. Now, if you want to use OneDrive, you simply select the OneDrive option here, double click on it, and now you can choose anyone with a link can edit it. You can enter the name of the user, select the name of the user, add a new message, or you can copy the link and just send them the link to that document via an email. So you just click on copy now and you simply in your email you copy this link and you send it to them as part of your email. So that's one way to collaborate with uh, one of the users in sharing this document. Now notice that instead of clicking on file and then choose share where we come to these options you also can do the sharing directly from up here on the top right. So you click on share and basically it will give you the same options as before. In this segment of the Word tutorial, I'm going to demonstrate how to open a PDF in Microsoft Word so that we can edit it. Typically, when you have a PDF document, you cannot modify it very easily. But with Word 2016 or later, you can actually open a PDF document in Word and then modify it from there. So we have this document here that, as you can see, it's in PDF. And let's say we don't have the Word version of it. Now, what we can do is open Word, and then simply go and locate the document. If you don't see the PDF option, we want to choose the All Files option. Then click on the PDF file, then click on Open. And then it will prompt you that it will convert it into an editable Word document. It will take a while, depending on the length of your, and the complexity of the document. Click OK here, and then simply wait for it to open. Now at this point, notice I can go and edit and add more stuff here. Once you have opened the document, then from here we can save it. and then return to it at any point. So notice I have it here, Word in um, working with videos, and modify it as you need. In some other cases, you might have documents which are a little bit more complex. So we go here under Open, Browse for the file, and then let's say I have this document that has columns and that type of stuff and images. Click on it, and let's say I have it only in PDF, Click on Open, it will prompt us, and then you can still modify it as you need. And then simply save it, and then you have a Word document to work with. 
Now, if you wanted to convert it into a PDF file, again, to share it or and what, you can simply click on File, press Export, press Create PDF XPS, and then this will save it in PDF again for sharing. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to perform a mail merge. The process is actually very similar to other versions of Microsoft Word as well. It's not identical. So let's say I have this long document here, and I want to do a mail merge and send this to individual subs. For now, I'm going to create a new page here. I'm going to insert a new page, and I'm going to put their information in there for my clients, let's say. So in this case, I'm going to go under insert and I'm going to insert a page break. So just so that I have a blank page here to start with. And then in here, I'm going to make it so that this document can be customized for each individual. It has their address and their name and some kind of information as well. And by the way, this doesn't have to be a document like this. It can be a blank document, a letter that you sent. It could be invoices. It could be whatever notices that you send out there. It's very similar to letters that you receive from various companies out there that have your name on top of it. You have to have a document in Word, and you have to have an Excel document as well. And that's best to use Excel. Let's assume this is the list of my customers. I have their first name, last name, the state address. Of course, this is all fictitious, the zip code and then a bunch of email addresses and you could have also comment one two three so this would be personalized comments so, so this is what the comment that i could write for example for customer one now customer two i would say and so on now one key thing to remember as well as you build your list in excel is that uh, the first row here needs to have the field names or it's best to have the field names so first name last name telephone state address and keep those separate as well if you can keep as many fields as you want here or columns with comments because you can utilize this for multiple mail merges and the way you'll be doing it is that you can link the same data file and you keep on updating this from month to month and you link it to the same report or the same mail merge that you do for your customers so in this case let's say we are all good to go here we have maintained this list this is our customer list notice that the tab here on the bottom it says customer so now I'm going to save it. Now in here, I want to create a new mail merge. So I go under mailings and then I go under start mail merge. And the best thing to do is, or what I'd suggest that you do is click on step-by-step -step mail merge wizard. In here, notice that there is pane in the right-hand side shows up and it asks you, do you want to create letters, email messages, envelopes, labels, and so on. You can do emails and that's a powerful feature and I'll try to demonstrate that in another video here or actual letters like the old days that you used to do print them in a paper and stuff them in an envelope and send them and that type of thing so for now we're going to learn how to do letters we click on next step to start the document it says do you want to use the current document that we have opened here or do you want to start from a template or do you want to use an existing document that you have from some other time so I say I want to use the current one and then the next step here is to select the recipients. Now it says do you want to use an existing list or do you want to create a new list? In our case we are going to use an existing list, that Excel file that I opened a moment ago. Also you can use Outlook if you use Microsoft Outlook as well. Now type a new list you can do it from here from Microsoft Word however I'd recommend create the list in Excel if you're going to have to create a new list because it's much easier to manage in the future and update. So we click here on uh, use an existing list. We click on browse and then we have to find the file. And this is my customer list for the mail merge. I click on open. That's my Excel file basically. And here is my customer table. Notice there are two sheets in there, but I want to use, remember I mentioned earlier, customer. Click OK. Now notice this is the list of all the customers in that Excel spreadsheet. You could also sort them a certain way if you wanted. So you can sort them alphabetically by first name, by last name, and all that type of thing. 
and then you can also filter them if you needed to so let's say you want only by a specific zip code or by a specific criteria and so on you could basically simply click on filter and choose a field name and uh, let's say here's a zip and you would say zip equal to some number or greater than some number and so on so in this case i'm going to cancel that you could uh, find duplicates to avoid sending duplicates and then you simply click on ok here at this point we are ready we have told the system that we're going to use the existing document and an existing list now the next thing it says write your letter now in my letter here it's saying well put in your address block i could put this by clicking on it or we could insert the fields manually i would recommend that you tinker with it manually so you could say dear and then choose here the insert field option so dear first name the computer will put the first name in there then you go to the next line here and then you start writing your letter basically now the other thing you could do is in here you could put their address so that it would be part of the envelope so we click here under insert field first name space last name and then insert field street address city comma state and the zip now those look coded but computer is going to pull them one by one and match them with the excel spreadsheet so don't panic on that now in here you would write your letter you'd say below is the annual report for your investments let's assume this is an investment report and uh, you could also insert here remember in excel we had a comments field you could put a, a comments field in here now at this point you put your name there you could also insert an image if you needed to or a logo or whatever part of your it's going to be duplicated across all the pages now at this stage you could simply actually save this if you were to save it at this point and you'd give it a name the reason why i saved it is because you could at any point open this and it's going to pull your data automatically from your excel file if you needed to do another mail merge in six months or whatever now the next thing here notice it says preview your letters so notice it says this is the address alex and so on and you could kind of preview them right here next 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 now a lot of people they stop here but you need to finish to complete your merge you can click here under complete merge and then you can either choose to print them or edit individual letters now there's also a finish and merge option on the top here as well so in my case particularly what i usually prefer to edit individual letters and then i'm going to choose all of them now it's going to take a little while because i had 29 pages here and i have a lot of customers so notice now we have one letter or long report for every one of the customers here so notice we have here the first one is for alex and now we have to keep on scrolling because this is a long report and now here's amber it's the next customer and again like i mentioned it's going to be a long one so suppose you have two or three pages and this would be much more meaningful but basically we're creating a personalized report here for each one of the customers and here's for the next third one keep in mind again the key there is that this is the output at this stage if we were to look at the documents that i have opened here and apparently i have many of them but this is the one with merged results it says letters one word uh, this we can actually uh, trash it after we are done with it we don't need to save it unless you need it for documentation purposes this is our form so at this point if i close this and i save the changes if I go to open this again so this was the one for mail merge form notice it prompts you it says this opening this document will run the following commands select from customer order by first name and last name do you want to update it yes and now it's linking it to the excel file 
Now at any point we can go here under mailings and it's ready. We can simply click on finish and merge and it's going to merge all of those just like it did earlier. So hopefully that is helpful. And uh, keep in mind again before I end this session that you can always update the Excel file and you can always reuse the form file. The results page, the merged results, you don't necessarily need to save them unless you need to keep them for documentation purposes as to what you sent out. In this brief video, I'm going to demonstrate how to create an email merge to contact customers via email and send them customized emails with their name and specific information pertaining to their account or pertaining to them. So the way it works is that you have to have an Excel file where you're keeping track of the data. By the way, this does not have to be just Excel. It can be a data in an access database. It could be data pulled from another system and so on. It could be data from Outlook and, and so on. But the simplest way is to have it in an Excel file. It's important that on the first column here you'd have the actual field names for what they stand for. For example, this column stands for first name and it has all the first names and the last name and then telephone number and so on. This the labels here on the top will use them from within Word when we do the email merge. The other thing that you will need to have in order to do an email merge is that you need to have an email address or a field with the email address for each of the customers. Of course, the email shouldn't be exactly the same for all the customers, otherwise it will not really work the way you intend it to. In order for this to work is that you need to have Microsoft Outlook installed or a MAPI compliant email application installed. And usually if you have Office in your computer, the Microsoft Outlook client application comes with it and most likely you are using it. Or in a business environment, you'd be using that. So the, uh, the way this works is you'd go on in Microsoft Word. So we can close the Excel file at this point. We go into Word and we'll create a new document. It doesn't have to be a new one. You can use an existing email or an existing template from Word that you are using. Again, this works in conjunction with Excel and Outlook and Word. So we are using three applications from the Office suite. So in this case, we go under Mailings and then we click on Start a Mail Merge. Then we go under Mail Merge Wizard and then we go under Email Messages. The process is exactly the same as for creating labels or creating regular mail merge for letters. The only difference is in the very end when it initiates using Outlook. So in this case, we'll go to next step here. We chose email messages, then start the document, and we are going to use the current document. If we wanted to use something else, we can pick one from here. Then we click the recipients. We have to tell the computer what the recipients. We're going to use an existing list and we are going to click on browse to find the list. Then we'll go under wherever we have our Excel file. So you'd know wherever you saved it and you'll pick the first field that shows up from your Excel file. If your Excel file has more tabs and you're using those tabs, then of course, that's what you'd be picking here as well. Notice here it says first row of data contains column headers. You'll click OK. And then this is our data. We can filter it, we can sort it, we can do other stuff here. But for the sake of simplicity, we are not going to tinker with that. And then we are going to click OK. The next step here, it is to write the email message. So we click and then we go to start writing we can say dear and then insert the field dear first name
And let's assume at this point that the order number was actually this one under customer ID. We're going to mix it at this point a little bit. So you put in that and then you can put in other comments and you can put in whatever other fields that you might be keeping from your data file. So now if we wanted to insert a coupon or whatever it may be, we go online here, we search under Bing for a coupon code. Let's assume that's the coupon. We can format this a little bit better if we wanted to and customize it further. And the next thing is we can click on preview your email. Notice it says, Dear Owen, thank you for a recent order, 1105. And then we can go to the next customer here. And you can see Dear John, Dear Harry, Dear Kathy, and so on. So you can see it. It's going to send them exactly the same email, but it's going to be personalized with their own name and also some kind of pertinent information related to them. Now, in this case, we can click on complete the merge. And then the option here, which is different from regular mail merges, is that it's asking us for electronic mail. Then we tell it that the to field is in the email column for the Excel file. So if we had that labeled somewhere else or something different, then you would choose whatever the name of that column is. So in this case, I'm going to choose email. And then you could put a subject line. This will be the title of your email as just like your regular emails. Then the format you want to have the format. If you're going to use pictures like this, you want to make it HTML format. And then you'd simply click OK. Now, at this point, the way it works is that the system is going to connect and utilize Microsoft Outlook and it is going to send those emails one after the other. It's not going to be like a, a distribution list. It's going to be just one email after the other. Now, be cautious and careful here that you don't blast everybody with this type of email or send the wrong email and you misuse the list. So basically, if I were to hit OK here, it is going to send those emails out based on the Excel list. Now, at this point, I'm not going to do that because we get the idea, I hope. And what you can do at this stage, if you go back to the where you have the codes here, if something is not correct, you can always go back and correct it into the Excel file and then rerun it again. Now, what you can do as well is that you can save this file Notice with the codes here, and if I save it, I'll give the name here on, and then if I'm to go back here after two weeks or two months or whatever, and I come back to Word again, and then go to open it, here's my sample email. Notice it's going to come up and ask me, do you want to link to the customer's file in Excel? Of course, I want to say yes. And then from this point on, we can go here under the steps and then choose just next, next, basically. And here they are. And basically just complete the merge and do the electronic mail again. So basically you don't have to redesign the form all the time. It works exactly the same. You can save the form both in regular mail merges, in label mail merges, and email mail merges and reuse the same form multiple times and you just keep the excel file up to date In this brief session, I'm going to explain the process on how to create labels. The process is actually simpler than one thinks, or they are used to probably tinkering with it. But basically, all you have to have is Microsoft Word, and then the best is to use an Excel file. The Excel file could be a list of names. On the first row can be different labels, for example, the customer number, the company, the first name, last name, telephone, state address, city, zip, and so on. You could have here any other new fields as well. 
So this list, as you can see, you can create it by either extracting it from an existing system or you can simply type those addresses and keep those in a list somehow, somewhere by simply typing them one after the other. So then the next step here is, I'm going to close this, you don't need the Excel file open when you do this, and we need to go to Microsoft Word. Under Word, we need to click on Mailings tab here. So we click on actually a Mail Merge option here, and then we go under Step-by-Step -step Wizard. I usually recommend the Step-by-Step -step Wizard because it takes you step by step as it says in order to generate those labels. So we click here and then we tell the system that we are going to create labels. Then click on next to start the document. Then the next here is telling us that we are going to use the current document layout or you can use an existing document if you want but in this case it's going to be labels just populated with the basic names and addresses if you wanted something where it says labels for with other information then you can simply type it here on the left hand side then the next option here is to choose label options we need to tell the system what kind of labels are we using for this mail merge then here under label vendors unless you have microsoft so you need to change it to something else and usually the most common one is the Avery US letter. Under Avery US letter, notice there are a lot of different ones. And usually when you go to the store and buy those, you'll have the number directly on the label. So it will tell you on the box of labels as to which number it is, which product number. So one of the common ones that we use is the Avery 5160 which tells me it's one inch in height and then 2.63 inches. So we click OK here. The next step here in the bottom, notice it says go to the select the recipients. So we click on select recipients and then you can use an existing list. You can use the contacts from Outlook or you can type a new list if you want it as well. But like I said earlier, it's easier to just type the list first in Excel and then you just utilize that list. So we go here under use an existing list and then we go and find it and locate it. Click on browse and then we are going to go here under week three and this is the customer list for mail merge. Now in here there are two tabs or two sheets in this spreadsheet. Now, when I had this earlier, it was the first one. So basically, I'm not going to open it again, but it's going to be one of the first ones. Usually when you open Excel, it's going to have two to three tabs that it starts with. So we'll pick the first one, and these are all the names. You could filter those names if you wanted, but for now, we're going to leave everything alone for the sake of simplicity. Then we are going to go and here on the first one we're going to click on insert merge field so we go here to the first label and then we click on merge insert merge field and we say insert first name a space insert last name hit enter then insert street address hit enter again and then we are going to insert the city comma state and then the zip now here is where pretty much everybody has problems because the labels don't generate don't populate through all the fields so the next thing what you need to do here is we click on arrange labels and then the next thing what you have to do here is click on update all labels so before you go and preview them you want to update the same information that you see here to all of the labels all over in that same sheet. So the computer will do this automatically for you. And this is just for the labels. You click on update all labels. And notice it's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Then we click on preview your labels. And notice the information is posted. If for some reason we want to change something here, we could go back to the previous step, 
where the code stuff is, highlight it and say the first and last name. We want to make it bold. Click on bold there. If you want to put the word two, we could do that right in front of it. But then remember to update all labels again, and that will populate all the labels. Then preview your labels and then complete the merge. You can preview them, how it's going to look page by page by page. But basically the last step, what you want to do is complete the mail merge. You complete it, you could print it, or you can click on edit individual labels. If we click on edit individual labels, click on OK. This is the final product. So the final product here, basically, it's the whole merged results. This you shouldn't have to tinker with it. If something is not correct, it is recommended that you go back to your Excel file. I'm not going to save the results here. You go to your Excel file, you change whatever you need to change, and then you come here to the previous step, which by the way, you can save this form and you can save it particularly with the codes at this stage. And anytime you run it in the future, it will actually pull from the same list of addresses and list of information. You just have to keep the same file, the data file and the form. This is referred to as the form file in the same folder. It's basically the same folder or linked it the same structure that it was to start with. And then once you change something, you just go back to preview the labels and complete the merge all over again. In this brief session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use the compare feature between documents, between two documents. So let's say this is one of my documents here. I'm going to save it. And I want to compare this with another version of another document. So what you do is you click on, we are on the home tab at this point. We want to go under the review tab and then we click on compare. We want to compare two versions of a document. So we're going to put the original document here on the left. Here it is. This one is the original and the revised version is the modified version two. I'm going to check it for all of these properties, whether tabs were added, tables, fields, anything. And then I click OK. At this point, this is a combined view showing the changes between one and the other. So notice the word more effectively here. It was deleted. And if we keep on scrolling down, display, the word display was deleted as well. The word editing was deleted and so on. So I just changed a couple of the words in this case. The other thing that you can do is you can go here under compare and then under show source documents, you can click on show both of them. We'll be able to see them side by side as to what was changed in each one of them. So here's the original over here and that's the revised version of it. Notice the word more communicate one has more effectively the other one doesn't and so on so that's how you can use the compare feature between the two documents and then down here is basically a summary of what changed specifically for both documents and what where the revisions were it works it's not ideal and perfect but it's somewhat effective Macros are a great tool 
while you are working in a document, particularly when you have to perform various repetitive tasks. So instead of you doing one thing over and over and over again with all the different steps, what you can do is you can record all of those steps in a macro and then you simply execute that macro. So here is how it works. To get to the macros, well, all that we have to do is we go under the View tab in Word and then we go under the Macros option here. Then we click on Record Macro. In this case, I'm going to record bringing up labels, for example, label Avery 5160. So instead of you having to do all of those steps time after time, you simply execute the macro. So we click here on Record Macro and then we'll give it a name. Now, it says that assign macro to, you can assign the macro to a specific button, which would be an icon here uh, somewhere in the quick access toolbar or somewhere. So you can assign to this macro a button or a keyboard shortcut. So in this case, I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna assign a button. And then notice it says new macro, macro one. You can change the name if you'd like. And then I'm going to add this. Notice it's gonna be on the quick access toolbar but I'm going to add this also to the right hand side here. So I want to customize my quick access toolbar. So I want to click on add and then I'm going to click OK. All that is going to do is it put this icon over here. Now notice that at this point the next to the mouse there's this little cassette tape. That means that every step or every click that I perform from this point on until I stop it, all of those steps are going to be recorded. So now to insert a label, usually you'd go under mailings and then you'll go under labels. Once you go under labels, we need to go here under options. And then we'll pick the specific type of label that we want. We said earlier that we wanted Avery 5160. So we go here under label vendors and we will want to change this to Avery. So we choose Avery US letter. And then the number here, it actually depends on the box of labels that you purchase from the store. So we want here 5160, for example. And there it is. So we click OK. And then here we click on New Document. Now notice it brought and it uh, designed this document to be that type of label. So this is where we want our macro to stop. So at this point, all we have to do is we click here under view, we go back to macros, and we choose stop recording. So now the macro has been recorded and uh, all the steps have been uh, recorded. Notice we have an icon here on the very top. So let's assume now uh, another day came by and we want to create labels. So we go here under new, we choose document and all of a sudden we have a need for those labels for Avery 5160 when we don't have to go and search for the label search for the vendor and all that type of stuff so all we have to do at this point is we click on this icon here for the macro and notice the label definition has been applied so it's the same step for anything else that you do in a repetitious way in within Word, all of those steps, you can record them exactly the same way. You can use macros to open a file from a specific location, or you can um, have it to create labels or put headers, footers, or whatever else that you do within Microsoft Word. <music>
So notice here there is an option for insert new equation. By the way, there are also other ones that you can download from office.com and just customize them as you want them. Now here, if I want to insert a new equation and I'm going to do a very simple one here, click on a new insert new equation and then simply start typing. So two, and then notice you have these tools here on the very top. This is for basic math. So now I'm going to use the asterisk here for the multiplication and then type whatever your formula is going to be. Then hit enter and there is your equation. Now another cool tool that you can use, you can go here under insert and then choose equation and then you can actually take this ink equation where you can actually draw with a mouse on the screen or if you have a touch screen you can use your finger here and you can basically write your formula just like that. And then if you're happy with it, so notice how it's going to convert it here, you click on insert and there is your new equation. So we covered how to insert one of the templates that uh, Office has to create one from scratch and also to convert one from writing with a mouse or uh, with your finger on the screen and converting into a formula. My name is Sally Caselli. The following is a comprehensive tutorial on using Microsoft Excel 2019, which is based on Office 365. We will start with the very basics, and then we will go into intermediate and advanced features of Excel. This tutorial is designed for business professionals who are looking to advance in their career by sharpening their Microsoft Office skills and is great for students to learn Excel. Please also note that if you would like to follow along, the accompanying working files are located in the video description. I have designed this tutorial to be concepts-based, which means that most of the features covered here apply to previous versions and even later versions of newer versions of Excel. So let's get started. This assumes that we are using the installed or the desktop version of Microsoft Excel in your computer. So we're going to go here under Start, and then we are going to look for Microsoft Excel. So we'll just type here Excel, and then hit Enter. Let's just uh, get acquainted a little bit with the application interface so that we know what is where. As soon as we open the application, on the very top we have the option to create a blank workbook or an Excel spreadsheet. We have some quick guides here from Microsoft. And then further down here we have a bunch of templates that Microsoft has included in this version of Excel. There are various categories that you can pick on the left hand side under the Home tab. This includes any of the recent spreadsheets that you have been working on. Here under uh, Pinned, this will show the files that you have pinned that you want always to show up in this list. And then under Shared with me, in this case, you'd need to be signed in to Office Online. And this is where the documents that have been shared with you are going to be available. On the left-hand side here, we have the option to create new documents. So the new documents would be whether it's a blank worksheet or use one of those templates from here. Keep in mind that you can search for new templates on the very top and also use the categories over here. Under Open, this is the option where you can choose to open an existing file in your computer. Now notice that you have a whole bunch of other options here, but the easiest, the best would be to just simply choose this PC and then navigate under this PC, the various files and directories, wherever you have your files. Further down here, you also have the account that has been associated with Microsoft, basically your Microsoft 365 account. Then under options, this is where you can customize the various options 
related to this application, whether it's the general options or formulas or data and uh, how to save and how often to save your documents and things of that nature. And now it's important to understand as well that those options are going to be under file here on the home tab as well. And then if you scroll down, uh, you will see them in the very bottom of the screen. Now let's go back home here. And let's suppose that we wanted to create a new document and also at the same time keep on looking again at the interface of this application to get an understanding as to how this application works. So if we click here on the blank document, which I just did, notice that in the very top here you have these tabs. So you have the home tab with all of these sets of icons here. And uh, those are kind of called groupings of icons. So Microsoft has tried to group things of or functions or similar functions together. For example, for the alignment of the content, it would be under the alignment grouping on the home tab. Then you have the insert tab here, and that has new sets of uh, groupings and icons and functions here as well. Then under draw, you have additional options and then page layout, another tab and formulas. And this is where the beauty of Excel is or the major functionality of Excel is under the formulas area. Then you have the data tab, view, uh, view and help as well. Keep in mind uh, that uh, on the top right here, you also have the tell me feature in Microsoft Excel, where you can simply without you, if you don't know how to or where a particular function is, for example, a footer, you can simply type it in here and then click on that option and it will take you directly to that particular function. So you technically don't really need to know where something is as long as you know what you're looking for. Then further down here, you have these uh, sheet one. So notice each um, Excel file starts with one sheet and you can add as many sheets as you want to it by using this button here on the bottom right. Notice now we have sheet two, sheet three and such. Think of those just as uh, pages on a notebook. On the bottom right hand side, you have some options here for the layout. So this is the normal layout of this document or of this uh, spreadsheet in this case. You also have the page layout. If you prefer to look at that, that's how the document or the spreadsheet would print out. You also have the page break. So this is if we are using page breaks in this document. Notice you can zoom in and out here by pressing this plus and minus sign here in the very bottom. Now, a couple of things um, before we get into the actual uh, to using the application and some of the functions in the application here. So you'll notice that you have all of these blocks here or cells and then you have these numbers here on the left. And obviously I'm going on with the very basics of using Excel. So we're just starting as basic as it can be in this case. So you have these rows here and you have these columns and then you also have these these little blocks. So those are referred to as the cells, those horizontally, those would be your rows and then these would be your columns. And then each one of those blocks has a reference to it or an address for it. So, for example, if we were to type something in here, let 10 in there, let's add a value of 10, this cell We'd reference it by using the column and the row number. So it would be B3. The reference for this or the address for this would be B3. Now, the nice thing in Excel is, is that when you do calculations, and that's the whole point of using Excel, you usually use those references or those addresses. So we don't say here, for example, if we wanted to get the total here, and we'll get into these in a little bit in more details as to what I'm doing here next as far as the sum and such. But let's say if we wanted to add those two numbers, yes, you could say 10 plus 5 and then the computer will give you the total. But you typically use in there sum of B3 colon B4. And for now, just focus on the reference for it. So now notice the total is 15 once I hit enter. The nice thing about using references is, is that if I change one of those values, let's say to 10 here, 
Now notice the total will be updated automatically. So the key here to remember is that in Excel, you have those rows and the columns and the cells. Each cell has a reference to it, and it's best to use the reference for that specific cell, which then contains the value. Now, the spreadsheets are, of course, used for calculations, for budgets, uh, anything financial related. The spreadsheets are very powerful and can be very useful in a business environment, whether you're a professional, that you want to advance in your career and get the right skills for the job and such, or the jobs and the employment opportunities, but also as a student. Now, those sheets, we started with one sheet here, but as I mentioned earlier, you can add as many sheets as you want by simply tapping on the Add icon here. Now, those sheets also can be renamed. So if you right click on this and choose rename, you can call this week one or month one or whatever you want to reference it or the year. It's also uh, important to understand that you can perform calculations between sheets and we'll learn about this. And then finally, as far as the interface here and some of the generic components or general components of Excel, notice that you also have this formula bar here or this area where you enter the formulas. And uh, the formulas, uh, we'll learn about them in a little bit, are basically what perform the calculations in Excel. So stay tuned for the next session here, where we are going to learn about doing some of the basic functions and calculations using in Excel, now that you have some of the foundations on a spreadsheet, and also you have the foundations on the layout and the components of Excel. And as we finish here, just uh, for terminology, you'll hear the term spreadsheet and worksheet. Typically, those will be the worksheets here. So you have each sheet here. The spreadsheet is the whole file here with all of these worksheets. Like I said, stay tuned for the next session where we'll get to study and learn about basic functions related to Microsoft Excel. session I'm going to go over some of the basic functions in Microsoft Excel 2019 which is part of Office 365. Remember those functions are not tied only to Excel 2019. They are useful also for previous versions or and also later versions of Excel. If you'd like to follow along you might need to download this accompanying file that has a whole bunch of those tabs here and basically all the various components that we'll go through in this tutorial. So now that we opened Excel, we understand the various interface components of Microsoft Excel 2019. Now we'll go under the Basic Concepts tab here in the bottom and perform some specific and basic uh, functions. Let's say we wanted to calculate the office expenses. We have all of these cells. In each one of those cells, you can type text numbers and values and such. It can be a general number, it can be a specific number, currency, accounting type of format numbers, dates, percentages. You can format these cells or the values in the cells in percentages, fractions, and scientific notations and text. So here we basically want to calculate the expenses for our office. Supposedly we have office supplies, computer expenses, photocopying, printing, travel expenses, service contacts. Now for each month we have recorded the amounts and then we want to get the total for the training for each category. Also we want to get the totals for each month down here. First we want to format these currency. We simply select those specific cells, go up here under the number grouping and then click on the drop down and we choose currency. Currency is going to put that dollar sign in front of it and the two decimal points. You can do it from here or 
you can click on this dollar amount in here. If you're using various other currencies, you can pick those in here. Now, let's say that we wanted to get the totals for trainings. All of those calculations are performed by using formulas. To perform any calculations in Excel, start with an equal sign followed by some kind of function. Now, the function itself can be any of those in here. So if we click on the formulas, click on function, the functions can be financial functions, any of those that you see right here, logical functions, uh, lookup and reference, math and trigonometry. So if we wanted to look at the whole list of them here under all, notice that there are hundreds of functions that you can utilize in Excel. Now for the purpose of this tutorial, we are just going to learn about some of those functions so that you get the concepts. And then once you know how this stuff works, then you can go and explore this even furthermore on your own. So for example, here, I, I clicked here under formulas and I chose insert function in case you wanted to find what sum does. Typing in there, click the go here. Notice it says it adds numbers in a range of cells. So if we go back here to get the sum of those numbers, like I mentioned earlier, you need to start with the equal sign, the word sum, and then you can open parentheses. And then here you can reference the actual starting point, which would be B6. Notice you have uh, column B and then the row is number six. So you type in there B6. This is the manual way that we are learning to do this at this point. And then colon. This means anything from that starting point to, let's say, D, to where it says here for March training, which would be D6. And then close parentheses and hit enter. So that's one way to do this. So notice now the calculation, it's 700. If January's training expenses were 250, notice the total will change automatically. And that's the beauty of Excel. That's why you use formulas and calculations and you use this tool. So that's one way to enter the formula in here. Let's do this another uh, manual way here. So here we say sum and you can press tab and it will put the capital letters and also the parentheses thing. Then you can either tap in here the starting points and notice it's 300 and it puts B7 automatically, so you don't have to gauge it where it uh, goes horizontally and vertically, where they meet. And also you can put their colon and then the end point, or you can simply select the cells that you want to add up. And notice it will put the colon in there automatically. And then all you have to do is you hit enter. So again, before I hit enter, to summarize it, you press the equal sign telling the computer that you're going to calculate something in there to start a formula. Then you put the function, which is in this case, it's the sum, adding those numbers. And then we simply selected what the range that we want it to select. Then hit enter. And notice the amount here has been calculated. In most cases in business, most individuals also use this function here, the automatic calculation. So let's suppose that I didn't have either one of those and I want a calculation in here. Notice that under the home tab and then under auto sum, it automatically will add up a bunch of uh, cells and the values in them. You click on it and the computer is going to select those items automatically. You hit enter here and it gives you the calculation. Now, what about if I wanted to do the calculation over here? Notice it's going to try to do the selection as well. Now, you, of course, you could adjust that selection before hitting enter, and that's another way of doing it. Now, I showed you the manual way before because that's going to be more accurate, and it also gives and reinforces the concept as to how this works. So now, if we wanted to get the totals for January here, we could do it either way. We could either use the automatic calculation here on the top right on the Home tab, or we could do it the manual way and select the range and then hit enter. Next here, how can we populate the same formulas here that we entered in this cell for these other ones without having to do it manually for each one of them? Instead of us spending time to enter the formulas here in each cell, 
we can simply replicate what's entered in this cell, which by the way, here's what's entered in that cell behind the scenes. This is the formula bar here on the top. Now to replicate it, notice there is a little dot here on the bottom right. All you have to do is you hold the mouse on that dot on the bottom right and then drag far down you want to go. And notice the computer is going to calculate everything for the subsequent rows. Whenever you do this, try to double check the work. And the way you do that is that you click on any of these calculations then you come here under the formula bar and then see what's being calculated. So it's getting us a sum of B12 all the way through D12, which is B12, that's the 13 here, and then all the way to D12. So spot check that work before you submit something that you'll later regret that it was not calculated correctly. If we wanted to do the calculation here as well uh, for the totals for, for each month, you can do it the same way. So you can go to the bottom under this dot and then drag the mouse to the right. This works vertically top down and horizontally from left going to the right. Notice we got a bunch of these number signs in here. And this is a very common thing that that means that the column is not wide enough. And all you have to do is either drag this to the right a little bit manually like that, or by double clicking between the columns here, C and D and the computer, it's going to adjust it exactly to the widest value in any of the cells. And we do that for the next one as well. The autofill feature works for anything sequential. It can also work for days of the week or a specific uh, sequence of numbers that you have. So for example, if we have here Monday and then we want to replicate the other days of the week, you can simply drag this down and you have all the other days of the week. If you wanted to do it for a month of the year, just type the name of the month, drag it down, and it will replicate the months and keep on going. It can also work for sequences of numbers. Now you can drag this down by selecting those two values and notice it'll do 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. Let's say we wanted to learn about formatting and making this look slightly nicer. You can select any of those cells and then notice you have these styles. It's very similar to the styles and formatting styles in Microsoft Word. We can either click on the drop down and pick any of those designs and notice uh, it's giving us what's called a live preview. So you can do this for all the cells in here. The other thing that you can do is you can simply select here the whole table and you can choose format as a table and then you can pick one of those designs and click OK here and now notice applied that specific design in there instead of us doing it manually and I just undid it for now. The other thing to keep in mind is conditional formatting. Conditional formatting is a tool that you can utilize to easily spot trends and patterns in your data using bars, colors, icons to visually highlight important ones. So in this case, we just want to pinpoint which ones were the highest expenses in our data set here. So we go here under conditional formatting and you have all of these different rules. So you can choose to show anything greater than a specific value, anything less than, anything that equals, or duplicate values to highlight them and things of that nature. Also the top 10 and the bottom 10%. So if you had, if you wanted to identify the top 10 items, top 10 sales and such, all you have to do is you just pick any of those. You can do data bars. So basically it will give you a little chart similar to that. Or you can do color coded and you can create your own rule as well and your own criteria. So for now, I'm just simply going to use the color coding. And uh, this basically puts a little chart within each cell to give us the uh, definition of uh, the items with a higher value in them. So if we change this to 5,000, notice everything else will be readjusted. Now we can do it for the total conditional formatting. And let's say we want color coded for a range of cells. In 
this video, we're going to learn how to use some additional basic functions in Excel. So we want to find the highest value of a data set. Let's say we have these expenses for January and we want to post the highest value of all the numbers in that column. So to do that, you can either go here under the home tab, under auto sum in the drop down, you choose max and notice it's going to select a bunch of the cells. Now, in this case, we don't really want the total here. So all we have to do is we select the values that we want to be included in that selection and simply hit enter. That's one way of doing it. I'm going to delete it. The other way to do this is by simply start with the equal sign and then we want to find the max and then press tab and then just simply select the references, the numbers that you want to include in your calculation, and then hit enter. Notice the highest number is 5,000. If we change this to 12,000, we're going to readjust the column. Notice that it's posting here that that's the highest number. Now you can repeat this in the other columns here as well for the other months, or you can use, as we learned in the previous module, you can replicate this formula that is in this cell by using the autofill feature. So we hold down the mouse on the bottom right, drag it to the right here, and it will give us the actual values. Now you'd say, well, how do I calculate the minimum, the lowest number among all of those numbers? You can either go under the Home tab here and then choose this common functions minimum, or you can simply type in here equal sign, min. So formula start always with equal sign. Then there is the function in this case is the minimum tab and then put in the range. So there are three components to each formula. Hit enter. Notice the lowest number here is 13. If we wanted to find the same thing for the other months, simply drag this to the right and you'll have this posted with the numbers. Now let's say this was one dollar. Notice that has been updated here in the bottom. Again, try to get the concept of how this works. Even if uh, you're trying to figure out some more advanced function, you can look it up. You can use a tell me feature up here for that particular function. You can search the web and such but the concept is going to be very much the same. You're going to look through a set of data within the ranges of the data, performing a specific function relating that data. So in this case, we want to get the average. We don't know what the average function is in Excel. We can simply start by typing equal, start typing whatever it is that you're trying to do. In this case, we want the average. Notice it gives us an explanation as well next to it. Double click or simply press tab and select the range of data. Hit enter and this is the average for all of these values. Now, if I wanted to count how many items do I have in here? So if you look here on the top right under the home tab, you have count numbers. Go right here, click on insert and then count numbers. Notice it does count and then select your data. Notice there are nine. If we go to the right, notice in this case, there are only eight. And the reason for that is because there's no value in C14. This should give you a very basic overview of using Excel, just the uh, basic functions. That's how what functions you typically use to calculate taxes or calculate budgets and things of that nature. You might use multiplication and division, which we'll cover it in just a moment here. You could use this in business, for example, to calculate the expenses for various uh, sales of cars and such. So in this case, we simply do the equal sign there, sum, the range, and then replicate it for all the other ones and such, and then find the average as well in a similar way.
this session, we are going to perform additional functions using Excel. This will come in handy in uh, financial or budget calculations. So let's say we have here the monthly pay for each individual or employee, and then we have the various deductions. Now we want to find the total deductions for that particular employee, their net pay, what's left over after paying for the deductions, the annual net pay. So we want to learn how to multiply it and what their net pay would be annually and then weekly pay. So to get the totals, we're going to use a concept that we already learned from the previous sessions. We're simply going to get the sum of those two values, deduction one and deduction two. So we do that by using equal sign, sum, press tab to auto fill that part of it there, and then those two references. So C6 all the way through D6, then hit enter. Now we can replicate that by using the autofill feature that we learned earlier. Next, we want to calculate the net pay. So the net pay would be the gross pay minus the deductions. That would give us the net pay. So in this case, you're learning how to subtract two values. So in this case, we can do that without using a function. And we can simply put the initial amount. So this would be B6 minus the total deductions, E6, and then simply hit enter. Now those numbers mean that uh, the values didn't fit in that cell and we simply need to resize the column here. So it, it was like that. We can double click here between the columns, which I covered also in the previous section. So the net pay for this individual, which was basically taking their gross pay minus deductions, and then we got the net pay. We can use the autofill and we have the totals in here. You could do it by having that 12 month value as part of the formula. So to do it as part of the formula, you simply enter the equal sign. Then you take the net pay, just click on it, F6 times, which is the asterisk, and then 12. Hit enter. That would be the annual pay. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it would be to use a reference point. So we have the equal sign, the net pay here, F7, times, and our reference point will be 12. In this case, this 12 on the top. Hit enter. The advantage of this method is, is that, okay, let's see how much this employee would be paid in two years. So you simply change that value to 24, you hit enter, and notice that will be their two-year salary. Or let's say for six months, you simply enter and change the value. So that would be a good use if you're doing projections. If we use the autofill here with a reference point, there will be an issue. And I'm not going to go into that at this point because I'll cover it in the data types in just a little bit. Uh, but that has to do with using absolute references so for now, we're just going to use it embedded into the formula. Now, supposedly, we wanted to get the weekly pay. There are 52 weeks in a year. We know that the net pay per month is $3,400. Per year, it's $41,000. But now, per week, there are 52 weeks in a year. The equal sign here, the annual net pay divided, which is a slash, by 52. And there is your weekly pay or this individual's weekly pay. So, so far, we learned about uh, using uh, the sum to add the deductions. We use the subtraction to take off the deductions from the pay. And then we also focus on multiplication and also division. And then earlier we learned about a few additional functions that are still on the basic nature of using Excel. In this session, we're going to learn about using the quick analysis tool. Let's suppose we have a bunch of data very similar to this, and we want to find out and utilize some quick analysis tool. All you have to do is select the data, 
click here on the very bottom right under Quick Analysis. This will show you live previews with the data. So, for example, conditional formatting, it's going to format the data within the cells and using bars. So, notice it uses to highlight interesting data. You can do it color coded or icons, whether the values went up or down and such, or greater than a certain amount, or specific text. You can create charts based on this data. Cluster chart, so it would look like this. Also, you have the tab here for the totals. Basically, the system is going to add another row. It's going to give you the sum or the average or the count of them or the percent total or the running total here and sums as well. Notice it added another column on the right hand side. You can also create additional tables. For example, you, if you want to create a quick pivot table from here and then spark lines. These are some types of charts to display the data. So supposedly we wanted the data charts. There it is. We just simply select it and then apply the values. If we wanted to create a specific chart, click on it and notice we have the values right here. Let's say that we are going to create a pivot table. Notice it will create a new worksheet here in the bottom. You can unselect certain items from our table and it will keep on giving us the various values. Or here on the right hand side, you can customize whether you want to show specific sales, whether you want to display the company, and whether you want to apply filters, and then you want to sort it by various values or industries and such. So if we go here under filters, now under the industry, we can choose to display only those specific companies within that selection. You can customize this even further by adding more than one criteria. So this has to do more with pivot tables and working with pivot tables and such. But the idea is, is that uh, you can go here to quick analysis and create whether it's charts and such or trends within your data by having the computer analyze it quickly for you. It's a very similar idea with the charts. In the charts, it will create again a new worksheet and it will work in conjunction with the pivot tables. Notice over the chart, as we change the criteria, it will update the chart automatically. So let's say we don't want medical listed, then it will update the chart in an automated way. So that is uh, quick tools. The idea here is to select the data, go under quick analysis tools and explore these features. In this session, we're going to learn about the types of references in Microsoft Excel. If you go back to the previous sessions on learning Excel, we have been using what's called the relative references. If we were to look back here under the basic concepts when we calculated these values and I entered the amounts, notice that the reference here is B6 through D6, but then when I used the autofill feature to get those formulas populated, notice that it went to B7 to D7, and then the next one it went to B8 through D8 and such. So anything sequential, it did it automatically. And those are what's referred to as a relative references. Now in Excel, there are also absolute references and mixed references. Let's reference in here B8. So we do equal sign B8, enter, and that just says $4,000. But it's posting in here whatever is on B8. Now that currently is a relative reference. If I go down, notice it replicates what's here on the left hand side. It went from B8, so it started with B9 and such. If I were to change this to an absolute reference, which is by pressing the F4 key on the keyboard, notice it puts these dollar signs. It's locking it to this specific cell, to both the B column, and it's locking it also on the 
eighth row. Now, if I have that as an absolute reference and drag this down, notice it will always give me what's on B8. Basically, it will keep staying at 4,000. And that's because we are using absolute references. There are also what's called mixed references. So mixed references are those that have only one dollar sign. So we are locking it either by the column or we are locking it by the row. Let's say we want the dollar sign to be locked on column B. Either take away this dollar sign in front of eight, of the row eight, either by erasing it on the keyboard or by pressing the F4 key until the right mode is selected here. So we have B8 there. Hit enter. Now notice the values are going to change. That's because we are not going to column C at this point. We are just going down. So we basically it's still on column B. By the way, here's how you insert a new column. Right click, choose insert. So now let's say that I wanted to go from left to right. Notice I have it locked on column B. If I go left to right, remember it's going to keep on posting the 4000 value. That's because we have it locked on column B. If we did not have it locked on column B, it will give us a blank cell here because there's nothing on C or D. So Anytime you want to lock a reference by a specific row or column, that's when you use a mixed reference. Anytime that you want to lock it by a specific reference point, that's when you use the absolute type of reference. Let's do an actual example here. So let's say we had a $20,000 budget for this year for our department. There is going to be a decrease by 5%. We have all of these categories, and we want to first find out what the difference is for the 5% decrease, and then we want to determine what the new budget is. So in this case, put in here equal sign, and then we'll take the 4,000, which is our current budget, and multiply by 5%, then hit enter. And notice we have to give up $200. You could keep on doing this manually for the other cells in here and it would be just fine. It would work just fine. So if we go here and then B9 times the percentage, hit enter, notice it works just fine. However, let's suppose we have 2000 rows here. That would take forever to do. So if we are dragging this down and using the autofill feature, now notice, first it came up with this number signs, which means just we need to widen the column here. But notice that we had computer expenses by $8,000 to start with, but now the difference is $32 million. And if you look at the, the formula, it's basically multiplying 4,000 by 8,000. If we look over here, it started with B8 and B6, this times that. It went to the next one, 100 times zero, so it moved one for each of them down from 5% to the next row down. Then when it got to the 32 million one, it ended up multiplying 8,000 times 4,000 because the reference kept on shifting downwards. So to lock down that reference for this B6, the decrease, the percentage item, and that can be any number, it doesn't have to be percent, it can be number of students or number of enrolled individuals in a project or whatever. You want to make B6 an absolute reference. Stay locked down to that point of reference. To do that, as I mentioned earlier, you use the F4 function key on the keyboard and that notice it puts a two dollars or you can enter those dollar signs manually by simply typing them in front of each uh, reference. Hit enter. Now notice it's still going to be a $200 difference, but when we drag this thing down, it's going to give us the proper calculations because each one of them, it's locked. Of course, you can do additional calculations here. You could say, okay, give me the totals. Okay, and you can format that here on the right-hand side if necessary and such. Of course, those are things that you're going to explore on your own. And then find the totals. Press tab there. 
after I typed sum and then hit enter, notice we have to give up a thousand dollars. Let's say that you're the manager and you say, what about if we decrease the budget expenditures by 6%, how much will we save? So you just type six in here, hit enter, notice you'd be saving $1,200. The idea here is, is that by using absolute references, you can use it to make projections. The new budget, you can calculate that very easily by simply equal sign the original amount minus the difference, hit enter, and those would be your new numbers. <music>
and then you choose to clear the filter from product. That means that all the products in this case are going to be displayed. However, the other filters are still in place and applied. Notice we don't have all the data back yet. You can go ahead and uh, clear the filter for all the other ones as well. One of the nice things is also if you right click or if you choose the drop down, whichever you want, under the number filters option, you can create a custom filter. So you can go in here and you, we are looking here at sales. You choose the drop down and notice we are choosing the option for equals, but you can uh, say does not equal or is greater than or equal to or is less than. So let's say we say greater than, let's say show us all the sales that are greater than a thousand dollars. And then you can have another criteria if you prefer and then click OK. So that means for the sales field, we're able to apply a specific criteria. Now, of course, you can go into any of those. Let's say uh, for the sales rep, you can create another text filter that uh, so the name begins with G, the name of the salesman. Click OK. Notice it's listing only those sales personnel G. So it's uh, fairly easy for both the data filtering and also the data sorting. charts in Excel. We have here a variety of data options in our worksheet and we want to create charts for them. So the concept of creating charts is uh, pretty simple. Basically the way it works is that you select the data and then you click on charts. Now the option to create the chart you can either use this option right here in the bottom under charts, the quick analysis tool that we saw from earlier, or the other option that serves as a better concept is by going here under the insert tab and then choosing recommended charts. Notice there are all kinds of other charts here as well, such as column charts, hierarchy, pie charts, and so on. The idea is uh, to use the right chart for the right type of data representation. Sometimes it's very easy to skew the data by representing it the wrong type of chart. So Typically, if you're dealing with percentages, you want to use a pie chart. If you're using with a, dealing with a long date range, which includes a lot of values and such, then you probably would use a line chart and so on. In Microsoft Excel here, there is also this option of recommended charts. So based on the data that you have selected, it's going to give you what um, Excel recommends in this case. So notice here I selected part of the column here in the first row as well and I click OK, and that's the chart for just this set of data, just toys, boomerangs, and in-store sales. If I want to tweak that chart even further, all I have to do is go and pick some other different designs from here on the top. I could also go and pick and change the colors to use a different color scheme. And uh, you can also change the layout if you prefer a different layout. Notice how it's putting the numbers in various areas here through the live preview. And you could add the different elements as well. Notice the contextual tools here on the top as well. Under the format, you could tweak the formatting, change additional properties for this chart, and also additional options to the right of this chart. Those are some of just the basic concepts on how you create the chart, how you kind of uh, tinker with it. Now, the next thing that I'll try to show you here is that in some cases, you might have in-store sales, website sales, and you have three sets of data. So how do you apply that in a chart? Well, it's the same concept. You select the range of data here, and you go under Insert, and then Recommended Charts as well. And then pick the recommended type of chart that might come in handy for you. You click OK, and here is the grouped chart for this set of data. Now, of course, you can drag this and move it elsewhere in your worksheet where you're working with and customize it even further. The other type of chart that you could create here, here's another example of sales, for example, across multiple years. So in this case, you want to select the data and then you go under insert and then recommended charts again. 
And notice the first recommended chart that Microsoft recommends here is a line chart because you're dealing with multiple years. You want to see the pattern within those years. So pick the one that you prefer and notice you have the chart right there. Now at this point, as we mentioned earlier as well, you can customize this with uh, various other designs to make it more visually appealing for your audience. Notice you can also switch the rows of the columns and you can change the data selection as well, including the uh, changing the type of chart. Notice under the quick layout, as we discussed earlier, you can include additional values and options within your chart. The next example here, it goes against a year or a complete item. So now uh, we can select this set of data and then go under insert, choose recommended charts. And then at this point, the first option that Microsoft is giving us is the column chart. Because notice if you chose the pie chart here, it will probably not work quite as well because everything is pretty much very closely together. So click on it and there is the column chart for this specific year. Uh, the next option is uh, multiple tests. This is very similar to what we used earlier in this one. And this type of chart, you can simply select it, the data, and then again insert the type of chart. Notice it's a column chart. In some cases, you might want a line chart so that you can see the interactions or interfacing of them accordingly. Now, in the cases where you want uh, to skip a specific area of data in your chart, what you can do, and this is kind of a neat little trick here, is uh, basically, let's say I want to create a chart only for test one and test three. And notice you have test two in the middle. What you can do is you hold down the control key while selecting the data range. And then at this point, you go in under insert and then insert some kind of chart that you may prefer here. So let's say I say line chart and I want to compare how one and three is doing. And that generates only the tests one and three, in this case, skipping test number two. So again, the key there was to hold down the control key while selecting the data range. So that's charts in a nutshell. Feel free to tinker with them. Of course, they can customize them even further and utilize them even more effectively. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate very briefly how to utilize a couple of the new types of charts. These charts are utilized to visualize hierarchical levels of data with ease here. So we have this data and what you need to do is you go under insert and then you go to these new types of charts. For example, the hierarchy chart is to compare parts to a whole or when several columns or categories hierarchy or when several columns or categories form a hierarchy here. So we have, for example, the major company here, then you have the sub companies and then the subdivisions as well. So what you do here is you click on it and notice you click on uh, the tree map and the tree map, as you can see the description right there, it highlights the specific companies and sub areas to them and gives us a visual representation based on the data. And notice at this point we can customize this however we want as well in new ways all automatically. So that was one of the types of charts. The other one is if we go back here to the chart type or we go back to insert chart again. The other one is the sunburst, which compares values across hierarchy levels, shows proportions within the levels as rings. So this is another pretty cool one as well. Additionally, there are a couple of new charts for financial analysis that you can utilize to visualize the profits and losses against across financial data. For example, let's assume that you have this financial income statement here and uh, we select the data and then we go under insert and then we go under the waterfall or stock chart. So we choose this one here, the stock chart and we'll make this slightly larger. And now notice that uh, the gross profit here is the total. So we go here under the profit, this one, right click on it and 
choose to set it as total. What that will do is it will bring it down to the bottom of the chart. Then we notice also we have operating income. That's another total. So we find operating income, right click, set it as a total. And then the net income, it's another total as well. Right click, set it as total. And this gives us a visual view of how everything is performing in our income statement. And this is a new type of chart starting in Office 2016 or Excel 2016. <music>
I go to wherever the value is, for example, this would be for training. Training, this is the total. I click on it. And then the third step is hit enter. I can repeat this process also for office supplies. Again, equal sign. Go to wherever the worksheet is. Choose office supplies here. Hit enter. It's just as easy as that. And you can repeat that process. Now what happens is, is that if I went here and on my office supplies, let's say they spent more than that, and now it came to $7.99 instead of $5.99. Uh, if I go back to my summary worksheet, notice that those totals are automatically updated. And that's the beauty of using this functionality. You can do this also another way by using named, what's called named references. So the way that works is that, for example, here under computer expenses, this total here, I want to name it. I want to give it a name so I can reference it in the future in other locations. And this comes in handy for large worksheets where you could say 2016 budget total. You could name that total and then you can call it from anywhere else in the worksheet. So here we could say computer uh, January computer expenses. So the, what you can do is you go here to where you have the formula or the total and the existing formula within that worksheet for January. And then you go under formulas here and you choose define name. You're just giving it a name. So you're saying this location with this formula, I'm going to call it something. So I click on name and then I call it January expenses. And notice it's, what it's doing is it's referencing this specific worksheet, a specific cell, and notice it's also using an absolute reference. So I click OK. So we name it something meaningful here. It has to start with a lower case and it can't have special characters and any of that type of stuff. And then we click OK. Now notice here on the top left, it's actually now for this reference, it's not going to be D7, even though you can reference it by whatever D. 33 here, but it's actually giving it a name. Now if we go here to cross sheet calculations and we want to post the computer expenses, we could even do it simpler than we did it for these other two options by using the name reference. So now at this point we are ready to use the name to reference that we uh, saved from earlier. Let's assume we want to go here and call the January expenses and what we can do is we can simply go under the formulas area and then we choose use in a formula and then call the January expenses from here and then just hit enter. The other option we could have done was we could have hit the equal sign and then just start typing and notice it will pop up as January expenses. Double click on it, hit enter and it will pull the value that you had from here. Now if we changed one of those as this total changes, notice that the total here will change as well. So this is a great way to call references across the worksheet or other worksheets within your workbook or spreadsheet and populate that data for a summary or for various calculations within your spreadsheet. And that was uh, using the two methods, uh, one of them manually by uh, pulling the values. The other one was by defining a name for those references. <music>
of sales increasing or decreased sales and calculate the percentage for example on the discount or on an increase toward a whole so let's go for the first example first here so we have uh, for example student one here they scored 87 percent or 87 points and the total number of points is uh, going to be against 100. So in this case, we want to represent what was the percentage that they got in this. Of course, we could do this without using an Excel formula, but uh, it's on purpose in this case. So we do equal here, and the way you do that is by uh, the first number. In this case, I'm going to do it manually here, uh, B7 divided by the possible points. So in this case, it will be C7. And then all you do is you hit enter. Now, one thing to remember as well here is that when you're doing the calculation, you need to also format this into a percentage value. So, and this I had done it earlier, so that's how you do it. Basically, just click on the percent item uh, formatting, select the range, and then choose the percent formatting or under here, percentage. So that's the first example. So that came to 87%. So this student scored 87%. Now, this is a little bit more complex. We want to calculate the return on investment percentage. So let's suppose that in the beginning of the year, we invested $1,000. Now, at the end of the year, we got $1,200. And we want to determine as to what percentage did we get at the end of the year. What was the return of an investment? Again, format this to be percentages and then you put in the formula in this case we're going to do equal sign basically the way we calculate this if you remember your math and such we do the end of the year minus the beginning of the year divided by what we invested initially at the beginning of the year and we have to put that in parentheses so basically it would be c16 minus B16, or you can click on those as well if you wanted to, divided by the initial investment, which would be B16. And then we hit enter. Notice the return of an investment on the first one was 20%. And then if we wanted to calculate the next one, you could do it manually or you can do it using the autofill or you can just let Excel 2016 do it for you like it did a moment ago. So if I, another way to do this would be open parentheses, initial uh, end of the year investment minus initial investment. And notice it's taking those labels from here, from my table here. That's why I did it manually the first example. Then divide it by the initial investment. Hit enter it's 25 percent and you could repeat this so in this case they lost 20 percent of the investment so that's how you do the return of investment at the end of the year that's example number two for calculating percentages now in the third example we want to calculate uh, for example we have uh, these employees and this is uh, their annual salary that they had and now we want to give them a bonus or we want to increase their salary and for example for the first employee we want to give twelve hundred dollars in addition to what they currently had so now we want to calculate what was the percentage of increase that they got this year the way to do that uh, calculation would be very similar to the first example you just uh, do the equal sign and then the bonus divided by the salary and then hit enter so they are getting 12%. Uh, the first employee is getting 12%, and the other ones are getting uh, accordingly as we see here. So that would be the percent plus or minus here. The other thing to keep in mind as well, as you are working with these percentages, and besides formatting them in percentages, you might want to have the decimal points to at least two. So we want to increase this by two area so so format all of this by increasing the decimal points for all the cells so now this is more accurate for for example employee 2 got 5.95 
percent increase in their salary if you had to figure out as well for example you are increasing the salary of employees by 15 percent or 12 percent or whatever uh, here's how you can uh, do it as well so basically so this would be increase and we're going to put the number statically at this point but we're going to do the equal sign here the value times and then the percentage point so the percentage point in this case it is going to be 0.7 percent so that would be 0 0.7 would be the calculation now if we want to increase everybody's salary by seven percent this is what it would be for each one of them now if we wanted to to know how much is their total salary going to be we could go back and modify our formula to be uh, the salary times 1.07 because we just want to see what it went above what they are earning earlier so hit enter there and notice now the new salary at seven percent increase it's going to be 10,700 here and so on so the idea that I wanted to demonstrate here was how to calculate it by a specific percentage so you can see just the increase and this would be by adding the one in front of it that would be what would be the new total for that employee so that you can kind of save another column to add numbers and all that stuff but you're doing it all in one cell for this calculation so hopefully that is helpful there these were three different scenarios on calculating percentages in Excel and it should cover pretty much most of the uh, scenarios out there for you. this next session we are going to learn about using logical functions as part of a formula in Excel we're going to learn about three different ways of how to utilize the if statement within a formula the first way will be that if the employees here reach $20,000 in sales then for those that reach 20 or more then they can get $250 bonus and then in this case we are going to say yes that is true for George and Michael and Darius and so on then the next uh, set here in the next column we're going to display yes or no we're going to represent it with a yes or no the words yes or no and then on the third column we're going to actually post the amount that they get as additional this is how it works so basically you have the sales that they accomplished as part of the worksheet then you have the criteria that you're determining this is the criteria it could be twenty thousand dollars it could be a hundred thousand dollars and then here you're saying this is how much they will get if they pass that criteria to use the if statement we can do it by going here under formula tab and then we click on insert function you can also click here under logical and use the if function as well but we'll use the longer way to start here so we go here under the if function and then you could just type if now in our case it's actually showing up automatically here so if it was not then it's going to bring it up now if it says it checks whether a condition is met and it returns one value if it's true and another value if it's false so that's what we want to do here we're going to say post the words true or false so we click on it and now it says what is the logical test the logical test so we have to say if the sales if these guys here for John if the sales that's if B6 is greater than or equal to the criteria then if that is true we want to post in there the words true because notice we have true or false we want to just put the words true or you could say it is true if it so basically you can put whatever you want if not false now the other thing to do here is to keep in mind notice that this bonus criteria here 
we don't want that to change. And if you remember from the types of references, we want to make that an absolute reference. So you press the F4 key to put the dollar signs so that when you use the autofill feature, that does not populate the other cells incorrectly. So we want to lock it to the criteria of 20,000. So again, so far what we did here, if B6, this value, is greater or equal to 20,000, which is B12, then we're going to post the words, it is true. Otherwise, we're going to post the words, false. And then the other thing we did, we just used the absolute reference. Then we click OK. Notice it says it's true. He made $20,382. Now we use the autofill feature here to move down to the other ones. And it says George here, he got only 19000 So he doesn't get the bonus and so on. So that was one method. The other method is to post here yes or no. The words actually yes or no. It's going to be very similar to the previous option here that we did. So we click here on insert function. Under the Formulas tab, we click on If, OK, and then we, again we say pretty much what we did earlier. We click on the reference here, if B6 is greater than equal to, to the criteria, 12, we make that an absolute reference by pressing F4, then we put here Yes. If it's false, no. And then click OK. Notice the first one they did they get a bonus, the other ones they don't get a bonus. Now, on the third option here, on the third reference, we are going to post the actual amount, which would be this amount. So, and if they didn't get it, then we put a zero in there. So, again, we go under the Formulas tab, click on Insert Function, and then the If function, then we say if this reference B6 greater or equal to the criteria, make it an absolute value, then they get the bonus, which is B13. Now we want to do that as an absolute reference as well, otherwise they get zero. And then we click OK. And notice the first one gets a $250 bonus, the other ones they get accordingly. And of course, if we are doing additional calculations here, you could have another column here to calculate the totals and for their income and such. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to utilize pivot tables in Excel. Pivot tables are a powerful feature of Excel. There are a couple requirements that you need to know before you start tinkering with them and finding that they don't work. The first thing is that the first row should contain the field names for the data that you're analyzing and working with. The second thing is that the records or individual transactions must be in rows very similar to this, for example, the region and all that type of thing. Then the third option is that uh, there should be no blank cells or rows within the data that you're evaluating. So you have to make sure that there is something in every one of them. And fourthly, the data must be surrounded by blank columns, meaning you have nothing in the immediate space to where your data is. So to utilize the pivot tables, what you do is basically select the data. And then, of course, you can use this uh, quick analysis tool here if you need it to. And once you select the, all the data, you go under insert and then you go under pivot table. You could also choose here, and this is new in 2000, Excel 2016, you could choose recommended pivot tables. And then in this case, notice uh, it's going to customize it by region sum of costs of goods sold by region or by sum of sales by specific individuals or count by products and so on. So you could kind of tinker with any of these options as well by using the recommended uh, tables here. But uh, in this case what I'm going to do is I'm going to just click on the pivot table here, 
So you get the idea. And what it's going to do is it's going to create, this is the selection that we're going to use, and it's going to create a new worksheet for us to work with and massage and tinker with this data. Click OK here. And now at this point, we could tinker with then any of these options. So let's say we want to see by region. And notice it built the table here by it put all the different regions. Then let's say we wanted to see by customers. So now notice we have the region here Midwest and now we have all the different customers or companies for each one of those. And then we want to see, let's say the cost of goods sold. That would be the next one. And then sales as well. So now we can kind of get an idea here. So we have that data all kind of in a big mess. Now we can make more sense out of it by sorting it out and utilizing, let's say, the first one we said here we used the region, then we wanted the company for each region, and then the sales within each region. Now, of course, you could sort this and do all, all kinds of other stuff. Now, by clicking on this drop down here, you can also choose to exclude certain areas and so on. So that was one type of uh, pivot table there. If we click here again, we can go in and change this. And uh, let's say we don't want it by, by region anymore. Now we want it by sales rep. So sales rep, notice uh, first we have here uh, the companies. And if we want to change the order, we just drag it further up. The sales rep to make the sales rep first. And if you wanted to filter by a specific region, you can add the filter up here. So I can drag the a region for example and make it as a filter and then I can pick here whichever region I want it will show me only that specific region I'm filtering it only for that specific region and if I wanted to see only the sales by a specific salesperson I can simply pick here the sales rep and then pick the additional fields that I want so I can choose a product and see what product they sold and the, the totals and that type of thing and then if I wanted a specific field to be sorted by or filtered by, I could even pick, uh, add it to the rows here and then choose to sort it at some point later to utilize that field for filtering. As uh, you work with pivot tables, it's basically going to be a matter of you, what you want it to look like, what you're looking for in that pivot table and how you want to sort and massage that table for the data that you want. Notice there is an option here as well for more tables. So you could click on yes to that. And basically in this case, you can choose to analyze, for example, by industry or by company. And you can even choose to detect relationships if there were any and things of that nature. Remember also that once you are in the pivot table already, you can choose here from the options for pivot tables. You can pick from one of those predefined ones as well. Maybe you want sales by region. Okay, there is a sales by region. Of course, you might want the sales rep. There is a sales rep as well that you just added. And you want to put also the customers then eventually. And now you have the sales by region, by a salesperson and the items that were sold. And then you can also add this product within each one of those. Notice as you're working with a pivot table, so let's say you have this type of uh, table that you created here using the pivot options here on the right hand side. And what you can do as well is that you can create a pivot chart. So it's basically going to take the information from this and build a chart out of it. So notice I pick the pivot chart, pick any of those designs, click OK. And now it built a chart for us based on the selected data. Pivot tables, again, are very powerful. Tinker with it from the different angles and utilize even the charts within them. As well. VLOOKUP is a very powerful function and the feature of Excel that comes in very handy whether you're a professional and using Excel heavily or whether you're a student or some casual user of Excel 
particularly one of those that uh, wants to advance in the career. So it's basically the VE lookup, it looks up for values for any item on the right hand side or in the, on any of the columns next to the item. For example, if we want to look up the price of apples, so that would be one way to utilize this. And uh, it's also used commonly in large tables uh, for uh, getting data from one worksheet to another one in a custom way. So in this case, I'm going to explain it in a very simple way first, and then we'll move into the more complex usage of this tool. V, it stands for the vertical lookup, the vertical lookup of the data. So the columns here will be the vertical pieces. So let's say we want to look up the price of apples. So we type here apples, and then we just start with a formula. Now to enter the formula, I'll show you how to do this a couple ways. Uh, one of the ways is to go here under formulas, you go under insert function, and then you find the function here VLOOKUP. You can type it up here, and then uh, it should show up after you type it. Double click on it, and then it says what value do you want to look up? So here we want to look up the apples, so you just click here on A4. So that's the value that we want to uh, look up at this point. And then the next piece of data that we need to enter here would be the array, the table part of it. So we want to look up the data from uh, the whole range here. Now, of course, we could have used also a named reference, which I'll try to cover in a moment. But for now, we're just picking the data. So we want the computer to look up the whole table with all the data. Typically, again, it will be much more data than here. Then it says, which column do you want to look up for apples? So in this case, we want to look up the price, which would be the fruit here, apples, it's the first column, and B here, the second column, and then C would be the third column. In our case, we want to look up column B, the price. So we put two here. Then the range lookup, if you want the exact uh, data, you want to choose false. And in most of the cases, you, that's uh, the most commonly used one until you figure out true works, how the function or the option for true works. But for now, we are just going to pick false here and then click OK. Now notice it says apples, the price of apples is 5,000. Now also notice here the uh, V lookup formula or we have the A4, it's the apples, we have the um, range here for the whole table, then we are choosing column 2. So if for some reason we wanted to display what the vendor is for, for apples, so you just put there number 3 to look it up on um, uh, column number 3, then hit enter, and notice it's displaying us the data for the company in this case. Again, uh, hopefully it makes sense here, uh, the idea is a large spreadsheet and look up the certain pieces of data that you need. The other way that you can do this is by using a drop down. So this would be another easy example here. You could uh, create a drop down list here. So you could say fruit and then to the right we're going to have a drop down. Now to create a drop down we go here under data and then we go under data validation and then we click on data validation again and then we choose a drop-down list. Now, on the drop-down list, you can specify the source and you can use the source of those uh, types of fruit here. So if we click here on source and then go and select here the drop-down list, it's basically saying that I want all those items to be listed in my drop-down list at this stage. Then you click OK and then at this point notice we have a drop-down list. So then next to it, we want to specify, let's say, the price. Now we can look up the price of any of the fruits, notice the fruits will be here in the drop-down, by simply using the VLOOKUP function. You can use the lookup function by, like I showed it a moment ago, or you can do it by using the formula manually here. So you do equal sign and then start typing VLOOKUP. Once it comes up, press TAB to and move to the next part of it. The next component is what do you want to look up basically? So here we want to look up 
whatever we choose from our drop down list which is this field right here at this point the f3 so if we chose apples and we want to look up the price of apples so we are using a drop down in this case and the drop down whatever value we picked from there that's what it'll be then we put a comma here and then we pick the range of the data so the range here would be looking up all the data that we want looking it up in a specific table or in a specific part of the spreadsheet so we just put in the range in there then we put a comma and then we want to specify which column or which piece of data do we want to look up for the item that we pick so if we pick bananas do we want the amount or do we want the wow which column is it so here we put number two because that will be column number two for the uh, amount and then we put false whether we want an exact match or approximate match so exact match would be false typing the word false it kind of doesn't make sense how Excel is doing it but that's how it is then you hit enter now notice right now it says well there is an error there is nothing applicable however if you go here now to the drop down list and you choose bananas notice it gives us the price of bananas then if we choose a different product let's say lemons that's uh, four thousand dollars or whatever so this would come in very handy with looking up data by using a drop down list so this is one way that you can use VLOOKUPs in business. Now, you can also create here for the range that if you see here that we did the range by using the C, A4 and C2 and such, you can give it a name. So we call it fruit data. Now, if we go and create here, for example, another VLOOKUP because we can use it for multiple options. Let's say we want also the vendor we do equal v lookup tab then we want the item that we have the type of fruit then press comma then you can put the reference by using the fruit data that we specified earlier for this range so basically we are representing the range by using a name for that whole selection then comma then we specify we want the column three data so we put three and then false and then close parentheses so now if I go and choose here my type of fruit and I say okay I want to look up bananas where do we get bananas from and now this is displaying the data so again the idea is that you can have a, can have a large spreadsheet here with uh, lots of data and you can have one of those lookups to get you the data that you want now another way to use VLOOKUP is let's say you have a spreadsheet like this and again you can use here a drop down so you can look up employees information by using a drop down very similar to how I did in the previous example or you can generate a custom list with specific pieces of data from this sheet so in this next example I'm going to demonstrate how to pull data from another worksheet and post on this sheet only the fields that we want for specifically for a mail merge or for whatever reason now one of the things to keep in mind is is that uh, it's typically best to give a name for the range of data that you're searching or utilizing in your search select uh, the first row here hold down the control and shift key and hit the down arrow that will select all your data to the very end then you go and give it a name in this case I called it employee data you can call it whatever you want but it's called so whenever we call it up or reference it it'll be employee data so the first thing let's put the employee IDs and this can work the same with the chart of accounts or whatever else that you might have on that referencing worksheet so here we are first going to post the employee ID so we'll hit the equal sign here we're not using a VLOOKUP so far we're just posting what's on the other worksheet here uh, for the employee ID number and then we hit enter so now this ID employee ID is 1001 next we want to get now using a VLOOKUP function we want to get the actual first name for that employee ID 
So we want to go here under first name on that cell and then start our VLOOKUP formula. Do the equal sign, then the function VLOOKUP, then tab, then after we do VLOOKUP, we want to look up this field, this data, this piece of data right here, the for customer 1001 or employee 1001, and then we want to look up in the range, so we put a comma here, then we put employee data, which is our selection of data from the spreadsheet, and then we put in there the column that has the data that we want. If we go back here and look, it's going to be column two. So we have one, two for the first name. So we put in here number two, and then false in order to get the exact match, and then close parentheses. And notice the customer's first name is Owen in this case. If we go and look over here, it's Owen. Now, we get also the last name a similar way. So we do equal sign, VLOOKUP, tab, the uh, reference point in the range. It's going to be our employee data. Then it's going to be column 3, if you remember from the spreadsheet a moment ago, and then false. Close parentheses, hit enter, Owen Hayes. That's the um, last name. Now we want to get the email address posted. So notice it's going to be, we need to determine which column it is uh, vertically here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's the ninth column. So if we go back here again, we can create again another lookup for the email address. So equal sign, the lookup, this is our reference point, then the employee data, then the column was the ninth column and then false. If for some reason you make a mistake, you can always choose a different column and hit enter. So notice we have the email address now. Now we could have gotten this as well by copying the formula and just changing the column. Now, in this case, you can actually to duplicate this across uh, for all your other customers, you can select these cells here and then just drag these down. And now the system is going to replicate the same data. And notice now we have the data here posted and we can use this for a mail merge. We can send it to whoever. So it's kind of like creating a report from a larger spreadsheet. We are looking up data from a larger spreadsheet or a worksheet. Now, if we change somebody's name and such, that data will be updated automatically in my lookup here. So notice it has been updated. So this is another cool way of utilizing this to replicate the data from one worksheet to another one with just the pieces of data that you want. Now, of course, you could use here a drop-down menu if you prefer as well and uh, have, for example, employee number. And then right next to it, you can have a drop-down menu. Let's say in here we want the salary. First name, last name, salary and then you'd put in there the employee number. The way to get the first name again would be equal sign, V lookup, and then we want to look up whatever we enter in here. The reference point, then the range. I'm double clicking to move to the next thing. Then um, we choose there the second column because uh, if you remember from earlier, the second column was actually the data that had the first name and then false close parentheses, hit enter. Now this right now, it's not happy with us because we have not entered anything in the employee number. If we go here and look at the employee numbers, notice 1001, 1002, and whatever, we can go here and put in 1001 for the employee, and it gives us the name Sally. Then if you go and um, do a VLOOKUP again for the last name, so you can do that again with the formula here, so VLOOKUP. We want to look up whatever this is a point of reference, comma, the range, then um, last name, it was the third column, and then false, close parentheses, and then you post also the salary. So if we have here 1005 at this point, notice it's bringing up the data. For the salary, this we have to count the fields here, so it's 
So we go here in the VLOOKUP and we do another VLOOKUP here. Equal sign VLOOKUP, the reference point, the data, the column, false. Then hit enter. Now in this case it did not work because we didn't have the data in the right fields. Notice we have a couple empty fields here. So our, the salary data is actually on field 10, 11, 12, so number 12. So that's why it did not work. So we go and change that to number 12, and now we have the data for that. Then format this appropriately, and there it is. So basically, this is like a lookup form for you for specific types of data. So, so far we did three examples. So, so you're looking up prices up here by using a dropdown on the type of fruit and such and getting the data. We looked up specific columns of data and we built a, a new list using data from another sheet. These could be account numbers and such. And then this other example here was entering a specific employee ID. Another final tool here would be this example. So let's say we have the April expenses or donations and then we go to and we got some additional data for May donations and we want to kind of merge those. So one of the ways to do that would be uh, just copy this data and create another sheet with the May data here. And we can just refer to this as May. You can also select this data here and that whole range of it, just call it May. Now here we want to the May donations. So that we are merging the data from two separate sheets in this case. And we do the lookup. The column or the field that we want to look up is this right here. Then the data that we want to look up is basically what was in May, that whole set of data. So we, we named it May data. And then we want column two because that was uh, the donations for May in the May uh, worksheet. And then we say false. Close parentheses, hit enter. And notice for the first one it's saying not applicable. So the reason for that is uh, because Stacy Coors does not exist on this May sheet. Now, if we replicate this or we uh, use the autofill feature, notice it's posting the donations from May. So, for example, notice Denise, she donated $30. If we go over here, that's $30. And then we can format this in currency and clear that out that doesn't have any data. So that's how you can kind of merge multiple data sources or sheets to build a new one by looking up the data on various other ones. In this last example, we are going to learn how to use VLOOKUP, the closest match, and that is utilizing the true option here at the end of our formula. In this example, we are going to use determining commissions for our sales individuals, and this has multiple other uses as well. It's important to note here is that uh, first we have to have a commission table. So we are going to determine what the tiers are and then those numbers here as well need to be within the specific ranges. Let's go ahead and test this. Also, th these numbers need to be within um, an increasing number. They need to be in a sorted order, basically. So here we have the individuals and their sales for the month. And then we're going to post in here the uh, VLOOKUP their commissions for that specific month or the sales. First, our data range that we are going to use as the searching criteria to compare it against. Let's first name that as a named ref. And you can name that to whatever you want. Now at this point, we are going to enter the formula over here. So basically, we're going to look up the values that are in here as a point of reference. And then we're going to compare it against the values in our commission table and then have the system determine what commission they will receive. And we'll do this, of course, with a VLOOKUP function and using the true option, getting the approximate or the closest match. 
So we'll do the equal sign, the lookup tab. This is our starting value, our point of reference, basically, that what are the value that we are going to compare. And we're going to compare it against this range over here. We called it earlier commission range. Then we are going to have the system post what's on column two. So this will be our payout rate. So that will be in column two. And then the function here is going to be an approximate match because unless we specified 50,000 or 100,000 and such, it's not going to work otherwise. So we're going to use here the true function. Or you can double click here on the approximate match, true, close parentheses, hit enter. And now we have here the value for the lookup for Melissa. Her sales were higher than $200,000. Therefore, her commission is going to be $400,000. Then, of course, we could format this range into currency. And then, instead of doing this V lookup for all the other cells, we can just use the autofill feature. And now we should have the determination here for all the commissions for each individual. And that's how using VLOOKUP for determining the commissions works. And also this is utilizing the true function because the other examples that we utilized were using the exact match. This is the approximate match from the specific range. Now, of course, if their sales changed, so let's say she got only 110,000 in sales, notice her commission will change as well. session I'm going to demonstrate how you can use predefined drop-down lists as somebody or your assistant or you're entering data in Excel so that the data that you entered is consistently spelled and it's consistently listed correctly based on a previously defined list. So in this case let's say we have a sales rep and you have four or five sales and you're constantly entering and re-entering those names and you want to make sure that those names are all the time spelled appropriately so what you can do is and you can use this for products and other things as well what you can do is in another sheet in your spreadsheet here you can just create the names define the names so we have hubert mark john samantha and mimi and so on so now here when you're entering it you want always hubert to be spelled correctly or to have a drop down list of names. So we have this uh, column here. So now what you do is you go under data here. Under data, we want to do data validation. So basically, data validation in this case is that it picks from a list of rules to limit the type of data that can be entered in a cell. It can be numbers, it could be a list of names, and so on, just like I mentioned earlier. So we click on data validation and we choose data validation here. And then under what to allow, you, right now it's to allow any value in this column. However, we can go here under choose and choose a list. Only a list of predefined names can be allowed to be entered in there. So then we go here and it's saying, where is your source? Where is your list of data? And then you simply go to the sheet that has the list of names. In this case, it's sheet number four for me and we go over right here now you could pick a little bit of extra space here so that if you add another name in the future you have the capability without having to change the de design of the spreadsheet you can leave some of the blank areas here so then we click ok and now notice we are back to sheet number three so now we are entering sales reps instead of you typing tom notice it doesn't allow you to do that it says a user has restricted values that can be entered here. So now you have this drop down list. You have Hubert, Mark, John, and so on. So we click on Hubert, and then you put the date and the item and all that type of stuff. Of course, date shouldn't be allowed like that either. So you can customize that for the next one. So you go to the next one and next one and so on. Now, if for some reason you wanted to add another client or salesperson, 
remember we had we specified a couple extra cells here so we go here we added it on the list now we go back and over here Jonathan is listed as one of the salespeople so you can use this for products predefined products for your salespeople and so on In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use one of the simple but yet important features in Excel, particularly when you're using a lot of data that you want to navigate. So, for example, let's say that we have this data file here or this uh, worksheet. And as we scroll down, notice how we lose track of what uh, the headers are here. Also, as we move from left to right, notice that we lose track of what the first column is here the question is how can we make it so that actually the the header and the first column stay put well there are a couple ways to do it the first way is uh, basically we could lock only the uh, the header row here just the top one so what you can do is you go under the view tab and you go under the freeze panes and that is the feature that you want to use in this case so you could choose freeze top row and in this case notice as we scroll down the top row stays put and we can navigate up and down however if we were to go left and right in this case it's still not locked this first column so to correct the problem what we do is we go here to the very top again and then we click right below the first row that we want to keep uh, locked and also right uh, to the right on the next column for the column that we want to lock so once we select the cell that we want to uh, keep as a key point for locking both the column and the row then we go here under freeze panes and then we simply click on freeze panes at this point we can scroll up and down and the top row will stay locked and we can scroll from left to right and the column on the left will stay locked. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to set the print area in a worksheet in Excel. Typically, in a Word document, uh, you press print and it either the whole document prints out or a selection or a specific page prints out. In Excel, it's slightly different due to the spreadsheets being quite large and typically a worksheet can contain up to a million records. So uh, if you wanted to print only a specific area of your worksheet, you need to set what's called the print area. Right now, I have not set the print area yet in this one. So if we wanted to look as to what it will uh, print out or look for printing, if we go here under File and then choose Print, this is how it will print out. And it's going to print those pages just like that. But suppose I want only a specific chart or a specific area here to be printed out. In this case, what you have to do is go and select the area that you want to print out here. So let's say I want only this portion right here to be printed out. I can simply select this, then go under Page Layout, and then choose under Print Area. And then click on Set Print Area. And at this point, if I go to File, and print notice that my preview it will print only that specific section now to clear the print area for if you do not need that any longer you click here on print area again and then choose clear print area and then you'd have to set it again for other pages or other sections of your worksheet <music> session I'll briefly show you how to link data from, a, from an Excel spreadsheet into a Word document for the purpose of reports and so on. So there are a couple ways to take data from Excel and then utilize it in Microsoft Word. So let's see if we can demonstrate it very quickly here. So we go to Word and let's say this is my report. 
let's say I have to do this report monthly and I have to take data from Excel and, and put it in my report for whether it is expenses or it could be whatever else. So one of the ways to get the data from Excel into Word is by simply clicking on saving this. So copying it from Excel and then I'm right clicking and choose copy or control C or however you copy stuff or click on copy and paste up here and then I go back to Word and then I'm going to paste it. Now notice by simply pasting it in Word it does not look anywhere close to what it was in Excel. Of course I could go here and choose to use the destination or the keep the source formatting. So that's one way it's not the greatest way. Now what you can do is you can actually link the data with the Excel spreadsheet. So once you link it once as the data is updated from time to time from Excel from your assistant or whoever else out there that report it's always up to date all you have to do is open up the document and it will be up to date. So for that to work what you do is you go into Excel we copy and we select and copy the data so I'm just copying it again those bars were there because I had copied it from before now we go back to Word and we click here under paste but instead of just choosing paste we are going to click on paste special so choose paste special and then we're going to paste it as a link so we are going to link it with Microsoft Excel so it's linked to an Excel spreadsheet object so basically the data is not really residing it's of course posted in the document but it's linked with the Excel document. So I'll demonstrate in a moment here. Since we pasted it, we can assume that the report is done. We're going to save it. And we're going to save it on the desktop. I call it this my monthly report. Now a month has passed by or whatever time has passed by. And notice my, uh, let's say my training expense for January in the previous report was $100 before. Now I'm going to make it $123. Now if I go to my document, and let's say I'll save it. Let's assume that a few months passed by. Now I go into my report. Double click on it. Notice the first thing that you'll get is it says this document contains links that refer to other files. Do you want to update this document or the data from the linked files? It's saying it's linked to Excel. Do you want this to be updated? So I say yes. And now this is my older junk here that I had from before. But notice the expense here for January for 123 has been updated. So the idea is that whatever you change here in Excel as you're keeping track of things, it will be automatically posted and linked with Microsoft Word because we linked that data earlier. So if I go into Word, close it, and then save the Excel changes that I made, open it up again, say yes to update it, Again, ignore this part. Notice even the formatting has been updated from Excel. So it's a pretty neat tool. It's highly recommended that you utilize it in your work. In this video I'll demonstrate how to import data from a CSV file or a text file. The CSV files are used quite a bit in larger businesses and corporations for transferring data between systems. It's a common file format that is utilized for transferring files. So this is an example of a CSV file. It's called CSV because it's comma separated values. So notice these would be the columns the system will know where the columns are separated by the comma when we bring this into Excel. So let's go back and we'll try to import that. 
let me take note where it is located now the way you bring it in is by clicking on file click on open and then go and find the file basics so it will go under my computer or computer click on browse we will go under downloads go wherever it is located and we're going to choose here to show us all files so notice it's in voices list double click on it now you'll be presented with this wizard basically it's saying this is a csv file or comma or delimited uh, text delimited file so we are telling it okay it's text delimited usually you'd know that by whoever wherever you got the, of course the file to tell you what whether it's comma delimited or tab delimited could be either one of them now you check this option here for my data has headers what that means is that the first row of your data actually has the labels as to what that column stands for then we click on next then we tell the system that this is comma separated values so the commas are what separate each field uh, if it was tab uh, delimited or semicolon delimited or something else uh, you choose that but uh, most of them are usually comma separated then you click on next then you could specify additional types of formatting here usually it's not necessary and then you click on finish now at this point that data from a text file has been imported into excel and notice i'm double clicking between the columns to make them fit correctly notice it's much cleaner and now you can tinker with this data you can create charts you can create whatever you want to create filter it and all that type of stuff you save it it's done let's choose save as here browse where we want to save it and then we don't want it as tab delimited we want to save it as an excel file so we go here under excel workbook and give it a name it's going to name it listed as invoices list which is fine and now it's an excel format just like any other excel spreadsheet now at this point for some reason let's assume this is a spreadsheet that you created in excel now you want to send it to somebody in comma separated values very similar to how we got it earlier now we click on file choose save as and then click on browse under this the save as file type this is where you tell it that it's going to be csv comma delimited file click on csv give it a name and then click on save and you want to keep using it to say yes if we were to go back to that folder know this it's with commas so that's how you bring a file in you bring it in from csv and you export into a csv in this session i'm going to demonstrate how to perform a mail merge in microsoft word the process is actually very similar to other versions of Microsoft Word as well. It's not identical. However, I'm going to go over it here in Office 2016. So let's say I have this long document here, and I want to do a mail merge and send this to individual So For now, I'm going to create a new page here. I'm going to insert a new page, and I'm going to put their information in there for my clients, let's say so in this case i'm going to go under insert and i'm going to insert the page break so just so that i have a blank page here to start with and then in here i'm going to make it so that this document can be customized for each individual it has their address and their name and some kind of information as well and by the way this doesn't have to be a document like this it can be a blank document a letter that you sent it could be invoices it could be whatever notices that you send out there it's very similar to letters that you receive from various companies out there that have your name on top of it you have to have a document in word and you have to have an excel document as well and that's best to use excel of course you can have other options as well so let's assume this is the list of my customers i have their first name last name the street address of course this is all fictitious the zip code and then a bunch of email addresses and you could have also comment one two three so this would be customized personalized 
comments. So, so this is what the comment that I could write, for example, for customer one. Now customer two, I would say, and so on. Now one key thing to remember as well as you build your list in Excel is that uh, the first row here needs to have the field names or it's best to have the field names. So first name, last name, telephone, street address and keep those separate as well if you can. Keep as many fields as you want here or columns with comments because you can utilize this for multiple mail merges and the way you'll be doing it is that you can link the same data file and you keep on updating this from month to month and you link it to the same report or the same mail merge that you do for your customers. So in this case, let's say we are all good to go here. We have maintained this list. This is our customer list and so on. Notice that the tab here on the bottom, it says customer. So now I'm going to save it. I'm going to close it and then I'm going to go back to my document. Now in here, I want to create a new mail merge. So I go under mailings and then I go under start mail merge and the best thing to do is or what I'd suggest that you do is click on step-by-step -step mail merge wizard. In here notice that there is pane in the right hand side shows up and it asks you do you want to create letters, email address, email messages, envelopes, labels and so on. You can do emails and that's a powerful feature and I'll try to demonstrate that in another video here or actual letters like the old days that you used to do, print them in a paper and stuff them in an envelope and send them and that type of thing. So for now, we're gonna learn how to do letters. We click on next step to start the document. It says, do you want to use the current document that we have opened here? Or do you want to start from a template or do you want to use an existing document that you have from some other time? So I say, I want to use the current one. And then the next step here is to select the recipients. Now it says, do you want to use an existing list or do you want to create a new list? In our case, we are going to use an existing list, that Excel file that I opened a moment ago. Also, you can use Outlook if you use Microsoft Outlook as well. Now, type a new list. You can do it from here from Microsoft Word. However, I'd recommend create a list in Excel if you're going to have to create a new list because it's much easier to manage in the future and update. So we click here on uh, use an existing list. We click on browse and then we have to find the file. So now we scroll up here and I'm going to go to the word 2016 and this is my customer list for the mail merge. I click on open. That's my Excel file basically. And here is my customer table. Notice there are two sheets in there, but I want to use, remember I mentioned earlier customer. Click OK. Now notice this is the list of all the customers in that Excel spreadsheet. You could also sort them a certain way if you wanted so you can sort them alphabetically by first name, by last name and all that type of thing. And then you can also filter them if you needed to. So let's say you want only by a specific zip code or by a specific criteria and so on. You could basically simply click on filter and choose a field name. And uh, let's say here's a zip. And you would say zip equal to some number or greater than some number and so on. So in this case, I'm going to cancel that. You could uh, find duplicates to avoid sending duplicates. And then you simply click on OK here. At this point, we are ready. We have told the system that we're going to use the existing document and an existing list. Now the next thing it says, write your letter. Now in my letter here, it's saying, well, put in your address block. I could put this by clicking on it or we could insert the fields manually. I would recommend that you tinker with it manually. So you could say dear and then choose here the insert field option. So dear first name. The computer will put the first name in there. Then you go to the next line here and then you start writing your letter basically. Now, the other thing that you could do is in here, you could put their address so that it would be part of the envelope or however it's going to show up. So we click here under insert field, first name, space, last name, and then insert field, street address, city, comma, state and the zip. Now 
those look coded, but the computer is going to pull them one by one and match them with the Excel spreadsheet. So don't panic on that. Now in here, you would write your letter. You'd say below is the annual report for your investments. Let's assume this is an investment report. And uh, if you have any concerns, please contact us. You could also insert here, remember in Excel we had a comments field, you could put a comments field in here. Now at this point you put your name there. You could also insert an image if you needed to or a logo or whatever part of your, uh, it's going to be duplicated across all the pages. Now at this stage you could simply actually save this, if you were to save it at this point and you'd give it a name. Now the next step is, the reason why I saved it is because you could at any point open this and it's going to pull your data automatically from your Excel file if you needed to do another mail merge in six months or whatever. Now the next thing here, notice it says preview your letters. So notice it says, this is the address, Alex, and so on. And you could kind of preview them right here. Next, next, next. Now. A lot of people, they stop here, but you need to finish to complete your merge. You can click here under Complete Merge, and then you can either choose to print them or edit individual letters. Now, there's also a Finish and Merge option on the top here as well. So in my case, particularly what I usually prefer to edit individual letters, and then I'm going to choose all of them now it's going to take a little while because i had 29 pages here and i have a lot of customers so notice now we have one letter or long report for every one of the customers here so notice we have here the first one is for alex and now we have to keep on scrolling because this is a long report and now here's amber it's the next customer and again, like I mentioned, it's going to be a long one. So suppose you have two or three pages, and this would be much more meaningful. But basically, we're creating a personalized report here for each one of the customers. And here's for the next third one. Keep in mind, again, the key there is that this is the output at this stage. If we were to look at the documents that I have opened here, and apparently I have many of them, but this is the one with merged results. It says letters, one word. Uh, this we can actually uh, trash it after we are done with it. We don't need to save it unless you need it for documentation purposes. This is our form. So at this point, if I close this, open this again, notice it prompts you, it says this, opening this document will run the following commands. Select from customer order by first name and last name. Do you want to update it? Yes. And now it's linking it to the Excel file. Now at any point we can go here under mailings and it's ready, we can simply click on finish and merge and it's going to merge all of those just like it did earlier. Keep in mind again before I end this session that you can always update the Excel file and you can always reuse the form file. The results page, the merged results, you don't necessarily need to save them unless you need to keep them for documentation purposes as to what you sent out. In this session, we're going to learn about using financial functions in Excel. And particularly, we're going to focus on three of them at this point, as we know there are hundreds of them, and for the sake of time, we can't cover all of them. So the first one is PMT, which is the interest payment for a period on a loan. Then the IPMT is the interest payment over a period of time. And then the PPMT is the principal payment for a specific period that you are calculating. As we learned earlier, uh, the way to uh, find out how to use that specific function is by going to, let's say over here, we want to insert a function and then we search as to what we want to search for. So for example, PMT first. And notice PMT, it says it calculates the payments for a loan based on a constant payments and a constant interest rate. 
So we click, uh, you can also click on help on this function. It will go to Microsoft and it will explain this further by uh, explaining the syntax for it and some examples and remarks and all that type of thing. You can explore these for yourself as well, but uh, the way it will work here is that um, for PMT, for example, it needs these values in black here. So we need to figure out the rate. What is the interest rate per month? So the key there, it's going to be per month. So notice I have this working area down here. So the interest rate, when you get a loan, it would be, let's say, $19.99 or 5% or 30% loan that you're receiving. But yet the rate that the computer needs, it's per month. Therefore, we need to do a little bit extra calculations here. The NPER, it is the number of payments that you are going to be paying. Uh, for example, if you're getting a loan for five years, that would be a 60 months. And uh, if you are getting a home loan for 30 years, that would be 360 months. And then the PV, it's the present value. And that means how much is your loan? You're getting a $100,000 loan or a $10,000 loan and so on. So the actual total amount that you are borrowing. But before we do any of these calculations, we need to have some sub-calculations. For example, for the rate, that needs to be for the month. The easiest would be to utilize uh, something very similar to this to lay this out. So you say my interest rate is, let's say, 5%. And you have to format this in percent before you forget to do that. Click on percent here. Then it says interest payments per year. That's like your number of payments that you're going to make for a year. That will be 12 in this case. And then the interest payment per month. Now you're calculating this by dividing C13, which is the percent rate, divided by 12 or by the number of payments. So we could actually, instead of using 12 there, we could have used the actual reference for it, which would be C14. And then we hit enter. Now notice the other trick here as well is that we are calculating this with uh, a bunch of increased numbers or values here because uh, I think in the business world they use up to five digits after the period. So here we have a little bit more than that, but we could kind of control it by this right there. So that would be our payment interest rate per month in this case. Then the number of years, we are taking the loan for five years, and that means it's going to multiply C14, which is the number of payments per year, times the number of years, and it's giving us the NPR, which is the number of payments. And then the PV is the total amount that we are borrowing. In this area here, we are going to calculate the PMT. So now what we do in this case, we go here under formulas, insert function, and we find the PMT option, click OK, and then we go here under rate. Well, rate, all we have to do is click on the C15 because we calculated it already. NPER, it's 60 in this case, so we click on C17. And then the PV, we click on the value here for the amount. And then leave everything alone. We click OK. And it comes to $188.71 for $10,000 for five years at 5%. Now, if we were going to borrow this for 15%, Notice it went to $237 over five years. Now, if we are borrowing a loan for a house for $300,000, and we are paying it over 30 years, our payment at 15% would be $3,793. 
but yet for uh, mortgage rates at this point they're not 15 percent fortunately they might be about five percent or six percent so at five percent you'd be spending if you're borrowing three hundred thousand dollar loan you're going to pay every month one thousand six hundred and ten dollars that's why it's important to, to be able to get that good interest rate so that's one way to calculate this now the other way to calculate uh, the PMT in this case without having to do all this work sheet here which is actually I strongly recommend that you utilize it this way but it will be by using the formula this way we go under insert and then we choose here the PMT function and then it says rate we want to get the rate but the rate has to be calculated per per month we click here on the rate the interest rate is 5% and then we need to divide that by 12 for each month. The NPER would be the number of payments so if you know that you're getting this loan for 30 years then you could do 30 times 12. So you're saying there are going to be total number of payments for the loan it's uh, 30 times 12 360. Then the PV would be the present value, the amount of your loan. And then you hit OK here, and we get the same value. So this is a little bit more work to set it up initially, but it's more useful in the long run. This is quicker to get it going, but you're embedding specific numbers and values within the cells. Interest payment for a particular period. That means that uh, we want to know how much interest are we going to pay on that first payment. Our payment was $1,600 per month. Now we want to calculate the interest that we are paying for that first month. So we go here under and we find here IPMT and then click OK. And then we want to figure out what the rate is. So the rate, fortunately, we're going to use this worksheet that I have prepared, or you can do the calculations like I showed you earlier. So we have C15, that's your rate. The PER, it wants to know the period in which you want to find out your interest rate, what you're paying for interest on that period. So in this case, we said we want to find the first payment that we make. How much are we paying on interest? So we put just number one, first payment. The NPER here, it will be the number of total payments. And then the PV, it's actually the value that you're borrowing then we go here and click OK and now notice that on the first payment if you're borrowing $300,000 at 5% for 30 years on the first payment you're going to pay $1,250 in interest if you're going to change this to the second payment notice it's probably going to be a little bit less $1,248 for the second payment of course that interest it's going to drop from payment to payment to payment so on the, let's say on the 359th period you'd be paying only $13 in interest that's why it's important to have as much money up front to pay for a house or something if you can because you're avoiding a $1200 interest payment on the first one so now let's calculate how much your principal payment is going to be for this loan and specifically in this case for month number one of course we could do it by deducting 1600 by doing the subtraction from here but we're going to do it using the function here in excel so the way we do that is by going here under the insert function and then we want to find the ppmt click on OK and then again we're going to use the same thing so it's going to be rate PR the period so the rate the period the number of payments and the present value so we have the rate the period the first time or the first payment that we are making to the loan company then the number of total payments then the present value and then when we have filled out all of these values we click OK here and notice it comes to $360 that we are paying monthly 
toward our principal, toward our $300,000. So in the first month, we are paying $1,600 in total, but only $360 is applying toward the $300,000. So that's, in brief, how you can utilize some of the financial functions in Excel 2016. It's the same way that you can do it in the previous versions as well. Hi, my name is Sally Caselli. The following is a comprehensive tutorial on using PowerPoint 2016. We will start with the basics and move into the more advanced features of PowerPoint. This tutorial should be effective and helpful for anyone who wants to learn PowerPoint, whether as a student, as an educator, or a user in the corporate world, or a user in a small business. This tutorial is recorded in, in high definition, 1080p, so feel free to make it full screen so you can follow easier. Also note that it might be more effective if you try to practice some of those concepts hands-on. If it is an area that you already know about PowerPoint, feel free to forward it to the next section. So let's get started. As we get started with PowerPoint 2016, I'm using here Windows 10. You can simply search here for PowerPoint to locate it and then hit enter. Once you open PowerPoint, you'll be presented with this interface. On the left, you'll have a listing of presentations that you have used earlier. And then you also have an option here to open prior presentations that you might have saved on your computer. Then here on the right hand side, you have the option to start a blank presentation or to use one of those templates. Using one of those templates, it's very easy. Just simply click on them and then it will download it from Microsoft. I will cover this in a later session in this tutorial, so please hang on and refer to it. Now let's go back here. Let's simply go and start a blank presentation to start with. As I mentioned earlier in this session, we are going to cover some of the basic aspects of PowerPoint of the user interface and get to understand where the different components are so we can effectively utilize it in the later sessions. Here on the very top, you have these different menus. So file, home, insert, draw, design, uh, transitions, and so on. The idea here is, is that you move from each one of those tabs here on the top and this is part of the office ribbon and uh, any of the basic functionality would be from the home tab all of these different sections notice you have these different sections here related to font paragraph drawing and such then if you want to go to insert once you start making your presentation a little bit better and fancier that's when you can go and insert additional components in your presentation then you move into design transitions and so on so the idea here is, is that you have the office ribbon on the very top with the different tabs and each tab has different sections related to what you're doing in that context. My suggestion is as you get started with PowerPoint, do first the content of your PowerPoint rather than spending too much time or as I might refer to it as wasting a lot of time on tweaking particular aspects, images and uh, other things related to your presentation. The purpose for that is so that you can actually have something for yourself if you are short on time. On the left hand side, you'll have the actual slides, a preview of each slide. So if you have more than one slide, they will show up right there. And then in the middle area, we have the content of the slide. This is where you'd enter the actual content for each uh, slide in your presentation. And then in the bottom, you have here another set of tools like such as the slide numbers and such. Then you have the notes area, and then we'll cover this in a later session. Then notice here you have these little icons as well. This is the normal view. And then you could have also the slide sorter. If you had multiple slides, you'd be able to move them around and we'll cover this shortly. If you wanted to present the slideshow or your presentation, you'd click on this icon over here. And then if you wanted to zoom in or out into that particular view that you are in, you'd customize it from these tools here in the bottom. 
Notice that on the top left here you have also file and this is where you can access additional functionality related to PowerPoint. One of the things here is it will be under account where you can connect to the Microsoft account or under options here this is where you can customize the look and feel of PowerPoint. So that is the general interface and now the next session we are going to cover how to create the first slides, how to get started actually using PowerPoint. So stick around. If you feel that you know some of those features, feel free to forward the video. In this session, I'm going to go over how to create your first slides and how to insert different types of slides in your presentation. So let's go ahead and open PowerPoint. And as we covered in the previous session, you'll be clicking here, blank presentation. And then here we can simply get started typing on our first slide. Each slide has different layouts or different designs. So typically the first slide is your title slide where you put the title of your presentation along with a subtitle, either your name or something related to that. And the layouts, they'll be very similar to here. We can see this under the Home tab and then under the Layout area. So we have the title slide, title and content. You have two content sections and so on. So now with our first slide here, all that we need to do is simply need to type the content. So. So you add in the text. So basically it's just a matter of typing in any of those boxes that already exist in your slide. Now to add a new slide, all you have to do is you click on new slide here on the left hand side. And again, we are under the home tab and then click on new slide. Now notice since this is the second slide here in our presentation, it looks slightly different from the first one. And that is because the first one was actually a title slide. If you wanted to change this design, you can use this layout option here and change it to a different type of design here. So notice I chose two content or a single content here, title and content. That was what was there before. So that's how you change the layout on, of an actual slide. So now here, put in the title for our second slide. And it's a matter of simply clicking on each area here and just typing the content of your slides. Notice it's putting here the bullet list. My suggestion would be that at this stage, you keep on moving, adding other slides and basically create the general flow or the text for your presentation. It is very easy to waste a lot of time in, into messing with the colors and choosing images and choosing animations and you're still on the first or the second slide but you have spent hours. So it's best to do the outline first, then come back later and that's when you can insert images, insert smart art and insert other components that we'll cover in the later sessions here. So then if you wanted to insert a new slide here, you click on new slide again and then it's going to be by default, it's going to be a title slide with content as well. Now, another way to add a new slide, it's also by pressing Control M on the keyboard. Notice as well that there's a drop down here right below new slide here. And this is where you can choose a different type of layout. So you can change the layout either when you insert a new slide here, or if you have an existing slide and you want to change the layout for it, you can simply click on the slide here and then click on layout and then adjust it accordingly. If you want to undo whatever you did earlier, you can also use those tools here on the top. And this is referred to as the quick access toolbar. Again, as I mentioned earlier, of course, you could go here under the Home tab and then just start changing the colors and changing components in here. Of course, you can change them by using those tools and fonts and paragraph and indentation and all these other things. But my suggestion, as I mentioned earlier, is for you to create the outline first. In some cases, if you need to move slides around, 
you can simply drag them from here and drag them up and down as you need them. Or the other option is by clicking here in the bottom icon, set of icons or tools here, you click on slide sorter and you can move those slides as you feel like move them around and then come back to the normal view. Now let's suppose that this was a quick presentation that we had to do for a class or for a meeting or whatever. So basically we just add in the content here very quickly by adding new slides and then you could insert a couple of images that I'll uh, show you in a moment. Now the images and we'll cover those in more detail but let's suppose that this is an image that we want to utilize from the web and notice I'm just simply right clicking and then I'm going to paste it in here and obviously we can resize this move it to where we want it and such and I'll cover this in more detail shortly and basically now we move to the next slide so we add more and more content now let's say that we were ready to to see what we did so far now we can present this or we can see what it looks like so far by clicking here under slideshow and then choosing from beginning to present it. You can also present it by using the slideshow option here in the bottom and that will start the presentation. And then just click on either the space bar or the mouse or the arrows here on the keyboard and now we have a presentation that we can start with or we can utilize and we can make it fancier that we can improve by using the additional tools that I'll cover shortly. There is also an option here where you can apply a design right away by using a simple button and I'll cover this shortly here in more detail. So basically all you'd have to do, let's say you're in a rush to do a presentation, you can actually go here and pick any of those themes by simply clicking on it and notice it applies that theme or that design to all the slides in your presentation. And now if I were to present this from the beginning, notice it looks much better. So it's as easy as that. So stay tuned for the next session here on enhancing the presentation by using the design view. Now in this session I'm going to demonstrate how to apply a design theme to your presentation in PowerPoint 2016. So supposedly we have created the presentation and now we are ready to move to the next step. We have created the layout but now we want to go and apply a design theme. As I mentioned earlier as well, it is not necessary to spend too much time on customizing every little object of it but rather apply a design theme. Now to apply a design theme, you go here under the design tab and then you can click on any of those options right here under themes. This is referred to as the live preview. It's basically going to, it gives us a, a preview of what that slide would look like if we applied this theme. If you click here on the drop down, there are additional themes that you can apply and you can pick any of those. Once you pick a theme, it will apply that theme to all the slides in your presentation. So notice it changed the font here for all my slides. Now, if you prefer to have a specific theme for only a couple of the slides here, all that you'd need to do is basically select them by I'm holding down the control key here and then clicking on the slides that I want. And then you can go to any of those themes and then right click on that particular theme and then choose to apply it that specific theme to only the selected slides. In that way my other slides would have the previous theme or a specific theme but then other slides have a different design. I'm going to undo it here in my case. If you right click on any of those themes you have also the option to set it as a default theme. That means that any time that you create a new presentation, it's going to use that by default on your presentations. Once we apply a specific theme here, notice that we also have those variations for this theme. And this is kind of new in 2016. Notice there is this type of uh, design here. 
it's changing the font and it's changing different components here. Notice the colors are changing and such along with the font. So you can pretty much pick any of those colors or designs that you prefer. And then you can also click and customize specific, just a color combination for your presentation, whatever it's appealing to you. Notice as well that you can change the actual fonts, the font types for your presentation and specific effects as well. Additionally, you can customize the background for your slides for this particular theme. Another thing that you can do here in PowerPoint 2016 is how to change the slide size. By default in PowerPoint 2016, since most of the laptops and the computers out there, they use a widescreen and even the projectors nowadays support the widescreen, the default is 16 by 9 rather than 4 by 3, which was a standard presentation mode. So this is where you change the layout for your presentation. So if I choose the 4x3, this is going to customize it and it gives you an option here to resize your slides and now it's going to readjust my presentation. Now notice it's more squarish like in the previous versions of PowerPoint. If I were to present this, notice it, does, it will not fill the complete screen. By the way, to present the presentation, you can also press the F5 key on the keyboard or click here in the bottom under the slideshow present mode. So if I present it, notice it's kind of squarish. Now, if I want it widescreen again, we go here under slide size and choose widescreen 16 by 9. And now my screen, it will be full when I go and present it. So you can tailor this according to the equipment that you're going to be using and the type of uh, projectors that they have when you're presenting it. Additionally here, you can format the background here. There's this background option. And you can change it so it hides the background graphics for specific slides. Now, uh, we don't have really much graphics uh, behind here, but notice there's an object here in the bottom you can choose to hide the those uh, images and this it will be applied for that specific slide and not all the slides in your presentation obviously you can change here additional settings that you can tweak and customize on your own now notice also there is a new option here design ideas and i'll cover this in the next session this is new with the latest update of PowerPoint. So you need to have the Windows updates and the Microsoft Office updates. Check the next tutorial on, on using the design ideas. So that's in a nutshell how to use to apply a theme to a presentation and how to customize the theme within the presentation. And then also how to make it the default, how to apply a specific theme to specific slides with your presentation. In this session, I will cover a new feature in PowerPoint 2016, that of design ideas. So if we go here to the design tab and we have a presentation that we were working on earlier, we have uh, slides with various content in it and such. And all that you have to do is basically you can change the design or you can have the software here, PowerPoint 2016, give you ideas on the design for this slide. So all that you'd have to do is basically click on the slide that you want to change the design for it and then click on design ideas. For certain slides, depending on the content and such, because we don't have many objects in it, it may not give you any ideas. However, if you go on another one, for example, creating an outline here, we have three steps for it. Notice design ideas. It presents us with a bunch of options that we can simply click on it and it will apply it to our slide. It will change the whole design for our slide. So instead of you spending all afternoon designing this and not making it so color coordinated and such, you're basically just simply using one of those existing designs from here. Here you would basically go to the next slide as well 
and then click on design ideas and notice it's giving us similar designs here as well. So we could simply click on this option or that or either one of those that makes our presentation more versatile. If I go here and insert a new slide and then I want an image that I copied from the web and such, notice as soon as I inserted the image here, it gives me additional ideas. So now notice, for example, in this one, it's most of a slide here, it's going to be this picture and then some area here to insert content. Or we can go here to different other designs that might work best for this scenario. So that's a very cool feature in PowerPoint 2016. It may not work on every one of your slides. However, my suggestion would be is that you go through each slide or typical slides in your presentation and then uh, try as to what suggestions PowerPoint 2016 has for your presentation or for your slide. So now next we are going to learn about how to import slides from a different presentation into our existing presentation. In this session I'm going to demonstrate how to reuse slides from another presentation in PowerPoint 2016. There are times where you have different presentations that you have prepared from another business project and such, and you could use the content from those presentations. To insert slides in a presentation, you can simply go here under the Home tab, and then we go somewhere within our presentation where we want to import those new slides. And then we go under New Slide here, we click on this little arrow here in the bottom, and then scroll all the way to the bottom here where it says reuse slides. Now notice here it's asking us where do we want to get the slides from. So we can simply go here under browse and then go to a file in your computer. And let's suppose you want to import from this one the guidelines on using PowerPoint. Click on it and then simply pick the slides that you want to import. Now notice there is also an option here for keeping the source formatting. What that does is it basically brings the slide just like it was, just like it looked in the previous presentation instead of adapting it to the theme that you're currently using, to the design that you're currently using currently on this presentation. So in this case we can simply click on it. Click on the slides that you want. And basically the system is going to import and try to adjust the content accordingly for your presentation, for the presentation that you're currently using according to that theme. Once you're done, you can simply either select another presentation from another one that you're utilizing, or you can simply close it and then come back to your presentation and tweak it further to your liking. And this is much easier rather than copying and pasting objects or content manually. In this brief session, we are going to learn how to insert additional objects in our presentation to enhance our presentation. So supposedly we have our presentation here, I have the outline, I have the various components for this presentation. Now I want to insert objects in, our, in the current slide. So what I would suggest that you do is go here under the Insert tab and notice that you have a whole bunch of objects here that you can insert. By the way, the process for inserting an object and tweaking it, it's pretty much the same for any of those. First, if you wanted to insert a new slide, notice that this option it's also it was on the Home tab and it's also here on the Insert tab. All you'd have to do if you wanted to insert a new slide, just click on it and we learned that earlier as well and we have the content for that particular slide. Now the next thing that's learned here is how to insert pictures. Inserting pictures, this option here, it's for pictures located in your computer. So in this case, we click on pictures and then locate the picture wherever it is in your computer and then click on insert. When you insert it, then notice automatically the design ideas option comes up 
and then we can pick a design from here and we learned about this earlier now notice when you're working with images and this is a very cool feature and this was implemented in office 2007 and on notice that for any of those objects if you click on the object or the picture notice you have those tools that show up and these are referred to as the contextual tools the tools that are displayed in the context of what we are doing so if we are not tinkering here with the image notice that disappears if we click on on the image notice we have this new set of tools for the actual picture notice that we have picture styles and we have all kinds of other ways to manipulate this object the idea here is that you can apply styles to any of the objects here in the presentation to apply a style here you can simply select or highlight or uh, just hold the mouse on any of those it will give you the live preview here notice there are additional options here and pick any of those designs from here now once you have chosen a particular design notice that you can come back here under the format tab for this object for this picture and you can change additional items here so let's say you don't like an outline for it let's say you want to change the effects as far as whether you want shadow and uh, and such or three-dimensional uh, components you can all tweak it from here if you wanted to adjust the, this object as far as the three-dimensional view for it you can simply select it from here additionally you can crop this picture and if you had multiple pictures you can also bring this picture forward or send it back as well and manipulate the positioning of that particular picture so the idea here is is that uh, you are selecting an object and then you are looking at the tools available at your disposal for manipulating this object next we're going to learn how to insert pictures from the web In this brief session, I'm going to demonstrate how to insert objects or pictures from the web or from the internet using PowerPoint 2016 to enhance our presentation. So we go here under the insert tab. Let's say that I wanted to insert another object here from the web. We can go here under the online pictures and now it gives us a choice to search Bing. Simply type the word and then it basically is going to search the web automatically so also as you are utilizing images from the web you need to be uh, cautious of copyright and such so keep that in mind and you can control that by using either all images or specific images of creative commons only you can also notice that you can uh, customize here images of particular whether you want them transparent or white or specific color here and even the types here for example transparent and then the size as well once you have determined which image you prefer then click on the image and then click on insert once you insert the image in your presentation notice that uh, design ideas it will come up automatically and it's going to present us with a new design or suggest designs that we could utilize for all the components that we have in this slide at this point so we could pick this design or this particular one or some other design that you might prefer from here so once you have uh, selected one of those designs from design ideas then simply click on it and then you can utilize the tools that i covered earlier here on uh, manipulating and tweaking this image or this object in your presentation next we'll cover how to insert shapes and various other components here in our presentation in our specific slide in this session i'm going to briefly cover how to use smart art in powerpoint 2016. smart art is a range of graphics and lists and process diagrams that you can utilize to express an idea or a concept instead of just presenting text in your slides and this is a newer concept uh, starting with the later versions of PowerPoint 
So what you basically can do instead of having a PowerPoint that has, for example, the continuous improvement process where you say, okay, plan, do, check, and act, you can represent this in a more visually appealing way. So there are two ways to do this. You can either create the smart art as you are inserting the content in a new slide, or you can convert existing content into smart art. Let me demonstrate the first option here. So if we go here and we click on insert and then a new slide, and let's say I want to have the continuous. So in my case here, what we could do then next is we can go under insert and then choose smart art. Under smart art, notice that you have all of these different designs. So this is a listing of all of those designs that exist currently in this version of PowerPoint. So let's say this is what you'd prefer and then pretty much pick one of those designs from here and then click on add. And now notice here on the left, we are presented with the options uh, of what we want to enter here. So if we wanted to put the words, now in our case, the first step is planning, do, check what you did, and then act on it. Now notice that we have an extra option here that doesn't fit for our idea or our design. In our case, we simply press backspace here and now notice it's readjusting the whole layout or the whole design automatically. And that's why it's referred to as smart art because it kind of self adjusts depending on how many components you might have added. In some cases, you may not have this area for typing the content. In that case, you can either type the content directly on the box here, or you can bring this listing where you can type content by simply utilizing this little arrow here on the left hand side. Now, just like with images and other objects here in, in PowerPoint, you can, to tweak this further, you can simply click on this object and notice we have two different tabs here for the smart art tools. We have the design tab and the format tab. Under the design tab, you can change the layout. If you don't like this layout or you prefer something else, you can simply pick something else that you'd prefer. Notice you can change the colors for this. And then you can apply even additional smart art styles and make this three dimensional and such. This is much more effective than having just something like this in your presentation. Now in the cases where you have the outline and you have the content already here typed, in this case, you don't really need to delete this content. You can convert the existing layout of a slide into smart art. In this case, so you want to right click anywhere where the bulleted list is and then choose convert to smart art. And then pretty much pick one of those designs that you'd prefer. If none of those designs fits your needs here or it doesn't uh, look like what you want, then you can click here on more smart art graphics and then go under, for example, the cycle here and then pick something that works in your case. And then customize this to your liking by whether changing the colors or changing however you want to change those components. So those are the two methods of uh, creating and using smart art from scratch and also converting an existing slide into smart art. And next here, we are going to go into inserting charts. So stay tuned for the next session. In this session, we're going to learn how to insert charts in PowerPoint 2016, how to utilize charts and customize charts in PowerPoint 2016. So supposedly we have a presentation very similar to this and we have a new slide here and we want to insert charts. To insert charts, you'd simply go under insert here. So you'd stay on the slide that you want to insert the chart. Then under insert, click on chart. And then you pick uh, first pick the type of chart that you'd prefer to insert into your presentation and then click OK.
Now the next thing here is, is that it will actually open a worksheet very similar from Excel and notice it gives you some data here already. So you could have, for example, the monthly sales or whatever it may be, uh, the data that you are utilizing. And in our case here, let's assume that these are the quarters. So for example, we have quarter one, quarter two, quarter three sales, and then we have the categories here, tablets, desktops, mobile phones, and such. And these, let's say they are into millions or whatever the case might be. Then you would basically update the, this data from here. So let's say that was 4.5 million or whatever it may be the case. Just change those numbers and notice it gives you a preview of what the data is going to look like. Now notice that there is a blue line here in the bottom. This is what controls what shows up on your chart. So you can simply drag this to the left and now notice our chart. It's going to look differently automatically here. If we drag it to include, let's say, desktops as well, then it will readjust automatically. So just keep in mind that this dot here in the bottom right, if you hold the mouse on it, you can adjust the data from there. Now, once you have the data there, now once you have the data entered and customized or picked up here, so let me go back, then we close the data here, and now we have our chart. Now, if we click on our chart, notice that we have two tabs here on the top. You have the design tab and the formatting tab. The formatting, of course, you can see the options here and the formatting the content of the components here. The next one is to change the uh, design for this chart. Now, notice that you have different layouts that you can apply here, like uh, include the title, the legend and such and the placement of the legend and such and the chart. So I'll suggest you play with these options here. The next thing is that you can change the colors again, just like with other objects that we have covered earlier, you can apply and change the colors and such and the design and so on. So you'd pick the design that works best for your presentation here and Note also that you can actually click on any of those objects. So let's say you don't like this specific color, the font or whatever it may be. You can go here under the format tab and then change the to fill this with a different color that you might prefer. If you wanted to select different data to go back to your data selection, notice your option is right here under select data. And then if you wanted to change the chart type, you'd simply click on change chart type here and then pick something different that might work best for you. That's how, in a nutshell, how you can utilize charts in PowerPoint 2016. In this session, we are going to learn how to insert shapes and various uh, objects in a slide in our presentation. We have some bullets here, bullet lists. We have a couple other objects, but let's say that we wanted to insert here some kind of arrow or some kind of other additional component to make this a little bit fancier. So what we do here is we go under shapes and then we simply select the object that we would prefer. Now notice as soon as I click on the object here, the mouse changes to a plus. Now what you have to do with shapes is that you have to hold down your mouse and then draw basically the object that you would prefer to customize. Now notice here, just like with other objects that we inserted already here in our presentation or on this slide, we have a variety of tools for formatting this, whether we want to change the style of this or the design of this object that we just inserted. Notice the color, the shape, all kinds of additional options here, the 3D options and such. And also notice that you can edit it. If you changed your mind and you want to use a different shape, you can simply pick something different and then it's going to be customized. Now notice you can also, of course, resize this. You can rotate it from here and change it to however it works best for your design.
In this session, I'll demonstrate how to insert video multimedia into slides in your presentation. And I'll show three various options, one from the computer itself, when you have the video on your PC. Then I'll uh, demonstrate how to insert the video from online, from YouTube or some other location online, and then also how to embed a video onto a slide in your presentation using embedding codes from another website. First, let's say that we want to insert a video in this slide. We go here under insert and then we go under video and then we're going to pick the video from my PC. Now, of course, this is kind of the lesser used options out there because there's so much on the web nowadays that you can link to and such. But just for the sake of demonstrating, let's do this. So you locate wherever your video is on your local PC and then click on insert. Now at this point you can resize it. So this is how large it's going to be. This is how big it's going to be. And then you can click here on the playback option and then choose how you want this video to play. So when it reaches to this slide, when you're presenting this presentation, you want to know how you'll play it. So right now it is on click. If you want it so it starts automatically when it reaches this page, then you can do that by simply clicking automatically. And notice also the other options. So now if I wanted to present this, I'm doing it on click, all I have to do is either press F5 on my keyboard or go here to under present slideshow and then I'll click on it and it'll start playing. Now to stop it, I'm clicking on it again. To exit of the play mode here, press escape and then we are back to the video. Now let's learn how to insert the video from the web. So I'm going to insert a new slide here. And then we go here under insert and then we go under video and then we choose online video. Notice we have two options here. We have the YouTube option and also embed it from another website. We want to search from YouTube. So for example, Word 2016. And here is a bunch of videos here on Microsoft Word. Let's say we want to insert one of those tutorials in there, or let's say we want this Excel tutorial, Excel in 30 minutes. Click on insert here, then resize it, how big you want this to be displayed when it's presented. And then go under playback, very similar to what we did earlier. And then you can click on to start automatically or to start on click. And now if I go and present this, this video, when I click on it, it's going to be streamed automatically from YouTube. Of course, you'll need internet connection for that Hi, to take place. Excel, and welcome to Excel in 30 minutes. So that's how inserting videos from the web works. Now let's learn how to insert a video by using embed codes. Now, of course, uh, there is not really a lot of use for this because you can search YouTube this way. But let's suppose there is a website out there that gives you the codes, how to embed the video and that. And I'll demonstrate it by using YouTube. So let's say we have here this video from YouTube. And then we go here under share and then embed. Now this is the embed code for this. Now it could be another website that gives you that code and provides you the code like for example TED Talks and, and such or Khan Academy and such. All you have to do is copy the code from wherever you're copying it and then go back to your presentation and then click on insert then go under video and then click on online video and then embed the code right here. and then click on insert and there it is now you can control how this will play back from this option and then when you can go and present this by clicking on it so these are three different ways that you can utilize video in your slides in your presentation and also how to customize play the playback for those videos
In this session, I'll demonstrate how to insert audio in your presentation. Of course, select one of the slides where you want to insert your audio, where you want to start, and then click on Insert, and then go under Audio, and then Audio on my PC. Then locate your audio file, and then go under Playback here, and then choose how you want to play this audio file. You can relocate this, move this somewhere else, by the way, on your presentation here so that the icon does not show up. And you can choose to hide the icon and also you can choose how this it'll play. You can have it play automatically. And by the way, you can click on the icon here to get those playback tools here. And also it can play across all the slides. So if you're doing a presentation where you're, you're not actually presenting, but there are pictures or there's content being displayed and automatically it's rotating and that type of thing, you might want to put sound on the first slide and then click on a play across all the slides. And you can choose also play until it's stopped. So it loops around. And then now if we were to test this, at this point, I have it so you click on it, but uh, we can have checked it so it starts automatically. And then it'll just keep on playing from slide to slide to slide. And notice it just keeps on playing. Now, if we go back and we want to customize it, of course, go and locate it on which slide we started. Click on the audio file here and then go under playback and change the properties for this. And that's how this works in the presentation. Now, in some cases as well, what you can do to insert audio, you can also insert the audio by, so I'm going to a different slide here. You can actually record your own audio segment or uh, section for a particular function to explain a concept. So it'll be pre-recorded basically, or you could have somebody else do the recording. But uh, the key here is that you can record this from within PowerPoint without any additional tools. So in this case, you click on record audio and then simply press record here. And anything that you say, it'll actually be captured and it will be a sound file embedded into your presentation. In this case, this is where it is. And if I pre present this and click on it, it will be a sound file embedded into your presentation. And that's how the recording works of your own audio file. So you have here so far the inserting from a file from a PC or inserting your own recording in your slide in your presentation and also controlling how that audio file will play. Next, we're going to go under uh, screen recording. Uh, this is a new feature in PowerPoint 2016 that uh, you can capture a portion of the screen and insert it in your slides. So stay tuned for that. In this session, I'll demonstrate how to capture a portion of your screen, record whatever you're saying and doing on that screen at that particular point in time, and have that clip automatically embedded into a slide into PowerPoint. So here's how it works. So let's say we have a slide here that we want to have a, a concept demonstrated with a narration and all that type of thing. We go into the slide and then we click on screen recording. Now at this point, we go and open the application where we want to record. So let's say this is the application and then also we select the area that we want to capture. So click on select area and then simply draw around the area where you want to record. Now, in this case, all you have to do is pretty much press record here. And then once you press record, note the key combination that you have to press in order to stop the recording. By the way, that's kind of a little tricky but uh, that's what you have to do. It is uh, the Windows key, Shift, and then Q. So click on Record, and notice it, pre it says press Logo, Shift, and Q to stop recording. Now, I can basically uh, guide the user, so I can give direction on how something works. For example, if I want to 
point somebody to my YouTube channel and such or to some website, I can simply capture all this recording along with the directions of whatever I say. So let's say go to youtube.com forward slash Escaselli and then hit enter and from there you'll be accessing whatever you want them to access. By the way, now it's capturing all my audio, whatever I'm saying, along with whatever I have here on that I'm scrolling in this selection. Now I press the Windows key, Shift, and then Q, and then return to my PowerPoint. And notice it has been placed automatically into my slide. And now this is just like another video that we covered earlier. You can resize this. You can control the playback if you wanted to. And then, notice you can do it full screen as well. And then if we were to present this using a 5 key or whatever, now when I click on it, as logo, shift, and Q to stop recording. Notice it captured all that I said earlier. The user so I can give direction on. So that's how you insert video captures or, or screen captures within a slide in presentations and you are recording those on your own. In this session I'm going to focus a little bit on transitions using transitions in PowerPoint 2016. So supposedly we have a PowerPoint or presentation very similar to this and we want to change the transitions from one slide to the other. Now obviously you don't want to overdo it uh, because the attention needs to be on the message that you are conveying to your audience rather than the way you're doing transitions but yet you want to make it appealing as well. By default you don't have any transitions set. So for example from this slide to the next if we go to present this it will just bring up the next component here. Now what you can do is you can change it so that if let's say I'm here at this slide and now when I change to the next one I want the slide so it pushes up. So click on it and it'll be presented like that and then when it goes to the next slide it'll be transitioned a certain other way. So you want to keep a balance of course between the two. So now if I go to the previous item here and I present this Now this slide is going up and the next one is simply presented. A cool feature in PowerPoint 2016 is also the morph feature here. Morph, it's new with the latest updates. As long as you have the latest PowerPoint 2016 updates, that feature should be there. If you don't have it there, that means that you don't have all the latest updates for PowerPoint 2016. The way it works is it's actually pretty cool. You can take, for example, a slide, duplicate it. And by the way, this is how you duplicate a slide, right? Click on it and then choose duplicate slide. And then go to this next slide here and you can change something on it. So let's say on the first, uh, when you're presenting this particular slide, you want it to be presented this way. But then when they go to the next slide, you want to take away, for example, number two here item 2. And let's assume that you modified it basically. So what you can do at this point is you can choose the option under uh, transitions to morph it. And I'll show you in a moment as to what this does. So it's going to morph from one form into some other form that you tweaked it into. In our case now if we were to preview this you can just simply click here on slide show and this is how the first slide will appear just like typically but when I go to the next slide notice how it does the animation so that those two items are adjusted keeping in, in mind the change that took place from the first slide to the second copy of it that we made so basically again to, for me to summarize this or to do this again I'm going to delete it for a moment here. I want to duplicate this first 
And now let's say there are four steps for the next slide. So I want to add a fourth step here. So notice from this, we had only three steps. Now we have four. And this fourth one here, and if you remember, you can go here under design and choose design ideas and change this however you want as well. So notice it gives you some ideas as to how to change this. So you simply click on another design format. And let's say I like this one. And by the way, ref refer to the design ideas video on how to use the design ideas thing. But basically, we had three stages here with the original slide. We made a copy of it. We added four steps to it. And now for the original slide here, we go and apply the transition, the morph transition here. And now if we go and play this to present it, notice we have three steps and you can go over these. You can even animate the objects one by one, like using animation that I'll cover shortly. But now when we move to the next slide, notice it shifts things around and it, it makes it more presentable and more appealing as well to the audience. So you have that kind of animation from one slide to the other. So watch the video again. It's basically you have to duplicate it. That's the trick. Duplicate an existing slide, add new content to the next slide, and then the system will animate or change the morphing the changes into animation and presenting it in a nice way. Remember to also use under the design tab, use the design ideas option here. Now, obviously you can use additional animations here. You have those as well. And remember that you can utilize here other effects as well. In this session, I'll demonstrate the concept of using animation for various objects within a slide in a presentation. Any of the objects in a slide can be animated so that whenever you click on the space bar or the mouse click or clicker, those objects can be presented one at a time or multiple units at a time, multiple objects at a time. It can be animation of um, pictures of um, uh, shapes, it could be animation of regular text and such. To animate bullet lists, as you go here under animation, click on the bulleted list, and then the easiest would be to choose what you want the animation to be. For example, here we want to apply the appear animation. And those will appear one at a time. So notice one, two, three here, these numbers mean that they will come one after the other once we click on them. To test this, notice we click on slideshow and those objects here we did not apply animation yet and therefore they come in with a slide when it's presented. Now those items, notice they come one at a time after I click on it. To customize this even further, what I would suggest that you try is uh, actually click on the animation pane option right here and notice it shows the items that were animated earlier. Now notice it's a little double arrow here. You can expand the contents and it says that that's number one over here. This is number two. That's number three. Now here, notice you have, you can start this. It says start on click. That's what these numbers one, two, three are. Start on click, start on click and such. If we wanted number two here to come at the same time, to be presented at the same time as number one, all you'd have to do is click on the drop down here on the right and then choose start with the previous. Now notice those two will start together because it's one and one and then the next one, it'll come by itself. If I present it, notice I'm pressing space bar once here, the two came together and then the third one by itself. Now you can add animation to any of the other objects that I mentioned earlier. You can, let's say, add here for the PowerPoint image here. You can simply click on add animation and then choose to appear or however you want the animation to be shown. 
However, keep in mind not to overdo animation when you're doing a presentation. The point is the message that you're conveying. Let's say that I want this picture because right now it's going to come as number three. It's going to be presented as number three. If I want it to come together with these two items here, what you'll do is drag this here where it says number three, picture three. And notice if you click on it, it highlights it. Drag it to wherever you want it on the previous sequence. Then click on the drop down here and choose to start with the previous. That means that the, all these three items here, these three objects, which would be this, this, and the picture, they'll be presented at the same time. So if I go and present this at this point here, notice all three were presented at the same time. Then you can do the same thing for these other objects. So I can click here on this other object, click on add animation, choose however you want this animation to appear, and then choose the order of it as well. So the same thing for the shape here as well, choose animation, however you want it to appear. If you want two objects again to come together, just click on the drop down, choose to come with the previous, or you can have it timed, or you can have advanced effects and options as well. So you could say you want a specific kind of sound to be appearing, that kind of animation, and, and uh, after the animation, what should happen? Uh, as far as the timing, should it be on a click or should it be delayed after so many seconds? And then the text, how should it be displayed there? So it's a lot of customizations that you can do to the actual animation of the objects here. So for now, I'm going to do it to start with the previous. And now notice uh, they will start the text here, the two items will come together along with the picture down here. Notice they are all number one, number two, this text alone, and then these other two images will come together. So here's how it looks. Now, in the cases where you have smart art, and smart art is this type of uh, art like this, it's Pretty similar, but there is one difference to it. So you go under animations and then you click on animation pane and then you add some kind of animation to these objects. Now notice the whole object here is selected. The whole smart art is selected. You click on add animation and pick any of those animations that you prefer. It doesn't matter. Just don't make it too much. Let's say we want to appear and now notice here under the animation option, there are the effect options as well, because by default, if I play it right now without doing anything else, it's just going to present it. It's going to appear separately, but we can customize it so each one of those items can come separately. And the way you do that is by clicking on the effect options and then choose one at a time. And now what will happen here is, is that these items plan, do, check, and act will be presented at different sequences uh, one at a time. So if I go and present this and test it, notice you could go and talk about the continuous improvement process. You have the planning stage, you have the doing part of it, then the checking, and then acting on it, and, and so on. So it's more effective when you're using this type of bringing each step at separate times by using the smart art. And again, the trick there was after you apply the smart art to it, you have this effect button here that you can pick. If you're doing a presentation, a very fancy presentation, you would want to spend quite a bit of time on each object here. It needs to be thought well and it needs to, it's time consuming. That's why initially, as we were learning about PowerPoint, I was emphasizing doing the outline of the PowerPoint first. In this session, I will demonstrate some of the features that are a little bit more advanced related to PowerPoint 2016. However, it is time consuming, as you will see. So let's suppose that you have a PowerPoint very similar to this. You're using built-in blocks basically to explain a concept. So for example, 
in education you have the traditional form of education then you have hybrid learning then you have competency-based education and then within those then you have different methods of teaching for example synchronous or inquiry based or project based and then action based and challenge based education so the question would be how can we build something very similar to this and what's involved in designing something similar to this and how is the animation and all this stuff designed you can do it a variety of ways but it's going to take a little time to design it so i'm going to try to explain the concepts as to how this is designed or how it works it's designed by using a bunch of methods for example the grouping and up ungrouping of objects the using of shapes and using of text boxes and then bundling the text boxes with shapes by using the group and ungroup option and then also adjusting the animation within these objects. To insert the object, so let's say we start with a Lego piece and we can go here under insert and then click on online pictures and then Lego. It's going to search Bing. And now at this point, you can uh, navigate here and pick something that would be in the angle that you would prefer. For example, this one or this one or whatever the angle that you prefer here. And uh, you can also use these tools here under the type. For example, you want something that is transparent background. In that way, it's not going to overlap with other images and other components there. And now notice we have one piece of the Lego here. It's coming up with the design ideas here. That's for another time. We have covered that as well. But And you can refer to the video on design ideas or the designer mode in PowerPoint. Now, the next thing that I would suggest that you do is you can click on it and right click on it again and then copy it and then right click somewhere else and then paste it. So we are basically just making a copy of the exact image that we had in the first object here. Now, once we copy this, we can move it to the left here. Notice they kind of will change slightly. And then at this point, notice that it's kind of overlapping with the first one. In this case, and the concept here is, is that you can actually then change this so that it goes to the back. You're moving either bring this one to the front or send this to the back and the way you do that is by using these tools here on the top where it says format and it says send backward or bring forward or you can right click and choose send to back now notice when i chose send to back it kind of lined up perfectly here and it's one after the other you could do the same thing now we can copy this image here and then go somewhere else and then choose paste. Now we can drag it and line it up here and then choose to send this back as well. Now notice they are all lined up. Copy it again and then go over here and then choose paste. And now if we wanted to kind of build it in between here, notice we just stack it on top of it and it's properly set. Then copy it one more time and then paste it again now we are going to move it let's say over here another one and notice you can kind of stack it backwards a little bit or just leave it up a little bit however it makes more sense for you so as if it's not sitting properly there now copy it one more time and then paste it and then notice you can stack on top of the next one so that's how that part of it works. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can select either one of those objects here and double click on them and notice it's going to bring up the formatting tool here. Now, under format, in most cases, you can go and change the color from here from the color tools. However, in this case, we'd have to go here under the picture because it's actually an image that we copied from the web and we can go and pick a different color for that specific one. So notice this bottom one, now it's in black. And then if we wanted this next one here in a different color, we go under color and then simply pick the orange color. Then over here, pick something else. And basically you're tweaking the color for each one of those options here. So now you're customizing these to what you want. 
Now the next thing that you might want to do is, is that you're building blocks for whatever the case might be. So earlier I had, for example, um, education there or traditional education and hybrid learning. Click on insert and then choose a text box. So you want to put a text box right on top of this area right there. So you click here traditional. Now notice the text there, it's kind of black on red, it's not going to be very easy to see, so we can change that to white. Now notice also that the text there does not properly line up, so what you might want to do is you might want to rotate it a little bit so it kind of matches the direction of our their Lego piece. And then, now in this case, we want to put in there the word hybrid learning. The easiest would be click on the existing text box that you created earlier, copy it, control C, and then simply paste it, control V. Notice it's going to stack it on top of the existing one and then drag, uh, drag it to the next area. In that way, it's going to be exactly the same direction and the same angle. So now we can change this to hybrid. And the next option here, you can uh, do that, the same thing in there, control V again, paste it, and then drag it here, and do competency. Competency-based education. And then here you could have the different uh, methods of learning. So let's say we have here, and whatever the point is that you're trying to make. So you're just copying and pasting against these text boxes. Now, if we go ahead and play this presentation, we have not applied any animation at this point. So everything is going to be presented all in one piece. So you basically need to select the text component here and the piece of the Lego and then right click on them and you want to group them together. Then once you have grouped them together, you want to add animation by clicking here on animation and then choosing a certain type of animation that you want to apply to it. Now it's also advisable that I would advise that you enable here the animation pane as well. And then you have here the animation of those objects. So when displayed, they'll show up like this. Notice it's missing that part there. So now we want to do the uh, the grouping for the other ones as well. So uh, the best what I'd suggest is that you, you start from the top here and then you move down to the other items. Otherwise it will change the order how they appear here. So and you can play with this option, whatever works best. It will depend on the design that you have. And if it's not slanted like this, then it will be much easier for you. So I'm going to click on it and I'm going to group those two together. Then I'm going to go to the next one here. I'm going to click on these. I'm going to group these as well. Then I'm going to go to the next one here. I'm holding down the control key, by the way, to select the right item here. When I'm selecting more than one, then I'm going to choose group. Then I'm going to go to the next thing here, competency, hold down the control key, select the proper box for it, right click, choose group. Then I'm going to go to the next one here. So now that we have selected them, now we want to apply animation to them. So we click here under the animation. We make sure the animation pane has been enabled by clicking right here and then choose animation. And then we want that to appear. Then we click on the next section here. Make sure you're selecting the right one. Choose add animation. Then you go to the next one, add animation. And then you choose whichever order you want. So if you want to start from here, you click on this, choose add animation, choose to have it appear. Then you go to the next one and then choose add animation. You can have it so it floats in, it flies in or whatever you want to do. And then the top one, you could have it uh, utilize a specific animation as well. Now, if we were to play this, so remember, we started from one piece of Lego, we added the text, we sorted them out, we brought it forward and backward and all that type of stuff. 
But now if we want to play this and present it, notice how they'll come up. So you have the text here first, then you click on the mouse, it tell, you can talk about the traditional way of education, then you can have the hybrid type of education, including online education, then you have competency-based education, and then let's say the different methods for synchronous, inquiry-based education, and then you're talking about traditional or whatever it is, that feedback or whatever you, this would be. If you need to change that to say something else, you could change it to simply put, just double click on it and say, post in there for something else. And now if you replay it, it has been updated. So that is how it works by using an image, customizing it, adding text components to it, bundling them together using the group option, and then applying animation to each individual object. Now, the other method what you could utilize is, uh, in some cases, it would be, for example, pieces of a puzzle. And we'll add a new slide here, and let's say you can do exactly the same thing for that as well. So you can go to the web here, you can insert from online pictures, and then and you can do that with any other images as well. Just bring them back together, uh, find them, locate them, and all that type of thing, and then... Uh, add them together or bundle them together and by grouping them. So here you can pick any of those pieces of the puzzle. You could theoretically use one of those, however you can't, unfortunately you cannot unbundle them. So you need to pick something that is a single piece and then you want to add it. And let's say this one, you want to pick a piece that actually it will kind of fit, so this end will fit into that. So pick the proper piece there, click on insert. And now once you insert that piece, you want to resize it to the size that potentially you use it for your presentation. So now here is one. Now you can right click on it, choose copy, right click again, choose paste. Now, notice we have two pieces of them, so you can take that and put it right next to each other. And then copy this, and then paste it, copy, paste it. And then this one, what you could use is you can rotate it this way, if you want, and then you can connect it with this piece over here. Then the next thing that you'd want to do is, uh, let's say this one is sticking out, you can actually crop that by clicking on crop here on the top and simply cut that piece out. Click on crop again. Now is it perfect? Probably not, but it gives the idea. Now you could go in here to each one of those pieces and you can uh, simply change the color. So double click on it, go under color, and then pick something else that you might want. Double click again. Let's say the pieces of online education. You want to have quality instruction, you have to have proper instructor training, you want to have compliance, and such. So in this case what you do is you click on insert here, you want to do a text box and you say quality. You could tweak it so that it shows a certain way and then you want to copy this. So basically you're changing the text here for each uh, component and then now you click on the text, click on the piece of the puzzle here and then right click on it and choose. And you want to go here under the picture tools and you can go under arrange and then choose to group them together. And you do the grouping basically for each one of them accordingly and I'm holding down the control key so you have to select more than one item to group them. You can go under arrange or group or right click once you have selected them and group like we did earlier. Now they are grouped together, you can select each one of them, let's say you want to start with this first one, then you go here under animations, add an animation, appear, and that first one it will appear. The next one you can choose a certain type of animation, fly in, the third one as well, and the fourth one, 
you can further customize the animation here for each one of them so that they float in for a certain direction. Now if we go to present this, we have the title of the slide. Then we are presenting that the online education is, uh, should be based on quality and focus on quality, then focus on training, focus on compliance, and the focus on technology. And uh, you can keep on building this to your liking. So uh, this hopefully gives you an idea as to how to customize this further and how to add from one single object, build the concept. If you go here under insert and you go under shapes, you really could build this even further. Or let's say I want to have this as the background for this. And then you can choose to send this to the back by right clicking, sending it to the back. And then you could say that this is the platform or the online environment or whatever it may be that you're building this. And even this component, you can further customize it by either adding additional shapes and forms and such and arrows and all kinds of other objects and bundling them together or you could simply go and reformat this by going under the format options here and customizing it further from here. So it's uh, very powerful in how you can customize and tweak objects within the slides in your presentation to make a fancy presentation there for your audience. And of course, do not forget to use smart art as well. And that has been covered in another video in PowerPoint 2016. In this session, I'll demonstrate how to narrate a presentation in PowerPoint 2016. Narrating a PowerPoint is actually a helpful feature, particularly if you're a faculty member or a student who has to put together a presentation and you want to send the presentation to the audience, either for later viewing or for somebody to present it on your behalf. And you can go through the slides and add your audio along with the presentation. And all they have to do is start presenting it and then the audio will play automatically. So here's how it works. You go, you have your presentation, of course, and then you go under slideshow and then you click on record slideshow. Now you can record the animation and the timings and such that is already in the slides and any of the narrations and ink and such, you can choose to record those as well. Click on start recording. And now anything that I say or I do, it's actually being captured. So now you'd normally speak like as if you were presenting it in class and then press the, either the mouse button or the space bar on the keyboard and move to the next slide and just basically explain all the components that you'd be explaining with the audience and then just keep on going from slide to slide. Now the system will remember the timings or how long you stayed on each item here and it will play them automatically and just keep on going. Now, even in the cases where you have a video, it's going to capture that video as well. So you get the idea at this point. Now, in these cases, notice there is also a different set of tools here as well that you can utilize during your presentation. In the bottom here, there is this little pencil icon. So what you can do is click on that little pencil, choose pen, and then as you are speaking and, and uh, narrating, you can actually write on the screen, even if you don't have a touch screen device that you're presenting with. And then basically notice you go back here to the bottom again. And if you want to use the highlighter option, you can highlight stuff using the mouse. And all of this is being captured. Obviously you can change the colors here and if you want to erase stuff, you can simply choose the eraser option from the bottom. Even if you want to use a laser pointer option, laser pointer is basically by you pointing, it's going to capture this red dot as you move it on the screen. Now to move to the next slide, you just use the space bar on the keyboard or the arrows on your keyboard. To move to the standard option, so you're not no longer writing on the screen, you can press the escape key on your keyboard 
and then it will still keep on moving just like as if you never touched the annotation feature in PowerPoint. So you'd go through the whole slideshow and then it's done. It's Once it reaches the end, all of those recordings have been captured. So now what you can do is you can go ahead and present it and now it will have all that audio automatically playing in the background. Start, start recording. recording. And now, and now anything, anything that, that I say or I do, I do it's actually, actually being captured. captured. Class, either, either the, the mouse, mouse button, button or the space. So you can see that that played and it worked correctly. So now all the audio and all that uh, we did and uh, clicked and moved and uh, animations and everything has been embedded into that PowerPoint. One key to remember here though is that uh, the viewer on the other end, they need to, in order to listen to the audio, they need to click on the slideshow, they need to pr start presenting it, and that's when the stuff will play automatically. All the recording and the content that you did will take place automatically. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to customize the Slide Master in a presentation in PowerPoint 2016. The reason for customizing the Slide Master is because there are times where you have a presentation very similar to this, but you want to change or add a component like a logo or something you want to add it in, on all slides in your presentation. And instead of you having to go through each one of the slides, you can change it in one location and that logo or that component will be repeated across all the slides of the same kind in your presentation. So here's how you do it. So we can go to any of the slides here, it doesn't matter which one it is. And then we go here under View. And then notice there's an option here for Slide Master. So basically the way it works is that if you go and add something, it, it works basically on the type of slide that you're using. Right now this is a called a content slide. You have the title for it, but then you have all these bullet levels and all this stuff. Let's say that I wanted to change the font here for this type of slide. Well, I could go under Home and then change it to a different type of font there. So let's say I wanted the Arial. And let's say I want it larger a little bit. So notice it's changing all of those levels and you could even change the color. Now let's say that, that you wanted these bullets here to be a different color. Well, you could go and change them by choose bullets and numbering and basically just tinker with those little options here. Click OK. Now any slides that use this type of layout, this kind of slide, it'll be updated. So if I go here under Slide Master and I choose Close Slide Master View, now notice that my bullets have changed to red on all of those and also the type of font has changed as well across all the slides of the same kind. Now let's go back here under View and let's add a logo for example. I copied the logo, you can just copy any image, just right click on it, choose copy from the web or wherever you're copying it from. But if I go here under view again and then go to slide master again, now I want to add the logo on any of those slides that have the title and uh, the content here. Now I'll right click and choose paste. And here is, let's say, my logo. And let's say I want this always to be in the bottom left. Now let's say that I have also other slides. I want it on all kinds of slides. Let's say if I want it on the title slide, I could put it in here. This is for the title style. Then this is for the this type of layout. So I can right click, paste it there as well. Again, the idea here is that, is that you are embedding, you're changing the slides of the same kind or the same layout. And you could keep on doing this if you needed to. And close it. Now, all my slides, notice they have the logo in the bottom. 
you could also go back and customize this as make it as fancy as you want and uh, add let's say for all of those slides here I want to add let's say a text field insert here text box and I can go here on the bottom and say tweak it how you want it format the font accordingly and then you can simply copy this and embed it into the other kinds of slides. Then go back under Slide Master tab, click on Close, and notice this will be displayed on all the slides. So it's a very powerful feature to save you time. In this brief video, I'll demonstrate how to use slideshow timings in PowerPoint 2016. There might be cases where you developed a PowerPoint presentation and you want the slides, whether it's pictures or the slides, to play automatically without any interaction. So the way you do that is by going through the slideshow here and then recording the timings for each slide. If you're going to utilize something like this, what I'd suggest is, is that you embed sound in that presentation as well. Just check the video on inserting audio and sound in your presentation. So in my case here, I have right here at the bottom of this, I have a, a sound file and the playback for this has been configured so it runs automatically and it'll play across all the slides. Now to record the timings for it or to rehearse the timings, what we can do is we can click here on slideshow and then choose rehearse timings. Now notice it's playing and now I'm going to keep it for so long on, on this slide. Now I, I go to the next slide, next, and notice it's recording the time up here, how many seconds it needs to stay on this slide. Then you press escape or you go all the way through the slideshow all the way to the end. And then it says the total time for this slide was 25 seconds. Do you want to save the new slide timing? So you say yes. And then at any point that you want to play this, let's say in the future, whenever you want to do this, you can click on um, slideshow here. You can choose uh, use timings or you can choose set up a new slideshow. So the new slide show you would say, okay, it's presented full screen, loop continuously until somebody presses escape and advance using timings automatically. So basically whenever you're using timings, you also need to use the setup slide show here and then click OK. Click on from beginning. That's what the presenter will do. And now all of this stuff, it's going to play automatically. Now notice it doesn't have any of the audio that you might have chosen to do. If you wanted audio, you'd have to use the record option. So that's how timing the slides and rehearsing the timings works in PowerPoint 2016. It's actually very similar to previous versions as well. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to utilize notes and embed those notes in individual slides in your presentations. These notes could be utilized by you when you're presenting by printing them out, or you could use what's called the presentation view in PowerPoint where uh, you can actually read those notes similar to like a teleprompter. So to insert notes, basically what you need to do is go into each slide here and notice there is this option here in the bottom, it says notes. Click on it and you can move this further up as well if you want it and then just type your content in there for your presentation. So if whatever your script is going to be for that particular slide, you enter those notes 
in each one of those slides. So you'd go to the next slide here and insert the content. Keep in mind also that notes can be formatted so you can make the font bold and such and make it uh, a certain keywords stand out by highlighting them and making them larger and all that type of thing. So now those notes you can print them out for example so if you go here under file and then choose print notice that here under what you want to print you want to choose here the notes pages notice that it is going to be one slide per page and the notes that you entered earlier under each slide they're going to be displayed right below the actual slide and then my other suggestion would be that when you're printing these uh, you don't need to choose color you can just choose grayscale as well and then print them out so that's one method to use the notes the other method is when you go to present your presentation for real in front of the audience you can also use what's called the presenter view so uh, to use a presenter view you just make sure you have the presenter view enabled and then here you can choose on which monitor it will be displayed your presentation will be displayed or your notes will be displayed so we make sure that we have the presenter view here and then we choose from the beginning now at this point notice this is what the audience will be seeing uh, it's the actual slide on their end on the projector and then this is a preview of the next slide that will come up and then here are the notes that we had typed from before notice here in the bottom you can actually click to make this text much larger and it will be very similar to like having a teleprompter for you and then you'd go uh, ahead and present this and uh, notice that you also have this pen here where you can actually annotate as you are presenting to your audience so you choose the pen option and you can annotate and also read your notes over here on the right hand side so that's how the notes will be utilized in your presentation they can be printed out or you can utilize them in conjunction with the presenter view in PowerPoint 2016 which is now the default view for a presentation if you're using Windows 7 or some other version and such and you can't get the display to do the presenter view you might have to use the Windows key and then P the letter P to choose to uh, extend your desktop so in that way the external monitor becomes the presenter or what the audience sees and then your laptop or your device becomes the one with the notes now if I could swap those what the audience would see so the audience would see this and that's how this works In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to use the presenter view in PowerPoint 2016. The presenter view is used very effectively in conjunction with notes in PowerPoint 2016 by utilizing notes in each slide. So for that portion of it, please refer to the inserting notes in a presentation in PowerPoint 2016. So to utilize the presentation view, you would uh, need to go under the slideshow and then you need to make sure that presenter view has been enabled or is checked so once you have chosen that option then you need to click on the option here from the beginning and then notice that we have a view here of the current slide we have a timer as to how long we have been working on this presentation so if your presentation is going to be only 10 minutes that's how you can keep track of the time and then notice you have some other options here including a pen for you to annotate on the actual slide then here are the controls for you to move from slide to slide and then uh, notice the notes are here on the right hand slide right below the next slide so you have a preview of what's coming up and then you have your own notes now those notes remember you can also uh, resize the font and make it readable or smaller or bigger as you need to make it more readable for your needs 
So that's how uh, pretty much the presenter view works in PowerPoint 2016. You can have basically the local computer where you are presenting from as uh, similar to a teleprompter and there's no need to refer to turn your back toward the audience to read whatever is in the slide. Now in some cases it might be that um, it, the computer is not displaying the presenter mode and such Typically, PowerPoint 2016 is actually going to force the computer and also, unfortunately, it leaves it in that condition. It leaves it as an extended desktop. So to enable or disable the extended desktop after, before the presentation or after the presentation, what you can do is you press Windows key and then P and that will come up with a projector options and you can choose to duplicate it or you can choose to extend the display for using the presenter mode. But once you're done with the presenter mode, you need to press back Windows P to choose a duplicate mode here. It would look like this, Windows key, that's extend for presenting, but if you want it mirrored for other functionality and other applications, you want to choose duplicate. So you want to duplicate the screen. In this video, I'll briefly cover how to use Quick Styles in PowerPoint 2016. This feature is available in previous versions as well, and it's uh, quite helpful and saving you time to perform a specific formatting task. So what you can basically do is you can select, let's say we have this heading here, and by the way, this works only for this specific object that we are selecting. If you want to modify the, all the objects of the same kind, then just refer to the video on modifying the slide master. So in our case, we select the object, we go here under the Home tab, and then there is this option here under Quick Styles. Quick Styles is basically you can select the design for that little heading and notice there's a quick live preview that you get uh, by simply hovering on any of those options. So you select the option that you prefer here and notice there are some new other presets as well and these are new with the newest updates from PowerPoint from or from Office 2016. So select what works for you and just like that it's done very easily and quickly. If you don't like that, you can simply go back to another one of those quick styles. And again, what you get on the quick styles, it might differ from theme to theme that you are utilizing in your presentation. So if you're trying to get the same kind of background or the same kind of content that I'm, or what you see here, and it doesn't work on yours, your machine and your end there, then potentially the reason for that is because you're using a different design. It depends on the design that you have selected here under the design options. So that's how you use the quick styles in PowerPoint. In this session, I'll demonstrate how to create a photo album or a presentation using photos in PowerPoint 2016. There might be cases where you have a bunch of photos that you took from a specific trip or for a specific function. And now instead of you copying and pasting and resizing those photos in the presentation, what you can do is you can import all of those photos in one shot into PowerPoint and then add sound and add other um, features to it such as timings and such so it plays automatically into PowerPoint. The nice thing about it is is that also it resizes the photos accordingly. So here's how you do it. You go here under the insert tab and then you go under photo album. Click on new photo album and then you select the files that you want to put into that album. So we go here and I think I have them under my desktop and here are all the photos. So you can select them all. I'm just pressing control A in this case and then it lists them here. We can change the order if we want. We can choose here the layout so it's going to fit them to the slide or you can have them two pictures per slide or however you determine that you want those. 
And then you can even apply a theme if you prefer to. You have to click on browse and all that type of thing to apply the theme. And then all you have to do is simply click on create and it'll do the magic. Note that this created a new presentation here. Note that the pictures have been added at this point and perfectly resized. Now you could simply add uh, sound and rehearse the timings and the presentation it'll play automatically and for those functions uh, refer to the other tutorials on PowerPoint 2016 such as rehearsing and inserting sound into a presentation but notice it's done automatically so that's how you create a photo album in PowerPoint 2016In this brief presentation, I'll demonstrate how to email your presentation from PowerPoint. So you click on File here, and then you choose Share, and then choose Email. Of course, you could save it to the cloud if you're sharing it with OneDrive with other people, but uh, you can also utilize here under Email and send it as an attachment, or send it as a PDF as well, and it'll do the conversion automatically. So it's basically going to convert it into PDF and then send it to your email. So if I choose send it as an attachment, you need to have Outlook, of course, in order for that to work. And then you simply put the address of the individual where you want to send it to and simply press send. The other option here is to under share, you click on email. As I mentioned earlier, you can send this as a PDF. It's going to publish it first into PDF and then it's going to open the email application attaching it as a PDF file. All you'd have to do is put the email address of the individual where you want to send it to and then press send and done. In this session, I'll demonstrate how to save your presentation in PDF format. There might be cases where you have to send your presentation to someone outside of your organization. And for various reasons, you don't want to send it in PowerPoint format, but you want to send it in PDF. So here's how you do it. It's very simple. You click on File here and then choose Export and then choose Create PDF XPS Document then click on create pdf xps and then notice it's going to be a file type pdf it's going to save it click on publish and this will be published in pdf format at this point point. and there is the document of course the animations will not be embedded and of course the videos from youtube will not be embedded either and just send the PDF document to whoever requested it. In this brief video, I'll demonstrate how to narrate a PowerPoint very briefly, and then also how to save this PowerPoint as an MP4 and send it to other users there. There are times where you need to create a presentation and share it either with classmates or share it with your employees or have it as a resource for anyone to go over it. Of course, you can narrate the PowerPoint and have the content embedded. And for that, you can check the video on narrating a PowerPoint. But in most cases, it will be more helpful where you narrate the PowerPoint and then you can save it as a video, as an MP4 video, and then the audience will be able to play it and view it on mobile devices or you can post it on the web and share it a variety of ways. So there are a couple steps to doing this. First, of course, you have to create your presentation and then you have to narrate it. Narrating it, you can see also, watch also the video on narrating a PowerPoint in more detail. But um, here is how it's done very briefly. You'd go here under the slideshow and then you click on slideshow and then you'd click on start recording. 
notice it's going to capture all the timings and everything that you do here so you're presenting your presentation as if you're in front of the audience even though you're just in front of the microphone in front of your computer so we'll record everything from beginning to end in your presentation and then the next step will be to actually save this and convert this into an mp4 file so you click on start recording and then at this point you'll just uh, go over the PowerPoint just like you'd go in class. Now this is the presentation mode that you're seeing here. However, typically it may be slightly different. You may just see this part of the PowerPoint, but you're going to go from one slide to the other slide and then the system is recording whatever you do and whatever you say at this stage in PowerPoint. It's going to play all the sound. It's going to play the different videos and all that stuff. So I'm going to go pretty fast here and you'll have to go all the way to the end of the video. Now that we are done with it, you'll need to click to save this to convert this into PDF and personally I'd suggest that you save this first. Just uh, save the file somewhere where you can find it and that way if the computer crashes or something happens in the process of conversion, because that process it will take a little bit of time at least you have your recording then we click here on file and then we click on export and then we choose create a video now here under create a video it's asking us as to what do we want the quality to be now right now i recorded this on high definition so it's going to be 1920 by 1080 but I'm going to change it just for the sake of uh, production to produce this faster. Typically, you might want to have it at 1280 by 720 if you're going to share it over the web. And then here it's going to use the recorded timings and narrations. Of, and also it's going to utilize the voice that we had for the recordings when we did them. Now we simply click on create video. And now it will ask us where do we want to save it. So I'm going to save it on the desktop here just as a test and it's going to be using PowerPoint 2016. I'll click on save and now it's saying that this PowerPoint has external media that means uh, because I had a couple YouTube videos linked to it continue without the media that's saying basically it's not going to be able to download the videos from YouTube so most of the time you'll most likely not have YouTube videos embedded but in this case We'll click on continue without the media from YouTube and other external sources. And then you just need to let it do its thing. Notice the progress bar is going to be here in the bottom. And like I mentioned earlier, depending on how big your PowerPoint is and how much speaking you did, it'll take a little time. So you need to be patient and maybe do something else during the time that this is processing. And now after a few minutes, the video was produced and now we can go back here to our folder where I had saved on the desktop under PowerPoint 2016. And now notice we have the MP4 video here. Double click on it. And the video at this point should have as part of the PowerPoint. PowerPoint. All the audio is going to go from, from one slide to the other slide. Other slide. And, then and then the system, system is recording, recording whatever, whatever you do, do and whatever, whatever you say at the page in point. PowerPoint. So that's how creating an MP4 video from a narrated PowerPoint works in PowerPoint 2016. Hopefully you'll find it helpful. In this brief session, I will demonstrate how to use templates in PowerPoint 2016. In PowerPoint 2016, templates serve not only for the design aspect of presentation, but also you can utilize the templates as the layout or as an outline for your presentation. So here's how they work. When you first open PowerPoint, you'll be presented with something very, very similar to this. So as soon as you open the application, you'll come to this screen. Now, if you are already in PowerPoint, you can click on File and then choose New. And then it will take you to the same starting point as when you open PowerPoint. You can either click on Create a Blank Presentation or you can utilize one of the existing PowerPoints 
uh, templates that exist here. Now, if you notice here, if you go, for example, under the category education, notice that uh, there are pre-designed templates that you can choose. For example, let's say you wanted to do a certificate to design a certificate. It's even as simple as this. All you have to do is click on it. And instead of you spending time designing this, all you'd have to do is simply change the name of the student here. The other thing that you can do with templates is, is that you can go, let's say, under the category here, education, let's say, and notice there are categories here on the right hand side as well. And let's say that you needed to do an academic presentation of some sort. So you click here on the template academic presentation and then click on create. It's going to download it from the web. Now this is with all the types of different designs for it. So it's more design oriented. And basically you'd fill in the text. However, in PowerPoint, there are also options where you can actually create, not only utilize the design, but also you can utilize the concepts that you can include in a specific presentation. For example, if we click here on business on the category business, Notice we have a whole bunch of uh, templates here that you can use for business presentations. If we go here, business strategy presentation, it's going to download it. And now it's going to give you a layout of, or, of your presentation or your outline of your presentation. So you state the vision, you state the goals and objectives, a summary of the current situation and uh, so on and so on. So it basically the layout exists there for you. Now you can tweak it, add more content to it, and of course, enhance it by utilizing the features that we learned in this tutorial in PowerPoint 2016. Notice as you're using templates, you can go and actually search for keywords here. So let's say we are searching here for the term marketing, and now notice that you have different templates that you can utilize already from here. So I'll choose this first one and there are different designs here on marketing. So for example, there is this one business sales and service. And then here it's a layout of the aspects of it. So you'd introduce yourself and then the products and services, give an example, and then include additional examples, maybe include a chart of some sort and diagrams of sorts and this is using smart art here and of course keep in mind that you can tweak those presentations even though they may not look as visually appealing to you you have the layout of it but you can customize it using the features that we learned in this tutorial so this is a tool that instead of you reinventing the wheel you can utilize something that already exists and also utilize the knowledge and features that we have covered in PowerPoint 2016. In this session, I'll demonstrate how to create a custom slideshow in PowerPoint. So suppose uh, you're a salesperson or you have created a long slideshow, but then at certain times you have only a shorter amount of time to explain your or to present something. So in that case, you want to have a custom slideshow with only particular slides as part of that presentation. So to set up a custom slideshow, you'd go under the slideshow tab, and then you want to click on custom slideshow. Click on the drop down, and then you want to click on a new slideshow. Now you can name this. And then you want to pick the slides that you want to insert in there to utilize. Now, of course, this does not fit what we are doing here. And then you add those and then click OK. You could create different ones here. So you could have one, let's say, called here Custom Slideshow Tips for, present, uh, for using PowerPoint. And then let's say you want only those, add them. Click OK. Now you can close this, but if you're on the road, then at some point, then you want to uh, present to only a specific audience. All you'd have to do is click here on custom slideshow, and then you can pick whichever one you want to present. So let's say East Coast pitch. 
So here it is, part of the PowerPoint. And that would include only that uh, slideshow for the East Coast. Then if you wanted to go, let's say, as part of this PowerPoint, the big one, we also created one called Tips for Using PowerPoint. Click on it, and now this presentation will just contain those slides. And that's how custom slideshows work in PowerPoint 2016. It is pretty much the same in previous versions as well. In this brief session, I will demonstrate how to insert a screenshot and how to use a screenshot feature in PowerPoint 2016. So there are times where you're designing and working on a project and such, and you want to add part of your screen, whether it's directions or something, to a slide into your presentation. So what you can do is you can go here under the Insert tab, and there is this option for Insert Screenshot. It basically adds a snapshot of a window that is open on your desktop or your document and it becomes a picture basically entering it in your uh, computer. In this case, what we do is you can click on Add Screenshot and then you want to choose the option for Screen Clipping. So you can either take a snapshot of the, one of the applications that you have opened or you can uh, do a Screen Clipping and you click on it and now it's giving us a chance to select something from this screen. So if I want to have a screen clipping of how to insert an image or a screenshot on PowerPoint, I could simply select this. I'm clipping part of the screen here. And now notice it inserted it automatically here. You can customize this. Notice you have the design ideas. You can utilize design ideas here and, and tweak this accordingly by selecting one of those designs. And additionally, you can use the formatting tools to make this a little fancier. So notice if I use one of those styles here for formatting this snapshot that I captured, I could use the tools above here. So let's suppose I want this one with a shadow border around it. And the other thing that I would suggest that you utilize is if you go here under Insert and then click on uh, Shapes, so you go under insert and then uh, let's say I want a rectangle here okay. and then I want to change the shape here and then under the shape fill I want to change that so that there is no filling to it and then for the border or the outline for it I can choose so it will be red so that the audience would uh, kind of see what I was working on. The other thing that you could do here is that under the outline you could change the weight to make that heavier and such. So now I can copy that same object that I copied, created earlier. And I'll paste it somewhere else here. And let's say that I want to demonstrate to the audience that this is the option that they should click on. Now each one of those, you can also animate them if you needed to. So if you were to go under animations, and then say, okay, I want to add animation, I want that to appear, and then I want this other animation item here as well. I want that so that it actually flies in. So I'm under the animation tab, fly in, and now when I go to present this, it will show up. This is the captured image that I picked earlier. Now if I click, it highlights this section here, and then if I click again, it will choose a screenshot. That's how the screenshot option works in PowerPoint 2016. In this session, I will demonstrate how to use the Tell Me feature in PowerPoint. This feature is, by the way, available in the other Office applications as well, such as in Word, Excel, and Microsoft Access. There might be times where you're trying to do something in PowerPoint and you don't know where to, that option is. So here on the next to the menus here on the ribbon, there is this option that says, tell me what you want to do or the tell me feature. You just start typing in there and it will just show you how to do specific things. So for example, how to start a presentation or how to utilize, let's say, add an online video. So you just uh, tap on it and 
you have here insert video and then online video so it kind of tells you so you want to click on insert video and then online video and then this it basically takes you to that function to perform that specific task uh, let's say you're not sure how to do the rehearse timings so you can just start typing rehearse here click on rehearse timings and then it just starts that process automatically to get you there so it's a very cool feature to utilize basically it's not just giving you directions but it's giving you the option to perform that specific task so let's say I want to create a photo album just start typing photo and then it'll take you to the photo album option In this brief session, I will demonstrate how to change the look and feel or the theme for PowerPoint 2016. This process is actually the same to change also in other applications that come with Office 2016. So this is the default look and feel for PowerPoint. If we wanted to change it, we click on File here, and then we go here under Options. Once we go under options, notice that we have those options right here for the office theme. Currently it is on colorful and that is the default. And if we prefer, let's say dark gray, then click on dark gray and then click OK. Now notice the whole look and feel of the application will change. If we want to change it back, simply go under options here. And let's take a look at the black theme here. Click OK and this is how it will look at this point then let's also take a look at the white theme and notice that all the menus and options here will be kind of whitish feel and look to it and now let's go back here to the colorful feel which will add kind of the reddish banner here on the top for the actual tabs so that's how you change the theme in PowerPoint 2016. In this brief presentation, I will demonstrate some of the guidelines related to using PowerPoint effectively. There are a lot of times where a user designs a PowerPoint and there are certain rules that they are not really following and therefore instead of conveying an effective message to the audience, the presenter is missing the point on how to be effective in their presentation. So here are some guidelines. First, why use PowerPoint? Uh, because it supported, it's supposed, PowerPoint is supposed to be a tool to emphasize the message that you're conveying to the audience. If you're trying to sell a car or to sell a product, you want the audience to respond and purchase and be excited about the product and not necessarily uh, see how well you can do animations. Of course, animations can be effectively used in order for you to convey that message to them. And this works the same way in the classroom and such. Four steps for a good presentation. Of course, you need to plan it, to plan ahead on what uh, the outline will be, what the content of the presentation will be. Then you need to prepare for it. So basically sit down and uh, find the facts and find the content that you're going to pre present and uh, get to know the audience. And then once you have prepared your presentation, you need to practice it. And a good practice makes for a good presentation as well. And then you actually need to present it to the audience. One of the frustrating things is when you are in a presentation and the presenter is looking, turning their back to the audience, and they are not engaging with the audience, but they are reading everything on the screen and the presentation might have too much text and such. You want to make sure that you are engaging with the audience and you're using and presenting effectively. So here are some guidelines on the design of a presentation. So basically do the outline first, even if you are going to tweak it. Uh, the presentation, as I have demonstrated in the video tutorial on PowerPoint 2016, do the outline first, figure out what you're going to present and what the order of your facts is going to be in the presentation. Additionally, keep the words large enough. Of course, as I demonstrated in this tutorial on PowerPoint 2016, I emphasize 
using graphics and using images such as smart art or other tools but yet if you're using text make sure that the text size is at least 24 size 24 typically 28 or above but 24 minimum the other thing is limit the number of words that you put on a page whether it's bullet points or whether you use paragraphs and such but try to limit them there's a rule there called the 7 by 7 rule you don't want more than seven bullets per page and typically each bullet should have the average of about seven words in it additionally fancy is not always better as you can see here in this uh, bullet you want to stick with simple fonts content that the users will be able to read from a distance and also be able to remember and such uh, remember also color combinations and graphics and make sure that everything that you utilize in your presentation it actually has a purpose and finally the slides are designed to supplement your presentation and not necessarily be your presentation and turning your back to the audience and reading from the screen it's not going to be an effective way to present your presentation to the audience i hope these tips will help you in effectively utilizing powerpoint presentations as a tool to convey ideas and to sell the product to your audience and such and if you have not checked out the full tutorial on powerpoint 2016 please do so it is designed so you can utilize the features and the tools that come with powerpoint effectively in your work in your career and whatever you're doing thank you again for watching this tutorial and i hope that it was effective and valuable to you started with this tutorial I will first demonstrate how to set up a personal account for example a Gmail account with Outlook then I'll demonstrate how to set up a business account with Outlook so let's get started with a personal account so I have a Gmail account I have not set up any profiles on it yet so we'll just open Outlook you can find it from the start menu or you can simply type here under the search bar Outlook 2016 so typically you'll get this and um, in this case I'll just add my personal email in this case it's my Gmail account and then I'll click on connect then of course you'll need to add your password and click OK now in some cases it may happen like it does not allow you to use the password or to sign in like it's doing in my case here in this case go here to your gmail account go under the configuration for your gmail account and then go under settings and this might be the case with your outlook.com account or yahoo account and such you'll try it first to set up your account through microsoft outlook and if it doesn't work then you'll have to go and sort out as to what else you have to enable in this case i need to go under forwarding pop and imap and then i need to enable here my imap so now this imap is enabled and we also might need here the configuration settings or the instructions for how to set it up in outlook so if we go here under configuration instructions notice it wants all of these different settings for the outgoing server so you'll basically need to set those in your outlook and it doesn't allow us to proceed any further now in some cases particularly with gmail your account might be blocked for logging in through microsoft outlook and such and the reason for that is because google considers outlook as a less secure app to access your email so in this case since i could not log in earlier what i need to do is go here to my inbox and notice it says review your sign in attempt it says you can continue to use this app by allowing access to less secure apps so we need to go into our account settings and allow microsoft outlook to access our gmail account so there are two steps to enable a personal account we first need to go into the account settings and enable imap and pop3 if we needed to but also we need to go into the account settings and allow less secure apps and this is under the myaccount.google.com forward slash security so now let's go ahead and try it again here 
will change the account and go to Google and then IMAP and all these different settings. So now this needs to be port 993 and then SSL and then also for the outgoing server smtp.gmail.com and then port 465 and then SSL as well. Then click on next and then put your password again. And now our account has been set up and it's complete. We go here under Setup Outlook and click on OK. And it's pretty much the same way that you'll set up any other personal accounts as well. And in this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to set up your business account or an exchange account with Microsoft Outlook with your business email account. Here, in order to make sure that we are going to pick a proper account for Microsoft Exchange, I suggest that you click on Advanced Options and choose Let me set up my account manually. If you're already connected to the business network, you can simply press Connect and it's going to use Active Directory and the sign-in from there as well. All you'd have to put in is the email address from your company. Next, we click here on Connect and then make sure that you choose Microsoft Exchange. Then put the password in there from your email account from your business. And the account is complete and you can click OK. And also I'd suggest unless you're setting up your mobile phone, I'd suggest you uncheck the set up mobile phone option here. Then click OK and you'll be able to access your business email. Now one of the advantages if you're using Microsoft Exchange from a business environment is that um, the email and the calendar and the contacts, it's all transparent. It's connecting directly to the server. And if you delete a message from Outlook, it deletes it from the server as well. So it keeps all your messages intact. The older technology out there was to use what's called POP3 type of connectivity where the messages were downloaded to your local computer it's basically the messages were downloaded to your computer then you delete them and the copy would remain on the server with exchange all of that it's uh, linked in real time you delete the message from outlook it deletes it from the server you receive a new message it shows up in your computer and also you can have it on your mobile phone and gadgets as well the same thing with is also the tight integration of the calendaring feature and the contacts feature and such that we'll cover shortly. Now that we are in Outlook, this is the business account. And let's assume that you wanted to add a personal account. You can also do that by going under File here and then choose Add an Account. Follow the same process that we did follow earlier for adding a personal account. And check rewind the video for that. In Microsoft Outlook, you can have more than one account, your business account and any personal accounts that you want, and they will show up here on the left hand side. So, just for the sake of demonstration here, I'm going to do it very quickly by using my personal account. And of course, make sure that your personal accounts have two-factor authentication and all that type of stuff. In this case, I have disabled it temporarily just so that I can set this up. And notice now I have my two accounts here. This is my business account, and then this is my personal account as well. So that's how you get started with Microsoft Outlook to set up your accounts, whether it's a business account or whether it's a personal account. Next, we are going to go into some of the components of the user interface in Microsoft Outlook so that you can be familiar with it and effectively use it for personal use or in the workplace to enhance your resume. In this session, I'm going to go over the basic components of the interface of Outlook 2016 so that we can get an understanding of the major components of it and get started the right way with Outlook. So let's open Outlook first. In this case, notice I have set up two accounts here, one personal and one for business. Notice that on the left hand side, we have the favorite folders. We have the business account here with all the different folders. Then we have a personal account as well with all of the different folders. And this is the Gmail account. 
favorite folders are specific folders from each account that we can mark as favorite to mark another folder as favorite we can simply go to any of those folders here on any of those accounts and right click and choose show in favorites and that's how you'll add here another folder to show up under favorites it's to remove it from favorites we just right click and choose remove from favorites so that's the left hand side on the very top here notice you'll have the regular menus just like any other application you have the file menu with all kinds of options here notice also the options option account settings mailbox settings rules and such then you have the home tab and this is most commonly used functions within this application basically it's giving you the general tools for the context of what you're doing and this includes creating a new mail message replying to messages forwarding them and dealing with meetings and general things that you'd be doing then notice you have the send and receive tab the folders tab viewing tab and different viewing options as well that you can change and customize then you have the help option and also notice that there is a tell me feature here tell me what you want to do so let's say that you wanted to know about the address book and you're not sure where the address book is you just type address here and then it's going to bring you that option on the very top you notice that you have what's called here the quick access toolbar these are a set of tools or icons that you can choose to enable or disable for you to quickly access you can add uh, other icons to it so sometimes there are specific commands that you're very commonly using in your application and let's say that you want the delete key to always be up here or the hyperlink option or whatever it may be you can go to any of those icons whatever that icon might be that function that you want and right click on it and choose to add it to the quick access toolbar and now that delete option will always be in the top left corner to remove it from there you can right click and choose to remove it from the quick access toolbar so these are some of the components on the top here so you have the the office ribbon and then in each section here of the tab you also have these subsections for example the delete section here the new creating new stuff delete stuff responding to emails then quick steps of what you want to do with your email and then moving and various tags so that's on the top in the middle this is the actual messages so we are clicking on the actual folder here for the message and these are the different messages that we have received so far now the message content will actually be displayed by default on the right hand side so I click on this message and there is the content of the message here on the right hand side with these messages we can either reply from right here or reply to all and forward from here so these are the controls so basically we start with the left hand side with our inbox the message on the center column and then replying and functions we read the message from over here and then we can reply and reply to all or such from over here from the controls on the top so that's the default view if you wanted to change the view to something other than what you see here you can do that by going on the view tab and then choose how you want your viewing so we have here the reading pane and if you want to change it to a different viewing option so let's say I want the messages to be viewed in the bottom I can just choose under the reading pane the bottom option here and now notice I have the messages on the top and the preview of the messages will be in the bottom here so I'm going to change it to the default the view tab since we are here under the to do bar you can choose to show the calendar on the right hand side and most of the time that will be there automatically depending on your resolution and your screen and also you can choose to show the tasks and you can choose to show also the peep pane now on the very bottom here the bottom right you can zoom in and out for your messages so if you if the zooming for a specific message is not large enough you can adjust that as well by using the zoom controls 
in the bottom as well you have their normal view and also you can change this to a reading view on the bottom left here we have the number of um, items that we have in our folder and how many messages are unread here now a major component which I probably should have mentioned earlier in Outlook and the advantage of using Outlook is is that you can actually use Outlook not only for email which is this icon right here or this function right here but you can use Outlook also for the calendaring features and that's the beauty of it you can keep track of your own calendar and view other individuals calendars and also make meeting invitations and we'll try to cover those shortly you can also keep track of contacts and those contacts can be accessed then from multiple computers once you set up your account in multiple computers and also in your smartphone you can also keep track of tasks uh, notes as well from here so notice all of these options are here on the very bottom left of your window you can further customize this by going here under options and choose the type of navigation that you'd like so in my case i might want to make this much larger so that i can view and switch from calendar to other tasks this way again note that you can change this under these three dots under the navigation options and i'm choosing here compact navigation so from this application you can keep track of your email your calendar the contacts to-do lists and even notes all from one interface and we'll move on to the next session in covering more of the features of it we'll first stay within the email component of it and then move to the calendaring and other tasks so stay tuned for the next session <music>In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use the email component of Microsoft Outlook, how to create a message, to send it, how to format it, and send it to one or more individuals. So let's open Outlook. Notice on the left-hand side here, we have our favorite folders and our various accounts. So we can click here on Inbox, and notice under Inbox here, we have the mail that has come in to this specific account that has been received. Under drafts, these would be messages that we have drafted and have not sent yet. So sometimes we start a message and then Outlook saves it automatically. We forget to send it or we have to run to a meeting and you can choose to save that message as a draft and then come back to it. Under send messages, this would be the messages that we have sent out to other individuals. Deleted messages, these would be what we have deleted junk email this is if your company uses filtering and then outbox is messages that are waiting to be sent out typically in outlook the messages will be sent automatically however if something is stuck and not getting sent that's where it would be temporarily stored in the outbox so we go here under inbox and at this point we are going to send a new message so i click here on new message and notice we have the from and then the to where it's sending it to and then we also have a carbon copy that we might want to send to somebody else so if we want it to send to multiple people put a semicolon and then you can put a space and then type another email address and so on so you can send it to multiple people, multiple individuals by using semicolon. That's the trick in Microsoft Outlook. You can't put a comma. You have to use a semicolon in there for multiple addresses. The other thing is that you can put a carbon copy here if you wanted to send it to somebody else. And then you'll type the subject. So this will be just the title of the message. Typically, you want to make sure that the title of the message is meaningful so you want them to click on it and actually read your message next you want to start typing the message uh, this is basically the message that you want them to read now one thing to remember as you're using email is that spelling nowadays matters so try to make sure that your spelling and the email content is professional and also try not to type everything in caps 
most likely you know about that. But try to keep the formatting at a minimum and not highlighting and bold and all that type of stuff unless there is a need to do so. For the sake of demonstrating the formatting of this email, I'm going to just go and type some additional content here. And notice if I wanted bulleted lists or if I wanted uh, specific numbers, all I have to do is start typing A, for example, and now it's going to start creating the list. If we don't like A, B, C, notice we have these options here where we can format this and make this much fancier. So this is the basic text formatting tools, whether we want to change the font, the size of the font, and notice you can adjust the size of the font to increase the font size from these little icons here. Make this bold, italics and underline and text color and all these different options that you see over here. So these are some of the tools that have to do with the formatting of the text. If we wanted to use an address book and check the names and such, you'd use these tools over here. And then to attach a file for this, which I'll demonstrate in a moment, you'll use the attach file function here and attaching items and uh, things of that nature. So we type our message the way we want it. We can format this any way we want it. Then we want to attach the file. Now to attach a report while we are in the new message area, we click on attach report. And one of the nice features of 2016 is actually that the most recent files that we have been using, they're going to be listed first here on the recent items. So we don't need, really need to navigate where the files are. That's in the case of where you opened the report and you worked on it for the last moment and such. So we simply click over here and then add it as an attachment. The other option is to browse my PC here for the attachment and go and find it under Documents. And notice there is Sales Report here under Documents. For now, I'll show you the easy way. So we click here on Sales Report and notice it's attached. Next, we can double check how our message looks like and we'll be able to press send. Before we press send here, I'm going to just show a couple of additional options here for tags. Sometimes the message might be of high importance and this is where you can mark it as high importance while sending it. I would suggest, however, that you use the high importance only when it is really highly important. If all the messages that you send out are of high importance when they are actually not, it could frustrate the receiver. So use this feature wisely. Under the follow-up area here, you also have an option to choose when you want to have a reminder for this. So you could set this to follow up with this next week or tomorrow, and you basically just put uh, a check mark on it and it will add it to your tasks to follow up the next day and such. It will actually put a little flag next to it. And then when you're ready, you press send. At this point, the message should have been sent. Typically, it goes into the outbox first. And from there, if everything is working correctly, it uh, clears out the, uh, the outbox. And then if you wanted to see whether it was sent and what was sent, you'd go under the sent items folder. So this is what was sent. If I go here to my personal email account and I go under inbox, and this is my Gmail account, notice I will have a message with a new report attached. And as a user in my Gmail account, I can go ahead and open this report and view the contents of it. Now I can go back to my inbox and review the messages. Now in the case where a message was not deliverable, notice you'll receive an automatic email that it could not be delivered. To delete it, we can do it a couple ways here. We can either click on delete up here after we have selected the message, or we can click on the little delete option right here. Obviously, this is very basic stuff. However, this is what you'll be using 99% of the time. That's why I'm kind of covering it a little bit more in detail. So that's how you compose a message send it to multiple individuals, uh, copy somebody as well on the message, and then checking where the, the send messages are, and then how you delete a message. So stay tuned for the next session that will cover how to use the email functions such as forwarding, replying, 
and using additional features related to email before we move into the other more advanced features such as the calendaring and contacts and tasks. <music> In this session, I'm going to cover some of the other basic features of using email in Microsoft Outlook. These features might still sound very basic. However, this is what you'll be using most of the time in the business environment anyway. And particularly if you're getting started with Outlook, first how to check new messages. So when you open Outlook, the new messages will be marked in bold color like this one over here in the top. Then you'll click on the folder, for example, Inbox and then click on the actual bold message. Click on it and then on the right hand side you'll see the content of the message that you received. Now to delete it, of course you could use the delete button here on the very top or next to it and notice also you have an option here to follow up with this as a to-do item if you don't have time to deal with it. So all you have to do is click on this little flag here and then notice it will add the message here to follow up with this later today on this specific message. Now if this doesn't show up in your computer this is available under the view tab here and then you will scroll down under the to do bar and you choose to show the tasks or not show them from here. So notice now they have disappeared under the to do bar you can choose tasks. If you needed to open something that you had marked to view on it, you can simply double click on that component and it will open up that message that you had to follow up with from before or at any point. Next, reply to this message and you can do that by simply clicking reply here on the toolbar on the ribbon or right above the message press reply. And from here, you're simply typing the message that you want to send back. As you use email, it's important to acknowledge the receipt of messages. You simply reply to the user, to the requester, that you have received it and that you'll be following up with them. It makes for better communication and that's effective use of email. Today's workplace employees and uh, supervisors and such, they want you to communicate effectively with them. And this is one way to communicate effectively. And then from here you'd press send. Notice that the reply address, it took it automatically. It placed it in the to address. And if you needed to copy somebody else, this is where you'd put in their email address. Notice that under the message tab here, there is this compose tools. This is where you can use the various additional tools for formatting this message. Also notice that there is this option here for blind copy or the BCC, the blind copy. It's another option that can be added to your list of options for sending it out. The BCC here, the recipient is not going to know that you actually forward it or send a copy of this message or reply to anybody else. So they're not going to know that you send this to the Gmail address because it's a blind copy of it. And then you'd simply press send. In the case, and I'm not sending it yet here, in the case where you want to do more major formatting of this message, you can also click here on pop out. And this is where you have the more flexibility to format this message in a fancier way because you have a complete window that you can adjust and resize and utilize all the various other tools. And then once we are set and good to go, we press send and that message will be sent out. As you receive messages and such, you might want to reply to all. Reply to all, I would suggest that you use it cautiously. Don't use it for all messages. Sometimes you get messages from a distribution list. It can be frustrating. So you want to use reply all only if you're part of a team that you're receiving communication and it is necessary for you to reply back to all the members of the team. If you're ready to press reply here, press send and then it's good to go. And then the forward option here, notice it's in both places here. We click on forward and this is where we can forward this message to somebody else. All you have to do here is just press two and then under the recent people, put in their email address and then press send when you're ready to send it.
If you want to discard the message, of course, notice you have the option for discarding it. So that's how you reply to a message, that's how you forward it, and that's how you reply to all the individuals as part of a group. In this session, I'll demonstrate how to use rich text formatting of your messages. It's important to understand that um, the, some of those features are also available in the previous versions of Outlook 2016. So let's click here and add a new message. So we want to send a new email and we type in the address here that we want to send it to. We have the subject in there. We type the message and of course you want to type this as professional as you can. And then here under the message options, we can go and format this with a variety of different ways, whether we want to change the font, whether we want to change the indentation and the other components here as far as the basic text formatting is concerned. Notice you have the insert tab and you could insert other components as part of this message. So we could insert an attachment. We can choose the latest files from that we have been working with, an Outlook item. So for example, an actual message that we have received in the past, simply choose it from there. We could insert a business card if we had one created, so the calendar. So today's availability, for example, I'm just going to send the availability as part of this message to a user. Could insert a signature we can in insert what's called illustrations. And the illustrations, it's very similar to it, like in Word and Excel and PowerPoint, where you want to insert a table as part of your message. Just click here on table, and then select however many columns and rows you want to use for this table. Once you have inserted the table or this object, notice that we have a couple new tabs that show up here. We have the design tab and the layout tab. Those are actually tools. They're referred to as the contextual tools, tools that show up in the context of what we are doing. In this case, we are working with a table and we have the table tools. Here we can change the design of this table and pick one of those designs instead of spending all afternoon formatting this. We can just use one of those styles from the table tools. You have all kinds of other options here in the style. You can change the shading if you want it manually, add a border and other types of things. Then you'd fill in the information as part of this table. And you get the idea and then we could still change the layout. We could add additional rows and columns. We could uh, distribute the formatting of each uh, cell here differently and just put the numbers in there. Once we move out of the table, we go back to the Insert tab and we could add pictures and the pictures could be from the web or wherever or from the computer. So if we had pictures here saved, we could do that from the computer, simply select it or we could go and insert pictures from online here and simply search here for Outlook. We can also change the type of picture that we want, whether it's clip art or an actual picture, and click on it and click on insert. Now, remember, whenever you're copying and sending pictures from the web, keep in mind copyright as well. In this case, notice it's Creative Commons, which means we can use this giving credit to and you can learn about Creative Commons licenses over here. Notice it put here the Creative Commons aspect of it or the content. Notice now we have the picture tools and this is the contextual tools related to the pictures. We can format this picture with a simple click on it and make it much more fancier. There's a drop down and you can customize this further as well the text wrapping and additional options such as cropping the picture and things of that nature. By the way, the best way to learn about this stuff is simply to tinker with it. Just click on stuff, look as to what the options are on the ribbon and customize it that way. Additionally, you can insert shapes here. And one of the things with shapes is, is that you have to actually draw the shape in here then you can choose from here, you can choose styles for the shapes as well. 
and you can manipulate it however you prefer to change it. And all of this is part of an actual message that you are sending. Under the Insert tab, notice you could even insert icons if you prefer to. And this is kind of new in Outlook 2016 with the latest version of it. So click on an icon and it'll just simply add a fancy icon in here. Of course, to move them around, so you need to, whenever you're using this stuff, you want to make sure that the formatting makes sense. Of course, we are adding too many things at so this. It's going to be slightly busy, but you get the idea. You're under insert as well now in the, in the later versions of it. There are also 3D objects that you could insert, and these would be from the web. And you could make this even fancier as you're sending it to your users. Now, because this is part of the email, we just need to create some more space here and insert this object however you want. Notice the smart art. These are just predefined infographics to illustrate an idea. Of course, these would be more useful in Word or PowerPoint, but you can use them in Microsoft Outlook as well. So you could define a process and all that type of stuff. Notice how the text here adjusts automatically. And again, for the contextual tools, you have the various color schemes that you can apply to this object. Now, if we add more components here under Insert, and then we go and add, for example, charts. Charts sometimes would be very helpful. Now this is very similar to Excel. You can pick the type of chart here and then simply click on OK and then work with the data. Here you change the data type. So put the actual sales for each month. So let's say we have January and then we want to have the months. And then you have the online and on-site sales, for example. And if, let's say, you don't want to use one of those columns, you can exclude it by dragging this blue line. If you want to learn more about this stuff, uh, you can actually check out the Excel tutorial or the PowerPoint tutorial. So once we are done with the chart data, we can close it. And then if we click on the chart again, notice we have the chart tools very similar to contextual tools for other components that we used earlier. Additionally, as you're planning your messages and working on your messages under the Insert tab, notice you can do screenshots and you can um, add smart art and even symbols and things of that nature. Now, the one other concept that I wanted to demonstrate to you is that um, for each one of those objects, whether it's an image or an object or text here, you can also insert hyperlinks. So if I select here these, this object, hyperlink, I could link this to a tutorial on YouTube, for example, or, or some other object or the sales report on the website or a document or things like that. So in that case, simply select the object or it could be text, click here on link, and then I just post the address there. When they receive the message and they click on it, then uh, it'll take them to that URL. Same way you could select part of the text, click on link, add the URL that you want to take them to. And notice now this is in blue. However, for the image here, the user most likely will not know it is clickable. So in a nutshell, that's how you create professional looking emails in Microsoft Outlook. It depends on the time that you want to invest in designing the message, how fancy you want it to look, and take the time to compose it. But again, the more professional it is, the better it is in the workplace. So once you're ready to send this, then you can click on send and the message will be delivered. Now, if I go here to my personal email and click on the sales report, notice that I received here my message and this is to an external system. This is the image. This is the hyperlinked option for the text that I had hyperlinked earlier. Take you to the YouTube channel. And then this is also hyperlinked as we did earlier. Then we have these images and smart art and charts that we sent. So this is to an external system even outside of Microsoft Exchange. 
So that's how you send the message out from Microsoft Outlook. If you wanted to check what you sent out, again, you go under the sent items and the messages that you sent out will be listed in there. So stay tuned for the next session on sending a message using the address book in Microsoft Outlook. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use the address book or the company address book in Microsoft Outlook to send messages out, to find the addresses, and then add them to the blind copy or to the copy field for sending emails out to other users. So to create a new message, we click here on new email, and then we can simply either type the address or the individual where we want to send this message to over here. And then remember, you need to put semicolons to separate them, or you can use the address book. The address book, you can access it either from here under address book, or you can click on the to field over here, and then click on the global address book. Under the global address book, we can see the individuals or we can search by last name. I'm going to search for generic accounts for privacy purposes, of course. So let's say we want to search by last name and notice the email address will be displayed on the right hand side. Other information uh, such as title and location and all that type of stuff will be displayed on the right hand side. To add it to this list of recipients, I can simply Double click on it and it will be added under the to field. Or if I wanted this under the CC field, I can simply click here on CC after having selected this address. Or if I want it in the blind copy field, and let me search for another address here, I can simply search for it, press go, select the right address book, and then go in the BCC field or any of the fields that I want this to be inserted or sent to. So you can search by simply navigating or you can search by more columns here and then typing in their last name or their first name and choose go and then put them in the right field area here and then click OK. Once you have them in this view, then you can type your subject and then type your message and all that type of stuff and then press send. I will also cover it in more detail, the using uh, the address book when we actually cover the contacts information here or the people option within Microsoft Outlook. One other feature here that I'd like to demonstrate before I move to the next segment is how to save this message as a draft. So there might be times where you're spending quite a bit of time in developing a, and, and uh, composing an email message, but then you have to run to a meeting or something you want to be, uh, you're distracted. How can you save this message? To save the message, all you have to do is, while you have it open, you click on save here, and then you can safely close this. Now, when you come back from your meeting, you can simply go here under the drafts folder, within your Outlook folder, and then you'll see the message that you had from before. Now here you can either keep on typing and add more content to this, or you can click on pop out and that'll bring it up in a bigger window and you can still keep on working with this message. Once you're ready, you can press send here and it'll send the message out. So that's how you can use the address book from Microsoft Exchange at your company or personal address books as well that you might have in your computer with a personal account. And that's how you also can save a message as a draft and be able to pull it back. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to create a signature for your email messages so that whenever you send an email out, your signature will be automatically attached, as well as whenever you reply to a message to create a signature for any replies to messages that you send out. A couple ways to do it, but the simplest is by clicking here and add a new email. And then the easiest is to go under the option here under signature, click on signature, click on signatures again, and then here is where we create our signature. So we click on new 
and then you give it any name it doesn't matter what name but this is just an identifier then you click OK then down here this is where you can put anything that you want to be inserted automatically as part of your message instead of having to type your name all the time and you can basically put in whatever you want in there so your title your department your contact information and all that type of stuff you can also insert here an image as part of your signature for your email note that images by default they might not be displayed on the other side as you use images as well here you can also paste for example your logo from their institution and such so just simply uh, go ahead and copy it from the web and then paste it in there or you can use any of these options right here as well to upload the picture from your computer you can also hyperlink so that your signature when somebody goes to whatever your position or your department or your institution you can hyperlink it to go for example to your address and that will be automatically hyperlinked so basically you specify as part of your signature anything that you want to be inserted automatically then over here in the top when do you want to use this signature here I want to use this for all the new messages so I click here anytime I create a new message I want to use this signature and then click OK and now that signature has been created now if I wanted to create other signatures for replying to messages I could simply come here and choose a new signature and then define your signature that you want whenever anytime you press reply to a message now notice here it says for new messages under the options it's going to use the signature for new messages that I created earlier for replies I could use the signature for replies assuming we fill this out and formatted it appropriately then I click OK now anytime I go here to create a new message notice my default signature will be created automatically or added automatically that I created earlier and then if I go to reply to a message let's say I got this message from earlier I press reply notice my reply signature has been entered automatically so that's how you create and define the signatures and that's how you can make them part of your message whether for new messages or for replies <music>this session I'll demonstrate how to search for messages in your email account with the emergence of fancier email applications such as for example Gmail where the search capabilities are really powerful Outlook as well has fairly good capabilities in you being able to search for messages and the easiest to search for the messages is by going to your account whichever account you're using here and then notice you have search current mailbox now this will search everything in that mailbox so you can change here to search only the current folder or subfolders so let's search for the current mailbox you probably noticed that I had a lot of uh, Lowe's marketing stuff here so let's say type Lowe's here and then hit enter and all the messages from Lowe's will be displayed here or let's say I wanted the word report and then this will display the messages that have the word report in it now notice that there is all kinds of other stuff here that's because there are some other additional reports in there or if I do the word test notice it displays the message now once you find the message you see it here you can simply click on it and it will be displayed on the right hand side so that's how you search for messages if you are getting too many results and such you can pick to use the current folder that means that in this case it's going to search only the inbox for those test messages if I wanted to search on a specific other folder I can go to that folder here and then just type the word test and notice there are two test messages for the current folder under the sent if for some reason your search results are not working quite as well start typing in the search area and then notice also there is a recent searches option and there are additional options here for defining the locations that you want to search 
and then the advanced find option where you can specify additional parameters whether it has specific keywords in the title or from a specific individual and things of that nature so the search capability it's actually quite powerful in Microsoft Outlook if for some reason Outlook is not doing the search properly then it could be potentially related to the indexing status here the indexing option that you might have to rerun the indexing in Outlook or my suggestion is that if you still cannot find what you need check with a webmail application from your Microsoft Exchange server so you just go to mail dot whatever your company name is and then from webmail it seems like the exchange Microsoft Exchange does a much better job with the searches rather than with an outlook <music>
and then it will display those folders accordingly here to save us space but this is the default so that's how you create folders that's how you move folders around and then move messages into specific folders <music>
I could say choose the level of junk mail that I want to enable in my inbox and I can choose low or high and such and it will add them to the junk mail. I could choose here under safe senders to allow specific emails so that they never end up in the junk mail option and safe recipients the same way and then blocked senders I could add somebody manually here the email address to block them from emails coming in and additional top level domains that you can block from here so that's controlling the junk mail filters for this specific message I could choose junk and then block the sender and then it says the sender lows at elows.com has been added to your blocked senders list and the messages have been removed from the junk folder so you click OK and now those messages coming in in the future they'll be removed notice that there is one more here that's because uh, this was from here from before now we're defining this for new messages in the future so that's how you define the filters that's how we define them and also that's how to block a specific sender in outlook <music>
we want to set up automatic replies. To do that, we go here under File, and then we go here under Automatic Replies. Now, under Automatic Replies, all you have to do is click on Send Automatic Replies, and then you can specify to send the replies automatically so it engages a specific time and date, and then it will disengage automatically on that. So you can set the time here, the date, and then you can have this for multiple days if you want and then the end point. And then for people inside of my organization, so that would be anybody with your domain, email address, or the accounts on a Microsoft Exchange, they would receive this automated message. So you type your message in there, what you want to be sent automatically. You can copy this as well. And then for people outside of the organization, you can choose whether to send automatic replies as well. And you can use the same one by pasting it in here. You can choose to send it to anyone outside of the organization or just contacts that are in your address book and such. Under rules here, you can choose to specify rules and conditions as well. So if it's from a specific individual, then to take a specific action to forward it to somebody else or to reply to the specific template. So if it's from your boss, then you say, I'm on it. If it's from junk mail, then you can have a specific other template as well. I'm not going to get into that at this point because it's a little bit more complicated, but for the sake of what you'll be doing most likely is engaging and setting up the auto reply, specifying the dates, the start and end time, keeping in mind that the system will enable it or disable it automatically based on those parameters type the messages for inside of the organization or outside of the organization, and then click OK. And now at this point, the automatic reply has been configured. And when the time parameters kick in, it'll be automatically engaged. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use the calendar feature in Microsoft Outlook. The calendar in Microsoft Outlook, it's a very powerful feature that is integrated within Microsoft Outlook along with email, contacts, and tasks, and such. And that's what makes Microsoft Outlook so powerful in a business environment. The calendar feature not only allows you to keep track of your own appointments for specific dates and times, but it also allows you to schedule meetings with others and invite them to meetings and check their calendar and all that type of thing. Once you open Outlook, you have your emails and such, but here in the bottom left, you also have the option for a calendar. Now on the left hand side, you'll have the dates and times for the calendar. Further down, you'll have the multiple calendars that you might have access to. By default, you have access to only your own calendar. However, if other users choose to share their calendar with you, you'll be able to have access to their calendar as well over here. And we'll learn about that later. So basically, you have the months and the dates here on the left. And then on the right hand side, you have these different views. Notice you have the today's view, the next seven days. You have the view for just today, next seven days, the work week, it's skipping the Saturday and Sunday here, the monthly view, and then just the scheduled view. So you're just looking at specific days and what your calendar looks like the, for those specific days. Manage calendars where you can open somebody else's calendar and group calendars and you can email the calendar, share your calendar and publish it and all that type of thing and check the calendar permissions. So typically in day to day work, you're going to probably use the day view first or the work week view, one of those views. Now, to create an appointment, there are a couple of ways to do that. You could be on any of those views. It doesn't matter which one. But the day view, let's say I go here. It's about 12 o'clock. Let's say at 2 o'clock, I select the block of time. And then I just type the appointment that I want to create. So, for example, and then simply hit Enter. At this point, notice that once I hit Enter, the appointment has been entered. At this stage, I have additional options here that show up about my appointment. So I could choose to show this as busy or tentative or I'm free and such or out of the office. 
So free, of course, that means that somebody else can schedule an appointment with me. My calendar will look free to others, even though I have something scheduled for it. Working somewhere else and such, or tentative and busy and out of office, of course, that means what they say. And somebody will see that you're busy at that particular point in time for that block of time. Another way to create an appointment is by simply clicking here on New Appointment and then putting the subject. And then here I'm putting more details about my appointment. I could put uh, my location, the date and time, how long it's going to be, and then I can put also additional details about my appointment. Additionally, we have more options as you can see and we'll touch on some of those other ones such as the scheduling assistant and notes and all that type of thing shortly here you notice you have this recurrence option and this is how you can make a meeting so it shows up every let's say this meeting takes place monthly on the 21st of every month and then you want to end it after 10 occurrences so that's how you do a repeating meeting so pick your parameters here and then click OK and then press save and close. Now if we go into the monthly view this will show up the same way from month to month it's added to your calendar. So that's how you create a meeting for personal use and also create that meeting so that it shows up from month to month. You can also create a meeting for a specific date by simply going to the date first here on the calendar. So let's say you want to create a meeting for the 18th of uh, January. Click on the 18th here. It takes you directly to that date and then pick the time. So 8 to 9 and the meeting has been entered. Also specify whether this meeting is private or not. Notice up here on the very top there is this option for private. When you mark a meeting as private that means that if you give access to an assistant or somebody else when you give them access you can choose not to share the private meetings. It will just show the time as busy for you but they'll not see what you're doing. This would come in handy for example you are using your work calendar for personal meetings in the evenings and weekends, take out the trash or whatever. Your assistant doesn't need to know that at 7 o'clock you're going to take out the trash. You can just mark this meeting as a private meeting. So this is how you control it. You go right here under this and you choose to mark it private. As far as the sharing aspect of it, I'll cover that in a separate video shortly. In this session, I'll demonstrate how to invite others to meetings using the Microsoft Outlook calendar. Microsoft Outlook, besides using it for email, can also be used in a powerful way for collaborating with others and choosing the best times to meet and coordinate the meetings with others in your team and in your organization. And that's the main powerful features of Microsoft Outlook, particularly in the corporate environment. It makes it a lot easier to determine what time and when they are available without having to go back and forth with multiple emails as to when was available. For the sake of demonstration, I cannot use real accounts here for other users. So I have two accounts that we are going to tinker with and hopefully you'll get the idea as to how to send the alerts and to requests. Basically, once you're in Outlook, then you need to click here on the calendar option. Choose any of those views. Right now it's on the work week. And let's say that for tomorrow on Wednesday, I want to send a meeting request with somebody else. Well, let's say I want my meeting to be at 10 o'clock. So I can either click here on new meeting or I can simply double click on this time slot from 10 o'clock and I can put my details for the meeting right here. Specify the location for the meeting, beginning time, end time. You can put the different requirements for it. And then click here under the scheduling assistant. This is going to give you your own calendar. However, you can click here under add attendees, search the global address list in your company for another user in that company. So I'll choose here instructor. It's a generic account and then I'll add them either as required or optional so you can pick and choose 
multiple users in your company from here. And let's say I choose test here. And I have two other users and I'll make them as optional attendance and then click OK. Now the system displays their availability and their calendar. By default in Microsoft Outlook, all other users within Microsoft Exchange, they can see when somebody is available. They can't see what you're doing during that time, but they can see when you are available for a meeting with them. The spots in white, that means that they are available. The ones in blue, that means that they are not available. For these other two accounts, that means that they are not using the calendar feature here, therefore no information is available. If I wanted to make it an hour long, I have a conflict with my own schedule here. So you'll also notice some suggested times here on the right hand side. Notice that they are a little bit earlier in the day for those. However, you can also go and pick here additional times. You can see and pick here the exact block of time that would fit your need where it's available and open. Once you click the specific time that makes sense to you, you can choose a reminder, then you and the person you're requesting a meeting with will be reminded at whatever time you specify here, and then choose whether this is reoccurring or not. Then once you have selected the appropriate time, you can go back to the appointment area and put additional notes that you want to put in this area here. Go here under insert and insert an attachment if you want it for the meeting then press send. At this point, the meeting will be added to your calendar as well as the recipient will receive an email. The email will look like this and it will basically say please respond and I'm accessing this via webmail. If we open this in Microsoft Outlook, it will be something very similar to this. It's basically saying that your request is from such and such an individual and then the meeting is going to be on such and such a time. This is the attachment. As a user, you can choose to accept it, mark it as tentative, or decline it. If you choose to decline it, the sender is going to receive an alert that the meeting has been declined, and they'll receive an alert provided you choose that you want to send the response back. You can send the response automatically whenever you press a check mark here. Sometimes you can accept the meeting without sending a response. Other times you might be best, if you're not going to be attending the meeting, to just choose edit the response first. Then press send here, and this is the recipient on the other end that is sending this. And if we go back here to Outlook, notice I received a confirmation that it has been accepted. And this will also be in my email here. So it will say accepted meeting for sales 2018. And also it will display the note from the requester. I could actually go here to my calendar and double click on it. And here it says that one has accepted it, zero have declined. And so if you're planning a meeting with multiple individuals, this is a great way for you to coordinate when everybody is available and also track who has accepted it and who has not. Now the way to track the exceptions is by going here under the tracking option within your appointment. I just double clicked on the appointment. You click on the tracking option and then you'll be able to see who accepted it and what the responses were. Now, sometimes there might be cases where you need to reschedule the meeting and you want to send an alert to the individuals and such. In that case, all you have to do is go back to your calendar, go back to your meeting, and then change the time and date for the meeting. Now, as you're doing this, you might want to check, for example, to use also the scheduling assistant after you have picked the time and date. You check the availability here. Notice on the 24th, there is not much happening for either one of us here for Friday. Then you select the new time and you go back to your appointment and then you can put notes and give more details. And then notice, press send update here. And then the recipients on their end will receive an email like this. The old date has been crossed out, the new one, and you need to respond to it. 
these are the responses from the user side of things. They'll press to send the response as attending it. And then you as the planner and co coordinator of the meeting, you will receive an alert of the new confirmation from the individual that you invited. So it will be here under the email that they accepted it. And also you can go under the calendar location, double click on it and then go under tracking and you can see who has accepted it and who has not. So that's how the whole process works on inviting somebody for a meeting, coordinating the best time for everyone, and checking the tracking who has accepted the meetings and who has not. In this session, I'll demonstrate how to share your calendar with somebody else. There are times where in a business environment, you want to share your calendar so that somebody else has access to it to either view the available times or to even manage your schedule. Uh, by the way, remember that this is recorded in 1080p and it's best to view this tutorial in full screen for better quality and better resolution. So to share your calendar in Microsoft Outlook, and there are a couple ways to do it. You can either go here under Share Calendar on the top or you can right click on your own calendar here and choose Share. Now if we go here under Share Calendar on the top, click on Share and then simply put in the email address of the user with whom you want to share your calendar. We'll share this with the online instructor account and then you can also ask them for permission to view their calendar as well at the same time. As you're sharing your calendar you need to define what permissions do you want to grant to them. So in this case you go here under details and you can choose limited details, full details, and such. Just see the full details, they would see all the details about that specific meeting. So you choose the proper options that you want to share, and then press send. It wants to confirm that we want to still share our calendar with these permissions. You say yes and confirm this. The recipient on their end will receive an email very similar to this. They'll click on it and they'll choose to accept the invitation to view the calendar. Now, if we, and by the way, I'm using the web version or Outlook web for here to access the email account of the uh, person that we shared the calendar with. So uh, here they'll click on accept and then notice under calendars here, they can view their own calendar, which is this one here the one in blue, or they can view also the distance learning uh, staff account. In this case, I don't have any appointments entered, but let me say I want to enter an appointment right here. And now if we go here on the web of the recipient's account, notice that um, that appointment now has been uh, synced and it's available and accessible. So that's how you share your calendar with somebody else. You can also check the permissions for uh, your calendar and assign multiple individuals multiple levels of access to your calendar. So the way you do that is by clicking, you click here on your own calendar, and again we are back to Outlook at this point, and then go under Calendar Permissions, or right click and choose Properties. So either one of them, it should get you to the same thing. Now, if we go here under Calendar Permissions or right-click on Properties, it'll bring up to, to this. Here, notice these are the default permissions and other individuals by default, they can view the free and busy times for us. If you don't want them to view anything of your calendar, you can change the defaults over here. Now, notice that Online Instructor, we uh, shared our calendar a moment ago with them these are the permissions that have been granted to the online instructor. If you want them to view also additional details, they, you can change the permissions right here. You can also add other permissions in there. And you can add an, an, another individual in here and grant them specific permissions to your calendar. You can uh, give them full details to your calendar. They can create folders and subfolders and all that type of stuff here. So basically, you're giving them the reviewer permission in this case. 
To remove somebody from your permissions list, you can simply click here under the, that individual account and then choose to remove that individual from the permissions and then simply click OK. So that's how you share your calendar with somebody else and that's how you view the permissions of your calendar with other individuals that you have granted access to. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to give delegate permissions to someone else to your calendar and also uh, your account in Microsoft Outlook. Delegate access is basically somebody creating appointments, managing your calendar, and creating entries as if it were you. So we go here under File, and then we go here under Account Settings, and then we choose Delegate Access. We choose uh, the option for Add and then we search for the individual. We find the account that we want to give delegate access to. We click on Add and then click OK. We can give access in a granular way to various aspects of our calendar here. So notice and also other options as well in Microsoft Outlook. So uh, notice that uh, you can choose whether the delegate uh, receives copies of meeting related requests. So this is where you can control whether somebody will receive those email requests on your behalf. Now for tasks you can control the properties for here whether they can create and edit and modify or whether they get no access to your tasks. Inbox, this is for email. This is where you're granting them access to create and send email on your behalf and author and create items. So you can choose the appropriate option here. Then under contacts as well, the same thing. And then also for the notes. So you basically grant them specific access to each individual item. You can also choose whether the delegates can see private items. Private items are when you create an, uh, in your calendar a meeting, but you mark it as private. This is how you can control whether they can view your uh, private meetings or not. And then you can also send them a quick email that you have granted them permissions and such. Then you click OK here. And then notice you can see who has delegate access and you can view the permissions and other properties in here. Then click OK. Now in the recipient's mailbox, they'll have received an email similar to this. And again, I'm using the uh, Outlook web access here. And it's summarizing the permissions that you have granted to that specific individual. So that's how you share your mailbox and the mailbox items such as a calendar contacts and tasks and such with someone else. couple of minutes I'm going to demonstrate how to open a shared calendar. So I'm going to start by first sharing the calendar with somebody else and then opening that shared calendar. Because I'm using both Outlook and I need access to two accounts, I'm going to open the second account here via the Outlook webmail. The individual that wants to give me access um, in their account here. So we go under the calendar, click on the calendar, and then choose Share on the top, or you can right-click and choose Sharing Permissions. Either one of those, it's the same way. So then here under Share With, I want to share the calendar from the online instructor account with a distance learning staff account. So I go here and share it with a DL staff, and then here you can choose how you want to share your calendar. It's very similar to the previous session that we did on sharing the calendar from Outlook. We can choose to give them the specific permissions, including the delegate permission. And in this case, I'm just simply going to say full details. That means that they can view the full details and then simply press send. Now at this point, the recipient will get an email with a link to open the shared calendar. Notice. If I go to my email now, the distance learning staff account, and then notice you have the option for accepting the invitation to open that shared calendar. 
Now, if I choose to accept it from here, it takes me directly to my calendars, or I could have gone to calendars here uh, sometime later and notice the shared calendar for online instructor. If you don't want it, you can simply uncheck it here and it will be not displayed. Of course, as you are working with a calendar, remember that you have these different views on the top as well. If you're working with shared calendars, uh, remember you can also overlay those calendars. I don't have too many meetings at this point in these calendars because it's just for the sake of the tutorial, but you can actually right click on one of the calendars here and choose overlay and it's basically going to overlay one on top of the other. If you don't want the overlaying anymore, you can simply right click and choose to change the overlay. Remember as well, when you're working with shared calendars or any types of calendars, you can search for specific appointments and things of that nature here on the top right side. And it should display the different uh, meetings and uh, search your calendar for all the different meetings that you have. To clear the filter, you simply click on the X here on the top right. If for some reason you don't want access to that specific calendar anymore, you can just right click on it, choose delete calendar. That's going to delete it only from your account from showing up. It's not going to delete that individual's account. If for some reason you didn't get that email to open the shared calendar or the individual didn't send you the option for the email, you can also open a calendar by going to the calendars option here. And then you click on open a shared calendar or open a calendar and you can choose from the address book or under the shared, open a shared calendar. And then you search for the name of the individual that has uh, potentially shared it with you. And notice since they had shared it with you, the system just opens it and it will be added to your list of calendars. If they had not shared it with you already, then you can ask for permission to share it and they have to grant you permission first. That's how you share a calendar from Outlook Web and then open it here in uh, Microsoft Outlook. The reason why we had to use the Outlook Web again, it was because of the dual account thing for the sake of this tutorial. session we are going to explore the People Hub in Microsoft Outlook. One of the nice features of Outlook is, is that it incorporates multiple modules. We discussed so far the uh, mail module. We discussed the, the calendaring option for making appointments and scheduling events and things of that nature. And now we are going to explore the People module. People module, it used to be called Contacts in the previous versions of Outlook, and it's still the same type of idea. You're managing the uh, people or the contacts in your uh, Microsoft Outlook. So we click here on People in the bottom, uh, bottom left. Of course, you have the list of contacts. You can uh, search for these uh, contacts. And then typically it will display the information here on the right hand side if there was uh, further information. Now in my case, I just imported some very basic information for each individual, but uh, typically you'd have a lot more information on the right hand side. You have the different letters of the alphabet, so if you, have, uh, t if you want to list all the people starting with G, uh, or in this case it's by last name, so G, uh, sorting them by last name. So we can skip to that specific letter, and then the details, once we click on each individual, the details will show up on the right-hand side. Now, if we wanted um, a different view for this, notice that uh, right here under the current the different views, the current view, you can change this. So that default is the people view, and then if you want the business card, something like this, if you want to see the full card, the full card it would be basically all the information related to that individual and um, that we have entered. In my case, again, I don't have that much information entered, so not much is going to be displayed, but that's how you change it. If you want to just view their phone numbers, if you want to view a listing of them. Additionally, here on the left-hand side, you have the options for creating a new contact that I'll display in a moment then creating a group, a distribution disk, 
uh, deleting the contact, of course, you can do it from here, and then scheduling a meeting with that specific individual from here, and so on. Then further uh, to the right, you can create a mail merge directly from the contacts option. And in some of these options, I'll cover them in a moment as well. But for now, we are just exploring this general hub or the, this module within Microsoft Outlook. And then if somebody shared contacts with you, you'd open those shared contacts from this option as well. Additionally, you can categorize those uh, specific contacts by choosing specific categories or color-coded categories. And if you don't like some kind of code or setting here, you can uh, create new categories from the All Categories option. Following up and also marking uh, uh, contact as private, that typically is useful if you don't want your assistant, let's say you have given delegate access to somebody for your full mailbox or just contacts or a specific module and you're marking a, a contact or an item as private, in that case, by default, the delegates cannot view the private contacts or items. Now to create a contact, you click here on a new contact and then basically just fill in all this information for that specific contact. So we put in the full name, the job title, the email address, and basically fill in the web page, the business address, home address, and such. Then you put in their phone number, the home number, fax, mobile, and all that type of thing. Additionally, you can place notes in here as well. So basically the idea here is to place as many details as you can for this contact. Notice you also can add a picture to your contacts by clicking on the picture item right there. And uh, you have to locate the picture that you have for Huber. Then click OK. And notice the picture will be placed as part of that contact. Then we click on Save and Close. And now that uh, should be listed here under Hubert Sims. So notice it's down here. And notice at this point, it's displaying all the different fields that we have completed or filled up for this contact. So that's how we create a contact within Microsoft Outlook, the People Hub or the People Module. session we are going to learn how to create a contact group or a distribution list within Microsoft Outlook. So we are here under the contacts module in Microsoft Outlook and we have these uh, specific individuals. So let's assume that every so often you need to send out an email to a distribution list. To create a distribution list we go here under new contact group and we first have to give a name for this distribution list or for this contact group. So we'll call it new faculty. List. And then the next step here is to add the members to this distribution list. So we click on add members and you can add members from the Outlook contacts that you have within the people module in Microsoft Outlook or you can choose the address book. The address book is the company-wide address books in Microsoft Exchange, or you can just simply add one manually to that distribution list by typing in their email address. First, we are going to add this from the contacts that we have in Microsoft Outlook. So click on it, and then notice we have here, we can search by name, and it's gonna display all the names here of our contacts. Or if we wanted to search by more fields, for example, such as last name and so on, then we can just still simply type it in there and then press go and it will display the contact that we want. You can uh, either double click on it and it will put it under the members list here in the bottom. Or if we go back to here to under name only and we browse through all of our contacts, we could simply hold down the control key and pick whichever individuals we want to add to that distribution list or to that group. Once we have selected that by holding down the control key and clicking on each name, then we click on members. That basically adds them to the members list. Then click OK. And then at this, those members that we picked 
have been added to the distribution list. The next thing that you need to do from with this distribution list is to save it because otherwise if you're not you're going to lose it. It's like so we click here on save and close and now the distribution list should show up in the list of contacts in here. Now if we wanted to search for it, notice I just typed part of the name. Notice this is our distribution list and you can expand this list to view further more. You can double click on it and it will open up that distribution list where you can add more individuals to it or take some individual out from here. Now to add additional members, you can go also and use the address book. If you wanted to add an address manually, you simply can fill in the display name and the um, email address. Of course, it has to be a correct email address. I'm making that up at this point. We click on OK and it's the system is going to add it to the distribution list. Now to save it, you simply click on close and it will save it. Now to use a distribution list, you simply can either come here to contacts and then open the new faculty distribution list by just double clicking on it and then choose here to email them. So this is one option and then just simply type in the subject and then the message. Simply press send just like you'd send another email. Now all the members in that distribution list will receive the email. Now keep in mind also the distribution lists, you cannot make them with thousands and thousands of email addresses. That's because certain email systems, they'll limit the number of recipients within a distribution list. So therefore, it's best to have those lists in smaller chunks or smaller parts if you're going to have hundreds of them. If you're going to send to thousands of users and such, you can either consider an email merge or you can consider some other tool for mass mailings and such. You can also send to a distribution list from the email module as well. So if we go back to the email module here and we click on the new email and then just start typing in here new faculty. Now right now it's showing up for me automatically because I had used it a moment ago. But if for some reason that does not show up for you or you're not sure how to navigate to it, you can either hold down the control key and press K and it'll look it up automatically for you. That's a trick uh, for using names. Or you can click here under the two and then search for your distribution list. And notice we have new faculty here. And then click OK and now it's, uh, you can send the email that way or the control K option is basically you type part of the uh, contact's name or the distribution list name, you hold down the control key and press K, it will um, populate that automatically for you. And it will bring all the possible options as well. So that's how you create a distribution list or a group of contacts and that's how you send In this session, I will demonstrate how to share contacts with another individual from Microsoft Outlook. So we are here in the Contacts module or in the People module in Outlook. And notice we have here my contacts. And at this point, I want to share this with another individual. From here, I click on Contacts right below my contacts and then click on Share Contacts. And then you choose the individual that we want to share the contacts with and then press send. Notice we have to confirm the permission that we want to authorize here. Click on yes. Once you have shared your contacts with that individual, on their end they will be able to open the contacts that you have shared with them. And the way they open those contacts would be for them to go to the people module, to go under the contacts uh, option for them, and then they'll click on open shared contacts and then a search for your name, the DL staff in this case. And then the contacts that you have shared with them will show up under here, under the shared contacts. I cannot demonstrate this for now because I've had to open two separate sessions of Microsoft Outlook in order to actually demonstrate it fully.
In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to update the contact details and also how to share your contact with another individual via email, how to send what's called a V card. Let's say we have here the Hubert account. And to update that Hubert account, of course, we can search for it, get to this contact, and then double click on it, and then update any of those fields and put additional information in there and such. So the idea here is to update your own contact and then uh, send this as a V card to somebody else whenever you're meeting with somebody and such. Instead of exchanging business cards, you're sending them in an electronic business card. Of course, it's important here not to include any information that you don't want them to have. So you want to kind of clean out and polish your business card with only the information that you want. Once you have updated the business card, you can click on save and close, or you can actually send it from here as well. Notice you can customize all kinds of other things. It's very similar to what we did a moment ago. You can change the image size and the background and all that type of thing, and customize it with all kinds of additional properties that you may want changing it just like a real business card. Click OK, and then press to save the changes. And then if we wanted to send this as a business card to someone, we can click on the card name here, and then you can choose to forward it, to send it, and send it as an Outlook contact or as a business card. Both of them, they'll be just like a uh, an attachment to that specific email. So if we choose as a business card, it'll look like that. And then you can send it to that specific individual. Press send. And they, on their end, when they go to their email, they'll receive an email very similar to this. And they can also notice they are getting the business card to download it as well. So if I click here to download, and then once they download it, they can add it to their contacts, whether in Windows or if they're using Outlook, they'll be able to add it to my Outlook as a contact. In some other cases where the contact already exists with uh, pretty much all the properties, you can simply click on Update here and it'll update all the different properties for that contact. So that's how you update a contact, update the business card for the contact, and send it to somebody else. session I'm going to demonstrate how to track email correspondence with other individuals in Microsoft Outlook by using the people pane within the email module. We are interacting back and forth with a lot of individuals and we want to make sure to see very easily all the correspondence back and forth whether it's meetings or emails and such with that individual. The trick here is to go back to the email module and then go here under the View tab in the ribbon, and then enable the People pane here under People pane. Typically, by default, that is off. So we want to choose here uh, Normal. And that enables this stuff here in the bottom. All the correspondence, all the attachments, all the meetings that you have had with that individual. This is just another email, but basically for every email or every contact that you're interacting with, you're looking to all the interactions that have taken place between back and forth, whether they were mail messages, whether they were attachments, or even meetings. In this case, I don't have many meetings here, but that's where they would show up. You can also sort them either direction. Additionally, notice you can collapse this, and then when you need to, you can bring it up or down and hide it or unhide it. So this is a really powerful feature in identifying and keeping track of all the correspondence in one snapshot as you're navigating through your messages and mean keeping track of what your correspondence was with that specific individual. In 
this next session, we're going to learn how to use Quick Steps in Microsoft Outlook 2016. The Quick Steps are a way for us to automate some of the processes in managing email and simplifying our workflow throughout the day in Microsoft Outlook. Here's how it works. Basically, let's say we have uh, specific emails and we want to mark them with a single click as work related or to kind of ca categorize them or have the system do something with a single click. So here in our case, let's say I want to mark this as work related. I simply click on the message, then go here under work related and the system will categorize it under work related automatically. You can uh, delete and reply to it, or you can send this to the manager or a team or mark it as done. So if I want to mark it as done, just click on done, and then I choose to move it to a folder and then press save. Before you start using those quick steps, it's actually important that you tweak those steps to do what you want it to do. So if, for example, to manager, you have to define who your manager is. So it's gonna forward the message to, that uh, manager, but the system first needs to know who the manager is. Or if you want to say this, I wanted to send it to the whole team, you have to tell the system who the team members are. So to customize those, all you have to do is you go down here to the bottom of this option here, and you choose manage quick steps. Here under to manager, uh, notice it's going to forward it. And, but yet we need to specify who the manager is by clicking here on edit. And then under the two, we need to specify the email address of the manager. And in my case, I'm gonna use a generic account. It's gonna forward it by default, but you can choose additional actions here as well as to what to do and, and such. But for now, it's just gonna forward it by default. Then you can also specify a shortcut for this. So if you press Control Shift and one, for example, that will uh, take that action with a single keyboard shortcut. Then you press save. Then for the team email, uh, you need to specify as to what you want it to do. Here it's gonna create a new message, but we need to still tell the system who the team members are. You just need to keep on typing the email addresses. And you can have multiple actions again, like uh, let's say market as important. You can choose the action here under the drop down to market as important. Then you can assign also a keyboard shortcut as well, and then click on save. You can create additional quick actions as well with that single click. So click on okay here. And now if I wanted to send, let's say this message to my manager, you just click on manager, now this you can customize and add a little of additional detail here and then press send. So it knows who to send it to and, and such. It's gonna copy the message and forward it to them. If you wanted to create a team email, you simply click on team email. It's gonna have all the addresses of the team. You just type in the subject. You can even pre-fill that uh, subject if you wanted by modifying the criteria there in the, or the definition of the team mail and then press send. Again, the idea here is to use those quick steps to simplify your work. So first you have to define those steps, customize the steps, and then start using them by either a shortcut key or by simply clicking on those options. This session we are going to move to another module within Microsoft Outlook and that is using tasks. So if we go here in the bottom left under the list of modules, we'll click on tasks and this is where you can see the list of tasks that you have to complete or you can define, create uh, new tasks and such. This is kind of the hub of all your tasks within Outlook. Tasks can be created as you're viewing the emails to follow up with something. So for example, in here, flag this item to follow up with it. And that will show up under tasks once I get to the tasks module. So uh, notice I can go in here and also use follow up next week or tomorrow and such. So it's gonna put the flag here, but yet those tasks then will show up in the tasks module in there. Notice we said to uh, follow up with it tomorrow. It's marked here for tomorrow. 
and this is for today. So in the tasks module, in the top left here, you have the option to create a new task, to create a new email, to delete specific tasks. Then you can manage those tasks and mark them as complete. So for example, this one, let's say I worked on it. Now I want to mark it as complete. I can mark it right here, and now it will take it off the list. Additionally, here on the right-hand side, we can view various options, such as the detailed items for the tasks here, a detailed view, or a simple list view, or the to-do list, what remains to be done, or view the priority by priority, active tasks that I have to complete, and completed tasks. So basically, we're just changing the different views and sorting through those different views. Remember also you can uh, search for specific tasks here on the top right by simply typing in there. So notice I'm searching for the word published and these are the two tasks that have that word in there. To clear the filter we click here on close search and then the filter will be cleared. So you have here my tasks, so you have the, uh, the to-do list, things that are uh, marked from your email, and then you also have specific additional tasks. Now to create a new task, we can either type, start typing right here, or we can go here under new task, and then give it a subject. And then you can specify the start date and the end date. And then whether the status, what the status is, whether you have started or whether it's in progress and such. And then you can also set a reminder, the time as well. And then you can place here details, basically all the details that you want to know. You can also schedule it so it recurs at a specific time and date. And if you want that to take place, you go here under recurrence and then you choose, let's say, every week on Monday, starting from this date to that date, and then end it after three occurrences. Then you click OK, and now it's going to schedule it so that it takes place in the sequence that you specified. You can also categorize this to be clients or whatever it is that you want to specify. Then you can also mark it as of high importance and then also mark it as private if you don't want your delegate uh, with whom you have shared uh, your calendar to be able to see that task. And of course, you can insert additional modules and additional things here, very similar to the email to format this however you want. So this is kind of the fancy way of customizing your task content. Then click on Save and Close. And now the task has been listed here and has been created. You can choose the different views if you wanted to. Now at certain times, you might also want to send updates for this task. So to send an update for the task, you can simply open up the task here. And then you can choose here the option to send a report. So send a report, you can put the individual's name in there. And then it's going to copy all of the details about your task and just type a quick report and then press send and that's how you send a status report. Notice um, as you are changing the status report you can also change here the percent complete. Notice also under the status itself you can change it to in progress and update the status as to what you want. So basically the idea here is that you are creating tasks keeping track of those tasks and details on them. To mark the task as complete, click here Mark as Complete when ready. If you're in the uh, email module here, you can change the view so that the tasks will show up on the right panel here. To do that, you click here on View, and then you go under the To-Do bar on the right-hand side, and you choose Tasks here. And then the tasks will be listed so that they are available to you from a how you can assign a task to someone else within your organization. This comes in handy for you to keep track or to have other individuals or with whom you work complete certain tasks and send you updates every so often. You can either use an existing task for this or you can create a new task. So let's say we create a new task here 
and then the start date, let's say it'll be today, the end date, it'll be uh, six months from now. You can set it so that it sends a reminder, the day and the time for the reminder and such, and then the priority, you can specify whether it's high priority and such. Post the details down here, and if you wanted the recurrence as well, you can change it from here like we did earlier. To assign it, you simply click on the Assign Task. Then you specify who you want to assign it to, and then you have the subject, the details for here and such, and then you want to keep an updated copy of this task in your task list, and also send me a report when the task is complete. Once Hubert, in this case, completes the task, then you'll receive a report, and also you'll be able to see the details of that task from the list of your tasks in your task list. So we press Send here. And in this case, uh, the owner of this task becomes Hubert, since we are assigning it to him. The individual will receive the task. It will show up on their task list on their uh, Microsoft Outlook account. And once it's completed, you'll receive an email. Now, for you as well, it will show up over here under the task if you chose to have it under the along with your Outlook mail here, or it will show up on your tasks list. If you wanted to send an additional note or something or an update or request a status report or what, you can simply go here under Send Status Report and just add additional details about that task. So notice it's waiting for a report from the recipient. So that will show up on their account until it's completed and marked as complete. So that's how tasks work in a nutshell, in creating a task, in assigning a task to another individual. And the power of Outlook here comes in being able to assign those tasks to other individuals within your team and being able to keep track of them. In this next session, I'm going to go over the Notes module within the Microsoft Outlook application. If you go here on the left-hand side, next to the Tasks item, you should be able to locate the Notes option. If you can't see it and such, uh, by the way, you can click here on Navigation Options and choose how many number of items to be showing in there. Now, the Notes are designed so that you can just create simple notes for you to keep track of things. This could be as simple as a telephone number if you don't want to create a contact or a note to remember to do something. These are not tasks, but uh, just a simple uh, sticky note, basically. So on the Note module, you'll have the notes here on the left-hand side. You have um, the options to create new notes, to create new items and such, then to see the different notes uh, as a list or as an icon. In my case, I don't have many or any notes at this point, but you can change the view from here and the notes that you have created in the last seven days. Now, to create a new note, all you have to do is click on New Note here and simply start typing. You can resize those notes, name it here, and that is one of the notes. Of course, uh, when creating those notes, you can simply copy and paste the content from whatever other sites and such for the directions and things of that nature that you want to keep track of. You could share them with other individuals if necessary by just choosing Share Notes here and then uh, specify the email address of that individual that you want to share them with, and they will be able to access them from Microsoft Outlook on their end. session I'll demonstrate how to forward your email from Microsoft Exchange account to another personal email account. This is provided that your company allows you to do that. The best way to do this is by using Microsoft Outlook Web Access or the web module for Microsoft Exchange. So to do that you basically log into your Exchange mail over the web and then you go here under the gear icon and of course we are using here Microsoft Exchange 2016 
then go under Options, and then go under Inbox and Sweep Rules. Here we're going to create a new rule by clicking on this Add icon, and then we're going to say Forward Email. And then we choose one of the options, one of the conditions, apply it to all messages, and then do this, do the following action for all the messages. So we want to forward or redirect or send it. So in this case, we want to keep an uh, email in the mailbox, but then forward it to another account or another individual automatically. Here we click on uh, forward the message to. And then if it is within the organization, you can search for people over here. If it's um, outside of the organization, you can just type the, the email address uh, next to the word to. It's a little tricky there <laughs> because you don't uh, figure out that that's where you'd be typing, but that's how it is. So you just type the email address in there, and then we press OK here. Now at this point, all the new mail messages will be forwarded. Anything from online instructor here will be forwarded to DL staff account. And also the email messages will remain in your email box. So you can use this to forward to a personal Gmail account or some other account uh, so that you have one mailbox to manage, provided your company allows this. By the way, you can do these rules for uh, specific messages, just uh, if it has a keyword in it to take a specific action and such. And um, those specific rules, you can do them from Outlook itself or through the web module of Microsoft Exchange. Now, if we want to deactivate this rule, we go back here under the Options, the gear icon, go under Options, and then under Inbox and Sweep Rules, and then choose to deactivate the rule and then press Save Changes. Of course, you could um, delete it as well if you're sure you no longer need it. session I'm going to demonstrate how to work with the Outlook data. We're going to cover how to back up uh, your Outlook mailbox. So to back up your Outlook mailbox, you go here under File, and then you go under Open and Export, and then choose here Import, Export, and then choose to export to a file. So we are going to back up to create a PSD file of your Outlook data. Then we click on Next. And then we want to choose the Outlook PST. And then you choose your whole mailbox with all the messages and such, including the subfolders. Then click on Next. Choose where you want to back it up. Notice it's putting on the Documents, Outlook, and all that type of thing. Click on Finish. And then press OK. It's going to take a little time, depending on how much uh, data you have. In this case, it didn't take as much because this is just a test account for us to do this tutorial. Now, to restore this file, you could either go here under File and then choose Open or Export. And you could open a data file from here. So you can open that specific backup file. And now that backup file that we had from before, it has all the messages, all the stuff that we had from before in here. So that's one way to open it. The other way that you can do it is if you don't want a separate data file from here, and let's say you're setting things up from uh, scratch or the system crashed or you want to get to those old messages to import, you can go here under File and then choose Open and Export choose import export and then you can choose to import from another program or a file so we are just doing the reverse now we are importing we click on next we choose a data file pst next we find the backup where we had stored it earlier and then click on next and then it will repopulate it will recreate and add all those items to the same structure of your actual account. So I'm not going to do that in this case, because there is no need for me to do it, but it will kind of replace all the stuff here on the left 
with items that you had backed up from that PSD file. Now the nice thing here is also from time to time, if you have a lot of contacts, you can export those contacts only to a PST file and restore them or have them as a backup and such. So basically the idea here is we are backing up and restoring only certain parts of that Outlook account. So we click here on File and then choose Open and Export. We go under Import Export. We choose Export to a File, Next, and then we choose PST, Next, and then here go and pick the contacts that you want. So we want just the contacts module. Choose the subfolder for contacts and then click on Next and then you can call this just contacts. Finish. You can choose to enter a password. There's typically no need to enter a password unless you want it to be really secure. And then at some point in time or um, to restore it, you simply go under File, Import, Export, Import from a File, PST, browse for it. So we want contacts. And then you can choose to allow duplicates or not, and then just press Next, and it'll bring in all those contacts. You can choose where to place them and what account and such, and press Finish, and then the contacts will be imported. So in this case, in the second scenario, we imported only a specific item from our Outlook account. So this is it. Uh, thank you for watching and for making it this far in the tutorial. I hope this has been helpful for you. Subscribe to this channel first and view the other resources that are available within this YouTube channel and spread the word. That is one way that you can help with this work. My hope is that uh, people from across the world will be able to use these resources to advance in their careers, to advance in their knowledge, and even for those that are disadvantaged that they cannot afford to pay for a class online and such, that they can take advantage of these resources. Hello, my name is Sally Caselli. The following is a comprehensive tutorial on using Windows 11. We will start with the very basics and then proceed with more advanced features in order to master using Windows 11. I have designed this tutorial with a user in mind so that one can effectively master using Windows 11 for personal use or in the workplace. This tutorial can come in handy for teachers to teach using Windows 11, or it can be used also for employee training. As you watch the video, please consider referencing the quick guide posted in the video description. The best way to learn using Windows 11 is to also practice the described features hands-on while you watch the video. So as we get started with the Windows 11 tutorial, first let me touch on some of the new features. Those features, I'll um, simply mention them at this point, but I'll go into more details later in the tutorial. As soon as you log into the system, one of the first things that you'll notice is that the taskbar layout has changed. It has changed in the location and also the items in the taskbar. So in the previous versions of Windows, the Start menu used to be on the bottom left of Windows. Now it has moved to the center. And it's, uh, it's somewhat similar to the Mac OS. Now, the, also the options as part of the taskbar have changed as well. And this is a little bit more refined at this point. So by default, typically you have the Start menu here, the Search option, which is very heavily integrated and a very major improvement in Windows 11. 
you have the virtual desktops, and I'll get into more uh, later as to how that works, the widgets, and then you have the integration of Microsoft Teams, chat and video conferencing as part of the operating system, uh, getting to the web using Microsoft Edge, Windows File Explorer, which is traditional. It has been as part of the taskbar, but it's just in a more logical order and then access to email as well. And this is part of the revamped user interface or UI is that you have a completely different color scheme and layout of the components in Windows 11. You'll notice the rounded corners here. The login and logout has been changed, so it looks different here. And even the shutting down of the computer, it's now in a new location here in the start menu. There are also some behind the scenes features and enhancements to the operating system such as uh, better memory management of the applications by the operating system. Obviously, this will happen behind the scenes. With the emergence of the larger monitors and so on, now uh, win Windows allows you to resize a window uh, by simply holding the mouse on the maximize button here for any of the applications, and you can choose a particular layout of your monitor. So if I wanted to put Microsoft Word here as part of only half the screen, I can simply do that. Now, if I wanted to open a different application as well and have it as part of the other half of the screen, notice I simply hold the mouse here and then uh, select the right-hand side and it will split the screen directly in half. There are enhancements related to gaming. There is a gaming mode. There is also a widgets mode. So if you click here on widgets, it will display the weather. You can choose uh, stocks and calendar and uh, news stories. And you can customize this as well as you prefer. You can now also run Android apps on Windows 11 using the Amazon Web Store. So I'll cover all of these features, including how to use the operating system and mastering it so that you can be effective in the workplace or for personal work in using this new operating system. So please stay tuned. In this module, I will go over some of the concepts related to the Windows 11 taskbar. The taskbar is typically one of the tools of an operating system that it's used as a quick way to launch specific operating system functions. So you want to get to settings, for example. You want to get to launch the different applications or launch your files. So you need a way to get started. If you take an example of a, a phone, for example, a smartphone, your taskbar, it would be the little icons on the very bottom of your phone to launch, for example, the web browser or to make a call or to send a text. So in this case, here in Windows 11, the taskbar is this set of icons here in the bottom. Now it's uh, in the middle of the uh, screen, very similar to Mac OS. This allows you to uh, start uh, to view the start menu, the list of applications. It allows you to search, to perform, in this case, uh, quick searches, to access virtual desktops and other functions as well. Now, on the far right here, you also have some additional functions. For example, the network connectivity, the battery usage, power usage, other quick settings, so in Windows 11, this was modified. Now let's get uh, to some of the components of the taskbar here. And then we'll get into how to customize the taskbar. So one of the first options here is a start menu. You'll notice that the start menu has been revamped to the new user interface. You can search directly for an application by either typing here, for example, you type Word or Excel or whatever, and 
it will bring it up and you can launch it or you can navigate pinned applications as part of your uh, options here or the display you can get to all the apps in the operating system from here or there are also recommended apps as well as uh, recommended or what you have used recently one of the other uh, things to note as part of the new start menu is also this is where you log in and log out so uh, your account you can click here on your account and this is where you can lock your computer or you can sign out or change account here in the bottom of the start menu to the far bottom right here you have uh, the options to power off the computer so this is kind of different from the previous versions of uh, Windows. The next uh, part of the taskbar is the search menu. So if we go here to click on search, and by the way, you can uh, get to the search as well by pressing the Windows key on the keyboard and it will launch the same thing. And notice here you have uh, you can search for everything where you can search only specific apps, documents, or the web. And here on the far right under options, this is where you can change the search settings and the indexing and things of that nature as well. So it's very easy. You press the Windows key, it will bring up the search capability. The third option here is the virtual desktops. So virtual desktops is a functionality where you can launch specific programs on a workspace. So right now I have here my, uh, let's say, Let's say I have Word opened, and I can have other programs, but now, let's say I'm, and I have, let's say, five or six programs, but then all of a sudden I need to meet with a client. And instead of me having to clear my desktop and having to uh, prepare my desktop to share my screen and so on, I can come down here to the virtual desktops area, click on it, and create a new virtual desktop. Now, at this point, it's going to be a clean start. I can uh, follow up with a client, work with them, open new applications, and switch between the multiple virtual desktops in a very easy way by retaining the previous settings. Now, for me to go back to the previous desktop, I can simply click here on the or hold the mouse on virtual desktops icon and then switch to my first virtual desktop where I'll get access to my apps and settings and things like that. The other cool feature as part of the new Windows taskbar is the widgets. To, to access the widgets, you can click on widgets here, and then you can have the weather, you can have the Outlook calendar reminder, sports, and you can add other widgets of your preference as well, such as traffic and so on. And uh, if you scroll down, there, are, there is news and additional uh, stock updates and things of that nature as well. To the right of this, there is the chat. This is an option where um, Microsoft is integrating Microsoft Teams, video conferencing, chatting, and so on as part of this operating system. Then next here, uh, by default, you'll have access to Microsoft Edge, which is uh, one of the web browsers, obviously. Then you have the File Explorer, and I'll get into more of those concepts shortly, and then email. Now, to customize those settings uh, for the taskbar, you can right-click on it and choose Taskbar Settings. Now, notice one thing that is different from previous versions is that you don't have the task manager and a, a whole bunch of other options. You simply have now the task settings. Under task settings, this is where you can customize whether you want search to show up as part of the taskbar, whether you want the task view to show up, like those buttons that we saw down here, whether you want them to be displayed or not. Now, if you have a touch screen, you might want to enable the option for pen menu. Now, in most cases, that would be enabled, but uh, you if it's not, this is where you enable it. If you don't like the taskbar in the center here, how Microsoft has set it by default, you can change it to be on the left, and it will be very similar to the Windows 10 or Windows 7. If you have multiple displays, you can control whether you want your taskbar to show up on all displays 
and this you'd have to have a check mark in here for that. Now as part of the taskbar there is also in the start menu area here if you right click on it you have a bunch of options very similar to the old Windows 10 and Windows 7 where you can get to certain key areas in your computer so for example if you need to check the disk management or if you want to check the computer management devices and uh, tool and uh, resources in your computer or if you want to get to the task manager this is how you now get to it and or the run command that it used to be er, before and even shut down and restart the computer it's by right clicking on the start menu on the far right you have this uh, command center or um, quick action center and we'll get into that uh, later as well but for now here is where you can configure and connect to the Wi-Fi airplane mode and then change accessibility settings uh, things related to the battery and so on so this is kind of the quick settings for your desktop to change your time clock um, and your computer you can do it from here uh, along with adjustments of the notification settings while you are focusing on work. That's in a nutshell in order to keep this uh, fairly short some of the functionality and the usage of the task manager remember it's very similar to your smartphone with a set of functions at the very bottom of your screen in order to launch various applications or settings in your computer or functions in your computer as part of the operating system. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and focus on the Windows Start menu and show you how you can pin applications to the menu or to the taskbar, Windows taskbar. These are a couple of common functions in the business environment and also for the effective use of the application. On the bottom left here on the taskbar, you have the Start menu. Click on it. Now notice some of the components of the start menu at this point. On the top you have the search. You can simply start typing and it will uh, search for apps. It will uh, search for files in your computer or even web pages as well. It will search the web. Right below you have here the pinned applications. These are common applications that uh, either Microsoft has pinned and made them more obvious for you to access or there are applications that you can pin and they will be available for quick use for you in the future. To access all the applications in your computer, you click on all apps here and it will display all your applications and you can search for them or just uh, simply browse. At the bottom half of the screen here, you have some of the recommended items, either files or, uh, or applications that you have used. At the very bottom of the start menu, you have your account. So this is where you can lock the computer, you can sign out of the computer or sign in to a different account, so switch accounts. On the far right here, this is the option where you can power off the computer or restart it or hibernate or put the computer into sleep mode. So Again, the start menu, it's just a, a mechanism for you to browse the various applications in your computer and some of the key functions in the computer, such as logging out. Obviously, notice the new user interface. It's uh, completely revamped. Let's say that I want an application to show up as part of my start menu, to show up in this area. So let's say I want Excel. So to do that, I can simply search here for Excel or I could have navigated to the list of all programs and here you choose to pin it to start menu. Now this, if we click back on the start menu, you'll notice that Excel has been added to the list. And let's say that uh, I want an application to show up also on the taskbar on the very bottom here so I can always have quicker access to it. 
to do that, you simply search for the program first and then you right click on the app or whatever it is and you choose to pin to the taskbar. From this time on, Microsoft Word will be part of the taskbar where I can launch it very easily. If for some reason I changed my mind, you can right click on it and choose to unpin it from the taskbar. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'm going to go over some of the concepts related to the desktop component of the operating system. So the desktop is simply an area where you can place various icons in order to launch specific programs in your computer. And in a lot of other cases, you can place shortcuts to a website or even shortcuts to files. So in this case, we have a bunch of the icons or programs here on the left. Now the difference here is that in order for me to open an application from here, for example, Microsoft Edge, I need to double click on these icons to open them up. While from the taskbar here in the bottom, if I'm launching something from the taskbar, I'll click only one time in order to open that application. So that's one of the differences. Now, Think of the desktop very similar to on your smartphone, on the main area of your screen on your smartphone, you typically have a bunch of little icons where you launch. For example, whether it's a map application or your chat or Facebook app or whatever it is, but those will be in the main part of the screen. Those items in the very bottom of the screen where you can make a phone call like uh, or send a text message, that would be part of the taskbar equivalent. Now on the upper part you'd have the area to launch those icons. So here the desktop it just serves that a placeholder for the icons. As you install different programs different icons will show up on the desktop. What shows up on the desktop depends on whether the application has been configured by default to put an icon on the desktop. You can customize a view of it by simply right clicking on it and notice you have a bunch of the options here. You can change the view to have larger icons or uh, different types of icons and whether to arrange the icons in the, on your desktop a certain way, align them and even to show or not show the icons on the desktop. Also, you can create new shortcuts or new folders on the desktop. So if I want a new text document there, I can just simply uh, click on New here, choose New Document or New Excel Document, whatever I want, and there it is. Now, of course, to move those things around, you can drag them at wherever you want them. To delete an icon from the desktop, that is quite obvious. You simply select it and you press Delete. One of the key components of the desktop is also the access to the recycle bin. So typically, anytime you delete something from your computer, it's going to put it automatically in a recycle bin. So if you wanted to retrieve something from a recycle bin, you can double click on it and then it will display what you have recently deleted. Here I can right click on it and choose to restore it. Now to customize the desktop, right click here on the desktop, choose to personalize it. And then under personalize, this is where you can change a lot of the different settings such as the color themes, the lock screen and uh, taskbar items and things like that, fonts and so on. And obviously here we are personalizing the background and so on. So you can pick different backgrounds, uh, photos, change those contrasts and so on. Think of it like modifying the settings on your smartphone to change the visual look and feel of the applications in there. Another functionality that you can access through the desktop by right clicking anywhere on the screen. Here you can also choose to change the display settings. If I wanted to change the font size on the monitor, the resolution and so on, this is where I'd make those changes by right clicking and choosing display settings and then work from here. If I right click again on the desktop, notice there are some additional options here. And this is more like a look and feel 
what used to be on Windows 10. In this session of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'm going to go over opening an application and managing an application from Windows 11. Now this is a very basic concept that most of you have used, but yet if somebody is uh, for the first time trying to understand the Windows 11 operating system, this would potentially help. So to launch an application, if, it, if the application is already in the taskbar, you can simply click on it and single click and it will open up. For example, here Microsoft Edge. If I wanted to open an application from the Start menu, you just simply click on Start and then pick the application from here or under the All Apps. So in that case, I'm simply finding it and then clicking on it and then launching it. If the application is also listed on the desktop and you want to launch it from the desktop, here you'd have to double click instead of single clicking and that will perform the same functions. One of the features in Windows 11, in any application actually, is that on the top right here, typically, you have these controls. Now on a MacBook or on a Mac OS, those controls would be on the left-hand side. You can minimize this app by clicking on the little minus icon in the bottom left, and it will bring it down to the taskbar and you can get a preview or relaunch it by clicking on it again. Uh, the other option here is this um, minimize maximize uh, option. What you see here on the screen, this is the new feature in Windows 11. And this allows you, with the emergence of the larger desktops, you simply hold the mouse on the icon here on the middle one and then you can select to park this application in half of your screen or a certain position of your screen so if I wanted just on the bottom right top corner the fourth of the screen I'll click on this and now it's only on that part of the screen and then I can have something else on a different part of the screen so that's another option where you can adjust the display depending on what you want to close the application, you can simply click here on the X on the top right, and that is standard with other versions of the Windows. Now, in some cases, when you are working on an application, it crashed on you, and you just uh, need to somehow make sure to close it without rebooting the computer. One of the ways to do that is to access or to close the application from the taskbar. So let's say the application is here, somehow it's misbehaving. Now I need to get to the taskbar to close it. To access a taskbar, and by the way, this has changed, you right click here on the Windows icon and you click on Task Manager. Or you can simply go to the search option and type Task Manager. And now this will give you typically something uh, like this. It will show up. Uh, task Manager and the apps that you currently have opened. So if I wanted to end this application forcefully, I'll click on the application and then choose End Task. In some cases, that application may not show up in this list, and then in that case, you can click here on More Details and then find the application and choose End Task. To find it, you'll click here on Processes. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'm going to go over how to switch between applications in Windows 11. The process is very much uh, the same as previous versions of Windows, but uh, for the purpose of understanding how the Windows 11 operating system works, I'll cover it here as well. So let's say we have two applications, two or more applications opened, and 
we need to switch between them. And we have only one monitor. Let's say I wanted to switch to Word. One of the options is to simply go to the taskbar here in the bottom and then click on Word and switch between the two. If I have more than two applications opened, obviously the process is going to be very much the same. So I'll go to the taskbar and switch between the applications here in the bottom. Another way to switch between the applications is to press to hold down the Alt key on the keyboard and then press Tab. This will display all the applications running currently on this computer. And then at this point, I can keep on pressing Tab and switch to a different application. Or while I'm holding the Alt key, I can go and click on a specific one to switch to it. Earlier, I also covered that you can switch and have multiple desktops or multiple virtual desktops as well. If I want to switch to a completely different desktop, I'll go here to the bottom and switch to a new desktop, desktop 2, let's say. And from here, I can launch a whole new setup with a variety of applications. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'm going to go over briefly how to use Windows Search. Windows Search is actually one of the cool and powerful features of the upgraded Windows operating system. Instead of you having to scroll and locate a various application and identify where it is and so on, you can click here on Search and simply start typing. That will search for apps, it will search for all the components in the computer, it will search for documents, uh, the web, and uh, people, photos, videos, and so on here. Those search options can be customized by clicking here on these three dots or options icon on the far right, and then you can customize various icons and also customize the search settings as well. The search, you can launch it directly here by clicking on the Windows icon, or you can press the Windows key and then simply start typing. So you type the name of the application and then you just simply click on it and it will bring it up. The other thing you can do is that you can search for settings in your computer. So let's say you wanted to change the display settings. You go here to the display area or any of the display components and then you can change the various settings in here, like the scaling and so on. Another example would be, for example, the Wi-Fi. If you're not sure how to connect to the Wi-Fi, you can type Wi-Fi or wireless and then click on it and it will take you to your Wi-Fi settings. So the idea is, again, anytime you need something, instead of having to know where it is located, you can simply search for it with an approximate word and the system will bring up that particular file or that particular setting or that particular application. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'm going to go over some of the features of Windows Explorer and Windows File Management. Some of those concepts may be very basic to you, but are very key in understanding how the operating system works and how to use Windows 11 effectively in the workplace. Think of File Explorer as a mechanism to access the files that you have created in your computer or the files from the various applications in your computer. To access uh, File Explorer, click here on the taskbar File Explorer. At the top you have uh, some of the common functions such as copy paste and so on. Notice that those icons uh, look slightly different here. Then you have the view options whether you want to view the items in, as a list or whether you want to view them in large icons and so on. And then you have additional settings here under this 
configuration option on the top right. By default, it will open at Quick Access. Quick Access is basically going to give you the recent files and folders that you have accessed most recently. On the far right, you can uh, search for whatever is being displayed here in this bottom area. Below Quick Access, we have a desktop option. Desktop, it's simply going to display any of the items or folders that we had created or added to the desktop. So if we create a folder, a file or a folder in there on the desktop, that's where those icons or those items will show up. Downloads will be stuff that we have downloaded from the web, uh, from the various browsers. Documents, this would be work documents that are stored in your computer. Now, it's important for you to understand that pictures or documents and so on, those are components as part of your Windows account or Windows profile. Now, if you have multiple users log into your computer, each user would have their own separate desktop, separate documents area, separate pictures area. And the way you find that is by going here under this PC, and then if you go under the C drive, typically it's a C drive where the files are stored, and you go under Users, then here is where you can see all the different users in this particular computer. So if I go here under the, this account, notice I have desktop, I have documents, I have downloads, and these are the exact replica of what's being displayed here on the left-hand side. So these are actually on the left-hand side, are just a shortcut to what we see here on the right-hand side. You can use this also for backing up files on a flash drive or external drive or however you want to do the backup stuff or to just copy that content of the files. The key concepts here is these quick links on the left, how they map to the file stored on the PC. If you go here to this PC, it's going to display the drives that exist on this PC but also, if you are working on a network, you'd see also the network drive. And those uh, network drives typically will be mapped like uh, in the particular letters like uh, F or K or J or M drive, or it depends on how the system administrators have set them up. But this is how you access your uh, storage on your PC and then the files within that PC. Typically, these options here the first four or five are typically by default in your PC. Now let's say that uh, there is a specific folder that I'm working on, but I want this to show up all the time here on the left. So let's say I want the favorites to be showing up here on the left, or I want my music folder to show up on the left. You can right click on that folder and then choose to pin it to quick access. That will place it in there. And notice music now. Anytime we open File Explorer, it's going to display a link here for the music folder. So you can do that for any component or any common folders that you constantly use. There's also the option to drag that over there and uh, that. Now, working with folders, I find that most users don't fully understand working with files. Let's say I wanted to create a new folder here. If I click on New up here, I can choose to create a new shortcut or a new folder and a new bunch of other stuff here. But for now, I want to create just a new folder. So I click on New and then choose Folder, and then I have the name of the folder, and then you hit Enter. To move a file into this folder, I can do it a couple ways. Let's say I have this file right here, and I want to move it over here. I can simply drag it, and then it will put it in that folder. Drag and drop, it's great as long as you're precise in it. There's a danger in a drag and drop because sometimes you may drop a file in the wrong place. So the best thing to move files around is by simply selecting them. If there are more than one, then you can simply either select all of them or select just a few of them or you can hold the control key and select random ones or you can click on the first one hold down the shift key and then select a few of them and then at this point notice that 
you can use these options up here. By the way, Microsoft in Windows 11 changed this, so you, we can cut these, and then we are going to move them somewhere else. So this is the safer way to move files around. Or you can also right-click and then choose here the options. Notice this changed as well in Windows 11, these icons. It doesn't say cut anymore or copy unless you hold the mouse on it. Click on cut here and now I go back navigating to the top folder here or I can go to the left and use the navigation on the left and then let's say I want to paste those files in here. I can either right click and choose the option to paste. Notice again the word is missing but you have the icon here to paste or you have the paste icon on the top. These may be very basic concepts but it's really necessary to work effectively in the workplace. Now, one of the needs that I also find the users are not very familiar with in any version of Windows is how to create a compressed file or a zip file as it's called. So let's say I have here this Word 2019 folder and it has a bunch of stuff in there. Now, let's say I want to send that to somebody in a compressed uh, format because it has a lot of stuff in it. To create a zip folder or a zip file, all you have to do is right-click on it, click on Compress to Zip File. Now, the terminology here in Windows 11 has changed. So, we click here on Create a Zip File. It's going to do its thing, and it's actually putting all of these files including the folder and potentially subfolders into one single file for you to send away. Notice it says uh, it's a zip folder. It has a zip little icon thingy here and that's what you'd need to send. But you're sending one compressed package. Typically for large zip files it's best instead of emailing them to maybe share them either using OneDrive or Google Drive or some kind of cloud file sharing platform. Most systems are not going to deliver for emails that contain zip files for security reasons. Now, let's say that I received this file. Typically, with a zip file, you also need to extract those files. Notice there's an option for extract all items in this folder. Or you can right-click on it and choose to extract all, and that's a necessary process for any zip files for you to do on your end. Obviously, you need to do this only when you're completely sure from a, a safe sender. Notice it's going to, by default, extract it in the same folder that we had it. However, you can change it to a different folder. You press Extract, and all those files at this point will be displayed in here. Notice it creates a new folder matching the zip folder. And under that, then there are the actual files. The context menus for the File Explorer in Windows 11 have changed. Notice first the rounded corners, the visual look and feel, and then these options have been kind of rearranged and the icons have changed. Notice here that the most commonly used functions don't contain the words anymore. Uh, more options. This will bring more of the old look and feel from Windows 10, and that's how it used to actually look. Finally, as you're accessing files, in some cases there might be a need for you to uh, track down hidden files in your computer. There are certain places that the files are stored and you just need to make sure to kind of um, get to them or view them or do something with them. So. And one common area is, for example, if we go here under the Users folder, we go under this account, My Profile account. Notice that by default you see maybe 10 or 12 different folders in here. However, there are files and folders in there that are actually hidden by default. And uh, to view those files and folders, simply going here under View, we scroll down under Show, and then we choose here the show hidden files or unshow hidden files. And notice now under app data you'll have this displayed.
In this video I'll demonstrate how to connect to the internet from a Windows PC. So if you have a Windows PC with a network connection, a wired connection, obviously you simply take the wired connection and provided the port in the wall is active, you simply plug it in and you should be able to connect to the internet. If you have a wireless laptop or a wireless device with Windows 11 and you want to connect to a network, whether at home or at your business, in the bottom right here you'll see a globe with a little arrow like this. So you'll need to click in this area, it doesn't matter which area, and it's going to bring up quick settings. Notice that currently the Wi-Fi is not turned on, so I can click here to turn it on. And notice now it's blue. So typically this has to be blue. It has kind of changed in Windows 11. And once uh, this is blue for the wireless connection, that means that it's on and available to view the wireless networks. And then we need to click here on this right arrow to click on the wireless connections. And then you pick the connection in your area or from your business. Typically the ones that have a lock in there, that means that there is a passphrase and you'd need to know the passphrase typically on your own router printed out from the internet provider or in a business it might be a shared password through the IT department or in a lot of cases it's upon login. Click on the network connection and then you press connect. It will prompt you to enter it if it doesn't need a password. In this case, I was connected before, that's why it didn't prompt me. Then it will remember those settings. Under this little icon here, you can also check additional properties related to the wireless network. To get to these settings, obviously, you can go to the settings area and Windows search and then choose Wi-Fi settings and then choose show wireless networks and this is where you pick to connect to another network. So that's another way to manage the wireless network and connect to the network. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'm going to demonstrate how to connect to the internet. This is really very basic, but it's one of the aspects of learning about an operating system, particularly if you're not sure how this is done. Once you have connected your computer to the network, whether wired in a wired way or a wireless way, and for the wireless, by the way, I refer to the tutorial on connecting to a wireless network, once you have done that, typically you need to use a browser. Now the default browser, and it's included in Windows 11, is Microsoft Edge. This is typically based on a Chrome background platform, but it's uh, very efficient. Now, of course, other browsers are also Google Chrome, Firefox, and other ones such as Brave, which is recent one based on Chrome as well, but for more privacy. Notice that you have a search box here on the bottom and then you have an address bar on the top. On the top, that's where you type your URL. Now that can search also. So if you type in here, if you type Kaseli Tutorials, notice you'll get a lot of other stuff in there and it'll perform a search. That's because the address bar on the top acts as both um, a navigation tool and also a search tool. They are combined into one. Now a lot of uh, users they search in this area here, this uh, search box. So whenever you're typing in here caselli.com for example, that is actually not going to take you directly to the website. You're just searching as part of the default search that the startup page has. So it's going to give you a lot of different options here but not necessarily take you there directly. So my suggestion to be effective and to know how this is done, you just type what you want to type on the top part and not the second part. The other thing to consider here are for the web browsers, and I'm not going to get into too many details, the other thing is to go and check the settings and um, modify the settings in your browser. So you'd click on these icons here on the top and you'd go under settings and then here is where you can change whether it's the privacy, whether it's the appearance, look and feel of your browser. 
starting page, this is where you can set a new page. So for example, if I want to always start with a new page here, and that new page should be caselli.com, uh, that's how I simply add it in here. Now that I change the default start page, notice that once I open it up again, it'll take me just to that website that I configured it earlier. One of the tools that I find useful is also here under the settings and then which is the three dots up here and then under more tools there is this option also to cast this to a device to connect to a remote display. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to use the Windows 11 widgets. Windows 11 has a new feature called widgets. Here in the taskbar, it's one of the main icons by added by default. You click on widgets and you'll be able to see particular ones that the Microsoft has already put in there by default for you. However, you can customize those widgets by using the more options item here and you can make this large or medium or uh, remove it completely. You can go and add new ones, pick the items that you want to add, and then you can further come in here and customize them, the size and other options related to them. In this brief video, I'll demonstrate how to shut down the computer in Windows 11. This might seem like a very easy and simple step. To shut down or reboot the computer, you simply go here under the Start menu, and then you click on the, the Power icon in the bottom right. From here, you can select the Shutdown option or the Restart option. Obviously, the Restart option, uh, but clear everything from the memory. If the computer is running into a problem, it is highly recommended that you first reboot the computer before you get too frustrated with the problem that you are running into. When you put the computer in sleep mode, it's not closing the programs, it's keeping everything the way you had them before, but just conserving energy and putting things to sleep. The hibernate mode is actually more effective in saving uh, battery life on your laptop but it takes a little bit longer in order for it to start up. If you have a solid state drive, the hibernate mode probably is the better option uh, for conserving battery. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to install the Windows updates and keep the computer up to date. We go here under the Windows Search, or press the Windows key, and then type Windows Update. Notice that there are some updates here. We simply press Install Now, and the updates will be installed in the computer. The other thing to remember is that you can pause Windows Updates if you don't want the computer to be restarted during business hours, or you want to pause them for a week, and so on. This is where you can change those settings. If you want to look at the history of updates, you can click on Windows Updates History and it will uh, uh, show you what has been installed in the computer. Further down here under Advanced Options, you can also choose to install the updates at certain hours of the day or at certain times. You can choose when to receive the Windows updates and also, here is another option that you might want to consider under optional updates. Sometimes there are uh, driver software for your PC or non-crucial updates for your PC. That might be helpful. But it is important to keep your PC up to date, whether whatever version of Windows you have, for security reasons or better performance of your PC and sometimes additional functionality as well. In this segment of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to 
customize the look and feel of Windows 11. There are a couple ways you can do the, the changing of their look and feel. You can right click from the desktop here and then choose personalize. And then under personalize, you can change and pick here various themes. So let's say I want to utilize this one. It will adjust all the colors and everything related to that um, Windows theme. So I'm going to revert it back for now. If you want to further just customize certain things, for example, the desktop settings, if you wanted to change the sounds or change um, the defaults or the cursor and so on, this is where you would do it as well. Now to change the font size of your icons and uh, components of Windows, right click here on the desktop and then choose display settings. Now I'm showing you this from the desktop functionality. However, you can also search for it and just simply choose here display settings. And then under the scaling here, you can change this so that it can be larger fonts and larger icons or smaller if you prefer. And uh, screen orientation and things of that nature as well. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to customize the Windows 11 settings. Just like with any other operating system, there, are, there is typically a need to go and modify particular settings in the computer or in that particular device. So think of it like if you have an iPhone and you go to the settings area, you can modify a variety of things, whether it's for the apps or the look and feel and the privacy and uh, things like that regarding your, your device. So the same thing here as well. You can uh, go under the search option to get to settings, and this would be the easiest one. You can press the Windows key on the keyboard or you press the search option here and then simply type in here settings. That's the quickest way to get to it. Once you click on settings, Notice that uh, this is actually a major improvement in Windows 11. While in Windows 10 you had settings that uh, had the different, uh, the old look and feel to them, in Windows 11 Microsoft did a really outstanding uh, work on restructuring them, making sense, and also visually appealing as well. So at the very top here you have the option about the system. So you can change system related uh, settings such as changing for example the name of your computer, the updates about the computer and obviously under the system settings you can change uh, settings related to the display, the sound, notifications, power, storage, anything that is system related. As far as uh, devices and so on you can click on that and you'll be able to um, customize settings related to any devices connected to your computer and the same under uh, network and so on, then personalization. This is where you change the themes and the look and feel of your operating system. And then under apps, this is where you can click and uh, choose default features or even and uninstall various applications in your computer. So this is where you can add and remove programs from your computer. Now, if for some reason you need to delete an application to remove it, notice that this has changed in Windows 11, and you can click here on the three dots on the far right, or in the configuration icon on the far right, and then choose to uninstall it from here. Additionally, you have the gaming settings, and also privacy settings, and Windows Update. So all of that to say that uh, very similar to um, an iPhone or a, a smartphone where you can change and customize the settings about that device. The same idea is here as well. You can also search here for a particular setting. Let's say you're not sure where disk cleanup is located. You can still search for it. 
So that's how you access the Windows settings and how you can customize settings related to Windows. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I will demonstrate how to customize the privacy settings in Windows 11. So you go here in the Start menu or in the Windows Search, either one of them, and we type here Privacy Settings. Notice on the left you'll have Privacy and Security. And then you can change other stuff related to security as well, but um, in our case here we are concerned primarily about the Privacy Settings. So you can go here under General and you might want to turn off a lot of these options. Then we go back here under Privacy and you need to, you're not done yet by the way, you go here under the speech settings and then you change also the speech settings to change those to off. Basically you're not sending the speech patterns or whatever you say that be stored externally from your PC. Then you can go down under the inking and typing personalization. You can turn off also the dictionary and certain terms and words that you type on the, on the soft keyboard so that those are not stored outside of your PC. Additionally, you go under the diagnostic and feedback and you want to uh, potentially turn all of these off and then under the feedback frequency. So basically put the most minimum that it allows you to put in there. But of course, take note of what you're turning off so that just in case something happens, you'd come back to them. If you go under the activity history, you can choose to turn that off as well. You can clear the privacy setting there. Then you can go under the search permissions. This is probably what you want to do for the safety of kids or the moderate search. Uh, this has to do with the web content that is uh, it's going to display in your computer. As far as the cloud search content and so on, you can turn these off as well if you prefer more privacy. Under location, notice that there are also app permissions such as location. And this is very similar to like if you have an iPhone, you can control what apps can access your GPS location and things like that. It's very similar to that here as well. You're just going here and then the identifying which apps have access to your uh, location settings and you can change this by default or you can clear that uh, history. The same is with camera and microphone. However, for camera and microphone, I'd be cautious on turning things off from here. For example, if you're turning this off from Skype from here, or uh, the camera, you're not allowing it to, to turn on, uh, you're not allowing it at all for a specific app, when you go to use that app, you'll most likely have problems with using the camera or the microphone. So I'd be very cautious on uh, turning off the camera settings. Voice activation, keep these off for the particular uh, for Cortana or uh, keywords. This would be like Apple has Hey Siri, Windows. If you have this option on, it's always listening for the word Cortana. In this module, I will demonstrate how to use the Action Center or Quick Settings Center in Windows 11. Uh, typically here in the taskbar on the far right of the desktop, we have these options. So this is an area, a listing of items or functions that you can quickly access. Anything in blue that's active, anything that is not in blue that's not activated at this point. We can change the display here, we can change the sound settings and so on, and the uh, volume settings, and you can go under more volume and so on. Now notice that there is also an edit icon in here, and we can add additional items to the quick settings area. Wish uh, Microsoft would actually have added these additional settings by default. So we click here on add, 
And let's say I want a cast option so that I can connect to a remote display easily. Let's say I also want the uh, night light option. I want uh, the nearby sharing and also the project option. Then I click on done. Now those options will be available at any point by simply clicking anywhere in here and then selecting that particular option for quick access. In this module, I'll demonstrate how to change the default printer or how to set up the default printer in Windows 11. By default, in Windows 11, the Windows determines as to which printer becomes the default. So to set the default printer, we go here under the search menu, and then we type printers. We go to printers and scanners, and then the first option that we want to change, to scroll down here below the list of printers, and turn off the option for letting Windows manage it. Once we have uh, turned off the option for Windows to manage the printer, then we go to the particular printer that we want and then click on it and then this button will show up for making it as a default. And notice here at this point it will state default. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to connect to the Windows 11 Store. Think of the Windows 11 Store as the App Store if you have an iPhone, or the, or the Google Store if you have an Android phone. So to access the App Store, you click on the Windows Start or on the Search and then you can simply search for store or you just click on the Microsoft Store. These are basically third-party uh, apps or sometimes from Microsoft or third-party app uh, apps that you are adding onto your PC to increase its functionality. Now there is also in Windows 11 functionality or the option for you to be able to install Android apps as well and you do that primarily through the Amazon App Store. So here, if we wanted uh, an app installed, whether it's Netflix or WhatsApp or whatever it is, the apps here, you simply click on it, and then sometimes you might have to pay additional fee for it, sometimes may not. You can check the ratings, you can check the description, and uh, so on, and if you decide to install it, then you can simply click on Get. It will associate the app with your Microsoft account. You'll need to enter your Microsoft account, log in, and it's basically going to be very similar to an App Store from Apple or from Google in smartphones. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to change your Windows password. There are a couple ways to change it. If you're working in a corporate environment and you're connected to a network, then obviously you change the password through the tools that the IT department has set up for you. However, in most cases, even if it's a network account, you can change your Windows password by simply pressing Control-Alt-Delete in your computer and then a, a prompt like this will come up and then you can click here on change password and then you can put in your old password the new password and confirm the new password as well and this is the quickest and easiest way to change the password the other options are also under the search if we go here to search and then change password you have more clicks that are involved in this step through this procedure, but you'd still reach to the same conclusion.
In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to lock your computer if you're going to step away from your desk for a few minutes or for the rest of the day. This is a very good practice to do to get into the custom of doing, and obviously this is for security and uh, maintaining your privacy and the security of your files. So you can be on any application that you're working on, and at any point that you want to lock your computer, you simply can press the Windows key and the letter L on the keyboard. And then it will bring you back to this option. So it's basically going to bring you to the login screen again. When you're ready to come back and start working again, you can simply hit any keys on the keyboard, enter your password, and then you're back to everything that you had on your computer. If you want to do it using the Windows uh, option, the Windows Start menu, that option is located under the Start here. And then you click on your account. And typically, you'd click on your account. And there will be an option for a lock here on the, under your account. For some reason, it's not displaying that at this point while I'm recording. And I guess it has to do because I just uh, locked it, came back, and I'm having still the recorder on. In this segment of the Windows 11 tutorial, I will go over the Windows security settings and how to check your computer for viruses and malware. Windows 11 actually comes packaged with its own security suite and firewall tools as well. To get to those tools, we need to go to the, or the, one of the ways to get there is to open the start menu or the search window here and then search for Windows security. We go to security settings, and here it's going to give us a preview of actions that are necessary in your computer, things that are okay in your computer, and so on. So now to customize those settings, click here on Open Windows Security. And then we can set up um, OneDrive if we prefer to. This is not really a necessity. This is basically Microsoft pushing OneDrive and also trying to make sure that you're backing up your files online on the cloud and not necessarily lose them at some point in time. Then under the Account Protect login here with the Microsoft account, on the left-hand side, we have here the Firewall and Network Protection. Notice that there no action is needed at this point, but you can go and click on it and check various uh, firewall rules and advanced settings and customize those firewall settings if you prefer. Under the App and Browser Control, this can block unwanted apps and currently it's turned off you want to make sure it's turned on and you press uh, put in your password and it will enable it uh, for you under the device security there are additional settings behind the scenes here that it's utilizing uh, such as the single core isolation the security of the processor level and so if we go here under virus and threat protection on the left hand side this is where we can run a scan on your computer. You can do a quick scan. In my case, it took uh, 2 minutes and 31 seconds. Or you can change those scan options and do a full scan, a custom scan. And once you pick the type of scan that you want, you click on Scan Now. And it may take quite a bit of time if you have a lot of files and you choose the full scan option. As the files are scanned, typically it's going to show you the results and things it has found and things that you need to correct or to allow. And uh, all you need to do is basically proceed with a positive way to remove them or apply what Microsoft determines as. You can also check here for a protection history, what has taken place at uh, certain points in time. And it's basically a log of uh, the um, activity from the scanning software. So all that to say that under the Security Center, the Windows Security, you have uh, a virus and firewall protection. There is also the account protection. There is the firewall and network protection aspect, the browser level protection, device security, 
at uh, the uh, component level in the computer and then also device health. Under the Windows security uh, here it's important to note that there are also family options here. You can set it up to protect the kids screen time habits. So you can set time for kids uh, how long they can use the devices and so on. To do that you'd go under view family settings and you'd have to configure it using your Microsoft account and basically all the devices are connecting uh, to a Microsoft account and then Microsoft is managing that time and the settings that you have configured for your family. In this module of the Windows 11, I'll demonstrate how to connect and extend your display to a second display device in Windows 11. This comes in handy if you have a second monitor or a TV where you want to project to, or if you want to connect to a projector in a classroom or in a business meeting. So typically, as soon as you connect a monitor, a second monitor to your PC, by default, the content from the first, from your main PC to the second one will be mirrored. That's uh, referred to as a mirrored display. Now, to connect to a projector, you can press the Windows key on the keyboard and then P, the letter P on the keyboard, and this will bring up this menu. So you can have, currently I have only one monitor here connected to the system. But if I had a second one, I could duplicate this screen. And typically by default, it will be duplicated as soon as you connect a second screen. However, the function that you want to use is the extend desktop. That will make it so that you can move the mouse from one screen to the other and uh, open one application, one screen, another application, and the other screen as well. And to do that, you simply click on the Extend Display option here. Now, of course, I'm recording this, and it's uh, not as easy to replicate it to show what happens, but you would basically just see the second desktop, and we can move the mouse to it. And the way you get to this is by pressing the Windows key and then letter P. Now, if for some reason you don't uh, remember the uh, Windows key and then P for project there, uh, one of the things that you can do is uh, click on the start or the search icon and then just type extend. You want to extend the desktop or, or you can do the word duplicate. And uh, click here on duplicate or extend desktop display and it will give you the options to modify uh, for the options for multiple displays and so on. In this module, I'll demonstrate how to cast or connect to an external device or a remote monitor or a remote TV or a remote Windows PC. So Windows 11 has a functionality to connect to a remote display and you can do that by simply pressing the Windows key and then the letter K and, and then this will bring up the cast option here. Now you can uh, simply click on it and then it will connect to the remote device. Notice here again. Now in my case it's not connecting because the TV is actually not on. To get to this in case you don't remember the Windows key and then K, you can go here under the search option and then just choose cast. And then you have the option here to connect to a wireless display and then you'll click on connect and it's going to bring you back to the same option that we have. One other 
option is that you can go here under the quick action items on the bottom. You can click on any of those icons in here on the bottom. At the bottom, you can choose to add other functionality. For example, nearby sharing, you can enable it, or casting, or projection to add the project icon so that you can always access it easily. Add it once, and then you're done. Then when you go in the future, you click here on the quick actions. Instead of having to do Control k or Windows and P, you just have the option to cast or to project from here. Because I'm recording a tutorial, I can't demonstrate the mirroring of it with a uh, connection, but that uh, should work. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to connect to a Windows PC and mirror the screen from an Android device. Windows 11 has the capability to allow other devices to connect to it to mirror the screen from the remote device to the Windows 11 device. And that is done using the projection tool in combination with the connect tool. This is typically done using a Miracast connection, which is a Microsoft technology available through Android devices as well. For this to work, the devices have to be on the same wireless network and also support the Miracast connection. So the way to do this is uh, basically you go to the window Start, and then you go to the search for Projection. You go here under Projection Settings, and then you need to enable these options very similar to here. So we want to make sure that to allow this from everywhere for Windows and Android devices to project to this PC when you say it's OK. So you'd have to approve it basically but yet you're making your computer available availability is for you to connect both from an android device or a windows pc the next option that you want to make sure is that every time a connection is requested for you to be approving the connection and then the third one is for you to provide a pin you can say never to this as soon as you confirm it they will be able to connect or you can just give them a pin every time to connect. It's up to you, but you'd have to give that uh, user then the pin for them in order to project to your PC, to mirror their screen to the PC. Once you're ready, by the way, there is additional help options down here in the bottom as well. But once you are ready for you to allow somebody to connect to your PC, you'd basically click here to launch the Connect app. That is making your computer available for somebody to connect. It's making their computer discoverable in the network to connect. Now, on the Android devices, and I unfortunately I cannot simulate it here, you're going to need to go to settings and either and select one of the options. Obviously, in Android, most devices differ from one to the other. Some of them use the word cast, uh, broadcasting the screen. Some others use the word mirror. Others use the word connect, so you might have to look through the settings, but you want to find the setting to connect to mirror your screen to another device. It's important to know that this function will not work on Apple devices. So once you are ready here for to allow a connection, you click on launch the connect app to project to this PC, and then it's ready. So as soon as they are able to connect, as soon as they are able to connect, you'll be able to see the content or mirror uh, of their screen. On their devices, they will need to choose to connect to a remote device. So they'll have to use the cast option. And if you are using a PC, they'll need to use the cast option, which is Windows K on the keyboard or connect to a remote display. Or in an Android device, they would have to use the connect or mirror option depending on the Android model.
In this session of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to use the Windows Snap feature. This is enhanced in Windows 11 and uh, it's actually very powerful. Particularly, it's useful with larger monitors nowadays and more convenient as well. So let's say I have this application. I have Word here and then I also have PowerPoint. And I have only one monitor, but I want to use those side by side. So the easiest way is if I go here on the top right under the Maximize, Minimize icon, notice that there are these different layouts that are available. And this is new. You hold the mouse on it, on the Maximize, Minimize. And now let's say that I want to put this application on the left half of the screen. I simply click on it. It will put my uh, PowerPoint on the left half of the screen. Now I go back to my Word document and uh, do the same thing, but I want to put it in the second half of the screen. But now let's say that I want a third application to have on the right-hand side as well, but split the right half into two parts. So I could do that this way. I can go and pick something of this layout with three components to it. And then let's say I want also Microsoft Edge here. And in Microsoft Edge, I want to put that in the bottom right. Now, this works well to navigate it, particularly if you have a really a large monitor or a TV and you want to have different apps as part of that navigation without having to switch from one to the other. In this module, I'll demonstrate how to remove unwanted applications from your computer. Typically, when you buy even a new computer, there might be applications that you really don't want and you just want to speed up the computer and remove them. Get to see what applications are installed in the computer. You can access it a couple ways. You can go here on the search option and then just type apps. So you click on add and remove programs. And here it will list all the various programs that are installed in this computer. Now to remove one of those uh, programs, you can, I go here to Camtasia, I click on the more options and I can choose to modify it or uninstall it. Modify it's going to simply select new parameters for the reinstallation of the application. Typically it's not very useful. Typically you want to use the option to uninstall. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to adjust the sound settings and sound volume in Windows 11. For some reason, this function has become more complicated in this version of Windows. In the past, we would go here under sound and we could just go and change. Now, as we click on that icon for the, for the sound and volume, notice it brings us the action center. The action center here, one of the options is the sound. So if we click on the little arrow on the uh, bottom, on the far right, this is where we can change which speakers to use. There are additional settings here as well that we can adjust as far as the sound goes. We can get to this settings also by uh, going here under the search menu and then just typing sound settings. One other option is by right clicking, if you scroll down, if you move the mouse to the sound icon and right click on it and choose to open the volume mixer or the sound settings, the major change is that you click on this and then you'd control the sound from here through the action center.
In this module, I'll demonstrate how to use a task manager to troubleshoot problems in Windows 11. Task manager used to be part of the taskbar in the past. So you'd typically right click on the taskbar and then it would be an option for task manager. However, that's no longer available there. You can access a task manager by either simply searching for it under the start menu or Windows search. There are a couple other ways to get to the task manager. If you right click on the start menu, there is also the option to click on task manager from here. And then it's going to take us typically to something like this. For the first time, unless you change it, it's going to be something like this. So this is going to list the applications that are running. However, if you want to see additional details as far as what's running in the system, what, many, or what processing is taking place and so on, then you can click here on more details and you'll be able to see the processes that are currently running in the PC. A lot of times if the PC is really running, uh, the fans are running really loud and so on, then there is typically an issue with the PC or one of the applications in the computer and you want to kind of stop that application. Identify it and stop it. Now to identify what application is causing the issue, notice in my case here the CPU use, utilization is 26%, around 26 to 27%. So something is using it because typically it should be about 4 to 7%. Now as we scroll up here, um, you can identify the uh, program that is causing the high utilization by clicking here on the CPU utilization and we want to sort it by highest to lowest. So in my case, notice that the Camtasia recorder is the one that is taking most of the processing power. Obviously, that's because I'm doing this video tutorial at this point. But if it was something else that uh, I don't need to, it to be running right now, or it was unnecessary, then I could simply click on it, and then click on End Task. And so basically, let's assume this is the process that's taking most of the CPU. You simply click on it, and then you choose End Task, and it's going to close that process. process. In some cases, it may not be just a CPU that is um, uh, slowing down your system. In some cases, it may be certain apps that are taking most of the memory. So you can go here and do the same thing with the memory to identify what's taking most of the uh, memory in your computer. Other times, it may be that the disk utilization is struggling, and that's how you can identify that you have a problem with the speed of your disk. Here you can also identify how the processor or different components are doing over a period of time. So if we click here on the CPU, you'll be able to identify the usage under the memory usage, the solid state drives or the drives, Wi-Fi and uh, graphics card and so on. Now, one of the things under the performance tab that comes in very handy is also this resource monitor. This is going in depth and looking at uh, as to what's happening behind the scenes, whether it's the processor usage, what process, how much, what the actual thread is utilizing a certain service, and which potential service is causing the issues in the system. So notice you can do it disk-based. So let's say here, notice that my antivirus software is uh, using quite a bit of the read-write data at this point in the PC. And uh, the way you find out what each one of these is, uh, you can either Google search them or uh, there is a way that you can also find the file location in your PC, but probably searching through Google is probably the best option. Now, once you're in Resource Monitor, Notice that there are also, uh, there is, uh, that was the overview, but you can go at uh, various levels, like at the CPU level, memory level, disk level, or network level. As well. Now, there is also the app history here that you can kind of uh, check and uh, see what's causing the usage. This is very similar to an iPhone app history. Under the startup, this is really helpful as well because this is where you can turn off certain features. So let's say you're not using OneDrive in your computer and you want to disable the applications on startup. 
So here I can just simply go to OneDrive and choose to disable this so it doesn't start up when the computer starts up at the beginning of each day or whenever you reboot it. Additionally, there are um, other details here and other services that are configured and running and so on. And uh, those are a little bit more advanced. So you don't want to typically turn off something from here unless you know what you're doing. Another way to get to the task manager is by pressing Control alt delete and then you choose task manager and that will take you to the same location as well. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to enable the gaming mode in Windows 11 as part of this Windows 11 tutorial. Gaming mode is a new functionality in Windows 11. And to enable it, you can go here to the Start menu or the Search menu and then simply start typing Gaming Mode. And notice you have Gaming Mode Settings. It will take you to the gaming mode area. You can go ahead and enable this, turn this on. As you're enabling the gaming mode, you really shouldn't have to touch the graphics uh, settings area, but that's just in case you're tech savvy enough to know what to change and how to set it. But uh, typically you just enable this and then you can learn more about this. It's basically going to state here that we can it's going to disable certain functionality while the gaming mode is turned to on. So basically it prevents the Windows update from installing updates and sending restart notifications and it's kind of kind of adjust also the frame rate so that you get the optimal settings for your game. If you are into gaming and considering buying a gaming laptop or a desktop, it, the graphics card is the key component that you want to focus on. So besides the processor and the solid state drive in your PC, one of the key aspects is to get a, a high powered graphics card with four or six or eight gigabytes of dedicated graphics card memory. You'll know whether you have a dedicated graphics card if you go to Task Manager here and you go under Performance and then you scroll down. If it's going to say anything Intel, that's typically the built-in graphics card. That's not going to typically do it, but if you have a graphics card like this, uh, NVIDIA or AMD, that's going to display how much memory it, it has dedicated for the, the GPU, for the graphics card processing. So anything for or above, it's optimal. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll explain some of the concepts related to Focus Assist. It's a new feature in Windows 11. It was also introduced late in Windows 10. Focus Assist, it's one of the features that allows you, like the name states, for you to focus. It's designed for you to focus on your work and not be bothered by alerts while you are working. The settings can be controlled very easily from the control center. So if we go here in the bottom right and click on the control center, there is this option here, Focus Assist. By default, all notifications are going to be popping up on your computer depending on whatever it is you have allowed. To change those settings, you can click here on the next option to priority only. So this will allow only priority alerts to be displayed and you'll not be bugged while you're working on a particular project. You can also choose only alarms. The alarms would be, let's say, meeting notifications or meeting reminders. 
Now, as far as setting those, uh, configuring those settings, you can do under uh, go under the search area, go under the focus assist, and this is where we can change the settings. So you can have automatic rules that you can uh, set. If you are duplicating your display, it's going to display only the alarms, but not necessarily other alerts that you might be getting from chats, from chat applications, and that would not be a good thing if you want to project it to a meeting and so on. But you can display and customize so that only certain settings are displayed, like uh, connecting to a secondary display or duplicating the display, or if you are playing a game, what should happen, what uh, alerts should come up. You can also prioritize the settings from here. You can hide all notifications at particular times, and, and you can set the working hours or specific times of the day where certain actions are allowed or notifications are allowed or disallowed. In this session of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to access the command line terminal for Windows 11. Sometimes you may need to run applications manually or just check settings or check things manually in your computer. So you can either go under the search option here and then type the word command and it will take you to the command prompt. And this basically will allow you to access uh, files or to run specific commands or let's say find the IP address specific settings in your computer so this is the command prompt option there is also the option to access the Windows terminal Windows terminal it actually uses the Windows PowerShell which um, allows you, it's one of the newer ways of managing settings in a PC and running particular commands in a PC. So you could search for this by going to the search option here and uh, searching for Windows PowerShell and it will get you to the same item or you can right click and choose Windows Terminal. For a lot of the functions you might need to run it as an admin equivalent for being able to execute specific commands in your PC. In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'll demonstrate how to add an application manually to Windows Startup. For some reason, this uh, feature in Windows 11, it's more complicated than it needs to be. I'll demonstrate how to do this manually. Uh, to do this, first we need to be able to run the run command. So unlike going up here and doing the search, we need to either be in command line or in the terminal mode or uh, go here and right click on the desktop and choose run. It will bring us the old run command uh, like in Windows 7 or Windows 10. You can also access this by pressing the Windows key and R and that will get you the run command as well. Now at this point we need to type in there shell colon startup and then we hit enter. This will bring us to the, to the folder or the location where we can place specific programs that we want to open on startup. So in this case, we can keep this window open on the left hand side. And then we can go to our file explorer and then open a new session of the file explorer. 
now from here we need to go to let's say to the programs wherever that particular program is located so program files here and let's say I want this program called handbrake which is a um, video editing program and I want this to start up every time upon uh, boot up of the computer at this point I can right click on this and then drag it to the left and it's going to create a link to it in the startup and I click here to create a startup or a shortcut on this area so again that was right clicking so finding initially where the program is located right clicking on it dragging it over and then choosing to create a shortcut not copying it because then we are copying the whole program we are just creating a shortcut in order to launch that specific program. You can do this also with other applications. So let's say here we are in the All Apps area. So let's say I want one of my apps here to uh, open up automatically upon boot up. So let's say I want Firefox to be one of those programs. So I can right click here and choose more and then find the the file location so this is where the file is actually residing the executable for this program is residing in the PC now from here again I right click it and then create a shortcut and now both of these programs will open up every time automatically once I reboot Windows 11 In this module of the Windows 11 tutorial, I'm going to demonstrate how to reset your PC. Resetting your PC may be necessary if your computer got infected with the virus or something is not working well in your PC and you just need to go back. The other option is that you can reset your PC when you're selling it or giving it away and uh, you want to wipe everything out so this video is going to demonstrate how to do that as well so to get to the reset this pc option we just simply search here under the windows settings and uh, search for reset pc at this point we have four options one of the things is that we can fix issues without resetting the pc so this can take a while you can just click on it you can, it's going to run a troubleshooter for specific items and it, and it will notify you what the issues with your PC are. So I would suggest that you try this first. The other thing to try if you're having problems with your PC is to go back to a previous date and time and try that first. This is like if something is not working for a particular version of Windows you can go back to a previous version of Windows by clicking on go back here. You'd enter your password, provide it, it prompts you, and then it's gonna give you it's gonna give you times and dates when you want to go back uh, to now in this case it's prompting us, well, before you go back, why don't we check for updates first? Uh, that's something probably good to do. Sometimes there are drivers, there is uh, fixes uh, that can be applied to the PC. But for now, I'll say no. In your case, you probably would want to say yes before you do this. Then we click here next. And then um, it's making sure that we can uh, sign in again. And then it's prompting us to go back to Windows 10. In this case, I have updated from Windows 10 to Windows 11 and so on. So this is going back to a previous version of Windows. The other option is to reset this PC. Resetting the PC, there will be two options here. We can reset it keeping the files, or we can reset it and remove everything. To keep the files, if you choose this option, this option is best if you're infected with a virus and you want to just keep 
your files, your personal files, and uh, reinstall all your programs. Remember, this is going to need for your programs to be reinstalled. So if you have Microsoft Office uh, loaded in your computer, or your business management software loaded in your computer, you'd have to reload these programs all over again. So this will remove the apps and settings and it will keep your personal files. My suggestion even in this case is that if you have access to the files, consider also backing up the files first, just in case. Back them up to an external flash drive, to an external drive, or to a Google, um, to a cloud storage service such as Google Drive or OneDrive. So here you click on, it removes uh, this, it says it's not going to take very long, and then it says, well, how do you want to download your uh, next version of Windows? Let's say I want to download it from the cloud because we don't have the local install. And uh, you'd click on next and just follow the prompts from there. Now, if you are resetting this computer or selling it, then you can remove everything. It will remove all your personal files, the apps and settings and so on. This process, it's going to prompt us a couple of times here, and I'm not going to do it, obviously. Uh, it's going to choose the uh, install version of Windows, how we want to install it from scratch. You can choose a local reinstall. And then you'd click on Next, and then it's going to confirm that we really want to delete the files from your PC. And obviously, if you really want to do it, you'll uh, prove it, and then proceed with a uh, with a reload this is a clean install this is not going to retain anything this is the safest thing the last thing if you, uh, for a virus provided you don't need your files or you have backed up your files uh, the process it's going to take anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes depending on how fast your computer is what the storage is in your uh, what type of hard drive you have in your PC during the reinstall of Windows and the cleaning of the PC, there's also going to be an option to erase the drive and access to the files permanently. You probably want to select that option if you are selling your computer or giving it away. That's going to basically write a bunch of zeros across the whole drive so that somebody cannot recover your files that you have deleted. If for some reason you need to create um, a bootable flash drive as well, so you would go to this website, microsoft.com, en-english, forward slash software download, software dash download, forward slash Windows 11. From here you can either get the latest version of Windows 11 and download it manually and run a new upgrade or update in your PC, or you can scroll down and create here a bootable flash drive, a bootable USB or DVD drive. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to enable TPM in a Hyper-V machine is hosting a Windows 10 machine. The reason we want to do this is because we want to upgrade to Windows 11. And by default, in Windows 11, the installation wizard is going to fail unless the TPM module is enabled in the virtual machine. So here is my Hyper-V and also my uh, desktop that I have currently running with Windows 10. Now we go here to the actual machine. I have this off, currently in the off state. We right click, we choose settings. Once we are in settings, then we can go to here to the security and we choose to enable the enable trusted platform module. Then we click OK. At this point, we are all set with the process and now we can fire up the machine and upgrade this to Windows 11.
In this module, I'll demonstrate how to use Sticky Notes in Windows 11. Sticky Notes is just an add-on tool, or an, actually a tool that comes with Windows 11, but it's useful for reminders and po similar to post-it notes on your desk. To access Sticky Notes, you simply go to the Start menu here and just type Sticky Notes. Once it opens up, typically it may even prompt you to connect to a Microsoft account, and if so, then just simply log into it. At this point, you can simply take a note. You can use the uh, new note on the top here and simply type, and that's it. Now you can close this and you have various notes all over your desktop and you can customize those and once you're done with them you can simply delete them or close them. Of waiting for Microsoft to send us the update to Windows 11, we can do the upgrade manually and we can simply go here to Microsoft.com and we go here to Microsoft.com forward slash en dash English forward slash software dash download forward slash Windows 11. From here we can download the Windows 11 installation assistant or we can create a, a media. Now we click here on download now for the assistant. This is going to run a health check as well as part of it. At this point in my case it says it does not meet the requirements to install Windows 11 and most likely that's because I have only two gigabytes of memory assigned to this virtual machine. So to find out what the issue is we can click here on PC Health Check app. Uh, I ran the PC Health Check here. So if I click here on Check Now it says all results, it says good news, TPM 2.0 has been enabled and it requires at least 4 gigs of memory enabled to it. Then you scroll down here and it meets all the other requirements. Now since the health check passes then we can go ahead and, in, and run the Windows 11 installation assistant. Go ahead and double click on it. Then we press accept and install and then we'll just have to wait for this process to complete. Now at this point it's installing, so we just need to leave the machine on and keep on waiting for the installation to complete. Now once the installation is complete, it's prompting us to reboot the computer. So we're going to choose to restart it now. And at this point, it's finishing the installation. Now the upgrade is almost finished. It's bringing us to the login screen. And at this point, the upgrade has been completed and uh, we are all good to go. So notice we have the start menu here on the bottom and all that uh, good stuff. So I'll just reboot it, restart it. And there we are. So that's how we were able to upgrade to Windows 11 from Windows 10 manually using the Windows 11 upgrade assistant.